progress further, but your friends a little bit early. You want to be able to come back there and, and still be having a fun time. You know? And so there's different spaces to explore in different areas where you may not have seen it the first time. So that's why you're taking those systems and this AI stuff. You can allow different and new experiences each time you kind of come back and play it. Really interesting to see the way that, you know, the sort of campaign and multiplayer areas of design sort of feed off each other and get, you know, get intermingled in yeah. terms of the, under, the core philosophy here with Call of Duty. I mean, it's one of the things that the three-year dev development cycle gave us was the ability to spend that first year trying to figure how much we get to mingle together. It makes me so happy. We were talking about this earlier, which is um, seeing narrative elements now entering into multiplayer, seeing kind of characters with personality and so forth. You know, I, I live and breathe for telling stories and the narrative, and then obviously the, the fun, uh, and as, as we've now got co-op in there as well, it's like taking more from the MP, and then I love the fact that I'm now seeing personality kind of coming into the MP game yeah, as well. Jason's referring to the specialists, the nine playable characters in MP, and they do, they have backstories, uh, and you know, there's a secret way in the campaign game that they're referenced, right? Because it's a big universe, so you, you, don't, you don't see them to verbatim, and you keep the universe big, you, you connect them to the world, and they're part of the timeline, sort of indirectly, and yeah. you know, it's a little bit of a secret how, but it's fun. <laughs> and there's a f one, if there's one thing we know about Treyarch, it's how you guys love your layered stories, your interconnection, yeah. your, uh, you your know zombie that? trickery, yeah. and all that stuff. <laughs> right. talk about that. We're not going <laughs> to use that word. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll look forward to hearing that word maybe a little later this year yeah. as uh, we look towards the fall release of Call of Duty. You guys have set a date, right? Yes. Yeah, that's right. So. Uh, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC, and we're on November 6. Fantastic. David Vonderhaar, Jason Blundell, thank you guys so thank much you. for thank coming you. on. Kicking off our stage show here with Call of Duty Black Ops 3. Coming up next, folks, a game that made a splash at Sony's press conference debuted for the first time, Horizon Zero Dawn. One of the best things every year at E3 is the surprises, the games you didn't know were coming and the games that blow you away when you see them for the very first time. One of those is Horizon Zero Dawn from Guerrilla Games. And joining me on the couch now, Herman and JB. Guys, thank you so much for coming here. And thank you so much for debuting such an awesome looking game. Thank, thank you. you. 
It's fantastic to be here. Yeah, is it kind of that kind of thing of like, you've been working on this game for a little while now, and now everyone gets to see it for the wow. first time. You can say the word Horizon in confidence. Horizon yeah. Zero Dawn. Zero Just say Dawn. it once, JP. You know, Horizon Zero Dawn. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. It's, <laughs> it's been a long time coming. We've been working on this game for almost five years. Wow. So it's, it's very exciting for us to finally be here and show it to the rest of the world. And I mean, my mind brims with so many questions, but for those of you who didn't catch the reveal at Sony's press conference, uh, basically sort of a, a, a post post apocalypse world. It's like the apocalypse happened, everyone was recovering, sure, but now it's it's like the distant future to the point where yeah. the sort of the old ones who built these skyscrapers are myth. It's exactly. So we, uh, the cataclysm happened. We're about a thousand years on, so nature has completely reclaimed the land, and. Um, you know, that's, that's where the twist is. Human life is no longer the dominant species. It's now the machines that run the show. Yeah, I was wondering, so you guys, they're machines, clearly sort of the creatures, but this is an ecosystem that's developed and there are carnivores and herbivores, if you could call them carnivores and herbivores. I mean, you guys had to kind of puzzle out a whole web of nature when designing those creatures, right? Yeah, there's a whole ecology, ecolo ecology there and it's all very intertwined. We're not really going to tell you basically how all the robots are interconnected and what their exact backstory is, but basically that's one of the big mysteries about playing the game and finding it out. But in the movie, you can you could already call out a couple of the elements that, where you see the machines working together. Mm -hmm. uh, Aloy, she's taken out the little watcher because uh, clearly he will alert uh, some of the bigger, more aggressive machines. Uh -huh. And so you see him come together. You also see that some of these uh, these grazers. Uh, you have the, the regular herd like, but also more the alpha guys that will take you on. So there's a lot of collaboration between the machines. And then of course the giant sort of dinosaur, brontosaurus-esque uh, ones looming in the background, just all these questions come to mind. Are those discs, uh, do they get solar power? You know, how do they do all this stuff? And I think that, you know, obviously we're not gonna go too deep into it now, but just the way you, that sort of sparks the imagination. Was this something that for you guys was really must have been just a, a tremendous act of creativity and collaboration. Yeah, especially from a story point, basically just weaving this whole universe, basically where the robots and a sort of tribal form of mankind live next to each other. It's been really interesting playing with those two components and seeing how they interlock. And, and we, yeah, we haven't even seen sort of the nobles. They're referenced in the trailer, but this is just one tribe. There are also, there's a whole human society in addition to you know, the, the creatures we see. And it, that's exactly what this game is about. All these big questions, these machines, where do they come from? Why are they here? How does Aloy, as the, as the playable character, how does she relate to them? And, and she's taken us on a journey to uncover exactly these kind of mysteries. And I think the word relate there is so key. One of the moments that a lot of people I talked to about this really latched onto was when she takes out that first creature and says, you know, she's she's gentle. She says, "Sorry, little one." There's a kind of respect shown for the creatures. It's not this normal adversarial man versus machine relationship. Now, to the people of this world, Becky, th these machines are part of nature. They are a form of nature, and they've never actually known a world without these machines. So, to them, Becky, they don't really see the difference between the geese and the birds and the fish or the machines basically that walk the lands. Yes, because they're also organic creatures. You see birds fly. They're not, it's not all machine creatures. It's just another pillar of this whole world. And all right, I could, I want, I want to talk lore and the creation of these creatures forever, but now we're in combat here and let's talk a little bit about, about this. You guys have gone from Killzone, the series, first person shooter, uh, you know, par excellence, and now into a third person action game. There's shooting, sort of, what was your, what's your philosophy for what kind of experience you want to create for the player in combat? So you, clearly you see Aloy being a, a, a member of a relatively primitive tribe, taking on a massive giant robotic machine here. Uh, so she's, uh, the, the raw power she can never match. So she will have to be smart, she will have to be agile, and that is before, during, and after combat. Uh, she's, uh, she's got a bow with a lot of different uh, types of ammo on it. She's got a, a rope caster to tie him down. Uh, it's all about intelligence, agility, and knowledge here in, in terms of combat. And obviously, we're building on the experience we've gained making Killzone. Killzone was all about tactical combat, and so is Horizon. So in, in that sense, we're kind of building on the legacy. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're seeing uh, the protagonist here, Adeline, is that her name? Aloy. Aloy? Aloy. Aloy. And uh, she's using weapons that are sort of 
machine salvaged, machine built, but when you talk about the human society, you guys talk about nobles, and sort of a, that sort of implies a different scale of weaponry and of organization and of society. So uh, that's just another part of the world creation, I'd imagine. Yeah, that, that's the part of it, basically. The, the tribes in this world have very little, little understanding of technology. They're not at that level yet, but they do have this very high level of technology in nature. So these machines, basically, have their own elements. Basically, they have ammo types that are explosives or certain weapons. And Aloy's type of combat is also about being resourceful, about gathering these, these resources and combining them, making new weapons out of it that they can use against the machines. Yeah, and let's talk about something that's, you know, gathering resources, stuff that's outside of combat. Can you give a little hint about what kind of the, the gameplay flow is going to be between combat times and, not com and exploration or anything like that? I, I think it's um, it's a little early to go in too much depth on the RPG side of things, but in this movie you already see a whole you, you see her actually harvesting some of the elements. You see in the weaponry that there's robotic elements, machine elements already on her weapons. She uses that for her armor, for her for her ammo, and other things. Mm -hmm. uh, you see the grazers; they're they're kind of mining the earth. Uh, you see the canisters that she's after. So clearly, these have a purpose for her. Uh, so that, that's a big part of this game. It is an action, open-world RPG. It is an open-world RPG. Uh, with competitive multiplayer added in, of course. And we're making a single-player <laughs> game. Thank you very much. Fantastic. And it just looks gorgeous, too. I mean, you guys have been working on it for five years, but in five years, tech has changed, tech has evolved, but you guys at Gorilla have always sort of been on top, keeping your game, keeping, you know, sort you of at the bleeding talk edge. Talk to the art director. Yeah, how do you sort of, you know, art direction and then technical execution, you guys just marry those so well. Yeah, well, you know, building Killzone has always been a very good experience. Basically, we, we love science fiction, but this was something completely new for us as well. Building very large, very lush worlds is a completely new, different challenge. So, <laughs> yeah. all Not the a lot of greenery on Hellgate. All, all the artists basically went from, you know, okay, I'm really good at making metal and concrete, and now, okay, I'm gonna get become really fucking good at making trees and grass and big mountains. So, do you guys just have nature documentaries running in the background all day long? All day, all day. <laughs> Lots of, them. but a, a world like this. I mean, this is at a at an apocalypse, but then a thousand years on. Try to think that through conceptually. There is obviously no photographic reference of a world like that. Mm -hmm. So everything is being discussed by the team, and not just the art team, but predominantly also the design team. Uh, it's all. It's been a lot of sussing out for us. <laughs> I would imagine so. And just yeah, kind of conceptualizing what kind of story you want to tell in the world, because you're taking on, you know, at least. Uh, the themes that come to mind, the man versus machine, the sort of technology versus nature, you're subverting that in a big way, but so there's still, there's power to be found and identification in terms of our natural reactions. Oh God, the giant robot monster must be evil, but you're really sort of playing at maybe something that's more nuanced than that. There are a lot of big themes here. You know, life after us, what happens actually when, when humankind no longer is that dominant species. Uh, there's also the autonomy of, of machines, of drones. Like, how does that work? Mm -hmm. So we're not necessarily answering all those scientific questions in great detail in this game, but they are kind of the backdrop for us coming up with these big concepts. Yeah, I don't need to know what, you know, what the exact chemistry is of these green tanks on the back of the grazer here, but man. There, there, there is a reason for all of that in the game. Oh, it, yeah, yeah, I guess that's another challenge, right? If you're building an entire world, an entire new place you're conceptualizing, you also have to have some focus. Otherwise, you're never going to develop a game. You got to sort of pare down the things that are important to you. And so, in terms of the player experience, what's what were some of those pillars of what's important to you guys with Horizon Zero Dawn? Well, there's a couple of aspects. First of all, basically exploration. Maybe this is a large world. There's a lot of mysteries in it. There's a lot of stories to tell. So we want the player to go out there and find interesting places, see a point on the horizon and go there and find adventure there. That's really important for us. But of course, it's also a combat game. It is an open world action adventure. And that action part is really important to us. So yeah. as you go out there, basically, there's lots of activities to do and lots of creatures to fight and also lots of humans to fight, of course, as well. There were a couple of big themes, obviously, that are major pillars for us. It is the, uh, the nature versus the advanced technology. That is a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, it is that David versus Goliath feeling of the primitive hunter versus these giant robotic machines. Uh, so these are a, a couple of these kind of tensions that we've been playing with and that are very key to this game. 
Yeah, and we see that in the loadout of the, you know, the different sort of explosive arrows, the rope arrows, the, uh, the different uh, ways that you have in combat to take on a boss. And I think that what was particularly inspiring about that particular fight here is it's not just shoot the big thing until the big thing, you know, until the damage bar goes all the way down. It's not just shoot it at the one weak point one or two times until it falls down. There's more going on. There's more challenge. There's more dynamics there. And, uh, and, and, and Aloy is, she's not just a, a brutish hunter that likes to kill things for, for killing's sake. She's very respectful. She's a very curious character. She's in a way a champion of life. So she does what she needs to do. And there's that, yeah, that philosophy that, you know, many associate with sort of the Native American tribes having that respect for nature. And do you guys sort of draw on any particular rebels of history or of human civilization now and in the, in the past to sort of inspire you? Any touchstones in particular? Our, as part of the research, we looked at every single tribe that ever existed and read their stories. And Native American tribes are part of that as well, but also Mongolian tribes or African tribes, basically just looking basically at how humanity sort of lives in its most primeval form. Which is not a confirmation that all of these tribes are in Horizon. <laughs> Just to clarify. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it was, you even uh, early on, you know, sort of the, the trailer, you're getting a look at a, a very diverse kind of humanity, you know, and I think that that's one of the powerful things in terms of imagining a new future. What kind of diversity do you have there? What kind of societies have come up, you know, given that it's basically sort of the world has gone through a millennia of upheaval and, and human and, and shifting and nature up Talking rising. about these tribes, these tribes, they have never known a world without these machines in it. Uh, so the old ones, that's, that's us, right? So uh, the way they deal with the machines is very different. Uh, some hunt them down, some might do other, find other ways of dealing with them. Uh, they might find a way to make them friendlier. They might, you know, a lot of different ways of dealing with them. Sure, it's easy to identify imagine. Identify distinguishes the difference between the tribes. Between the tribes, their exactly. own philosophy is how they yeah. take on the world. I mean, it's easy to imagine animal husbandry developing, you know, with a grazing population, for example. And, and of course, every tribe has their own story of their origin, maybe how they came to be, what the machines are doing. None of all of these stories are correct, of course. Maybe there's lots of mythology and legend there as well. Well, Horizon Zero Dawn, a world full of stories, and at this point, a lot of mysteries that I personally am so, so eager to explore. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on and taking the time to talk about the new game, Horizon thank you. Zero Dawn. It's looking fantastic, folks. I hope you're as excited as I am, because I'm really excited. All right, stay with us. We are coming back to the GameSpot stage here at E3 with another exciting game demo. Just a moment.
brought to you by MSI Computers. MSI, number one in gaming. Find out more at us.msi.com. And then, of course, Microsoft closed out their press conference with one of their big franchise. We all knew it was going to come. Gears of War, they said Gears of War Ultimate Edition. It's the original Gears, remastered, yep. modernized, coming out on August 25th. But it's Gears of War 4 that we saw the longer demo. For. Gears 4. They've dropped Sorry, the of you're war. Right. Very cool. There's yeah. no war Very happening. True. There's just Gears. <laughs> and four of them. Gears apparently. 4. And yeah. uh, it starts off, and it's a guy we don't really recognize in a dark place, and then he's with a woman. They are, are they the new Marcus and Dom? Yeah, or Marcus and four? Anya. Marcus and Anya? Yeah. But I mean, she's are. playable right from the get go. Yeah. It took till Gears of War 3 for Anya to yeah, take to the field. True. Uh, but here we are. It's very dark. Right there, we see there are two, two moons. moons. And so I did a little Googling, mm. and according to Gearspedia, there right. Sarah, the planet that Gears, take, mm. Gears of War takes place on, has only one moon. So this, is are, another this could be a new planet. New Obviously, they share some technology. We yeah. see, see, see the chainsaw, chainsaws, the Lancer. Yep. <laughs> This shotgun <laughs> on the Nasher on his back looks yep. very familiar. Yep. Uh, it looks it looks really, really cool. I love, I'm just having flashbacks to playing the first two Gears games in co-op, and I'm just so excited about it now. Um, I never realized how much I cared about Gears until right now. Like yeah. We're seeing it again, <laughs> being like, man, I remember having so much fun with Gears. I'm looking forward to seeing more of it now. And, I mean... Expanded fiction, sure, why not? This is a t chance for them to actually try and tell a better story. I mean, the first Gears game had, of the bunch, had the most interesting story of it because it was laying out a universe. Mm -hmm. and this it is had kind the benefit of, of being the origin. Yeah, exactly. Right? And if they treat this in a similar fashion where they reset everything and kind of draw a line underneath all the other stuff that happened before and tell a new Gears story, it could be an opportunity to, like go back to that first era, the first game and have an interesting story to tell Don't touch again. that. Don't touch, touch that. It's not only that he touches it, he leans over it. Yeah, he leans it, over so he it. It's like, just like right yeah, in his face. Right in, uh, in terms of, you know, new, you were talking about new fiction, mm. we also see new enemies. So uh -huh. perhaps uh, instead of, you know, the emulsion inside the planet yeah. making locusts, Wretches. it made these creepy like more insectile enemies yeah. we saw right at the end. Yeah, I mean the enemies that we saw, like the f the f when it first popped up, I was like, wow, it looks like Rex from Mass Effect. It does. Yeah. yeah so so <laughs> like I just want to hear the gear just sound like Krogan <laughs> <laughs> as they're shooting, <laughs> as it's coming towards them. Oh, I miss Rex. Yeah, oh, man, he's what if and Mass Effect were in the same universe. He looks just like Rex. Oh, look at his teeth. Well, except now. Really except tongues. now, yeah. <laughs> and the main character looks. Any tongues. He looks just like B J Blasco. It's a bit like <laughs> I remember. <laughs> People made that uh, <laughs> observation that, wow, he looks like BJ. He does, But yeah, yeah I like the UI looks similar, so it's kind of uh, evoking yeah. the same old, old Gears of War, kind of familiar feeling. And I just sure. think graphically it looks fantastic. Oh, it looks yeah, great. it looks, I mean, the Gears games are always stunning to look at, and um, chainsawing things is still rad, That's apparently. <laughs> yeah, as you can see here. Are you guys sad to not see uh, Doom-style dismemberment out of these chainsaw You know what, I'm okay. I'm okay <laughs> with <laughs> it. I'm, I'm all right you. with it. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> and with that tongue party in the Gears of War guy, ah! or the Gears 4 guy's face, uh, <laughs> we're going to wrap up here our post-show coverage from Microsoft's press conference 2015 at E3. We are going to be coming back at you in just a short amount of time. Let me check the schedule here, because we have got the EA press conference coming up yep. at 1230. That's in just 45 minutes. Uh, we'll be back with the pre-show. And so please come join us then, get some food or whatever meal time it is for you right now. We're going to go eat. We'll be back to talk about EA here live from GameSpot HQ at E3 2015.
looming in the West Hall, South Hall, of E3 is a statue, I'm told, of five badasses tempting you to come in and play Battleborn. Battleborn is here. Randy Pitchford, president and CEO of Gearbox, is here. And E3 is on, Randy. And it is. And Battleborn is here in a big way. I, we're here at E3. E3 is in a big way. <laughs> like, there's so many awesome games here. Already, and it's, like, just getting started I, here. You know, I can't believe how, like, what, the, what position we're in as an industry right now. Um, uh, it is no better time to be a gamer and to dive into next gen. If you're, if you're already here, you can feel it. Uh -huh. If you're not on the next gen yet, you need to be as soon as Come possible. Come on here because then there's so much awesome. VR and, and AR is dude, coming and just so much cool stuff. And the booth that 2K has for us at Battleborn, it's unreal. It's like <laughs> the biggest booth. Like it just, just destroys the stuff we did for Borderlands. Like it is insane. I can't believe how much 2K is behind the game. I'm just like, oh my God, this is great. I hope people like the game. Hope people like the <laughs> yes. game. I mean, yeah, but people are getting to get a look at it now. Yes, we're yeah, take we have about playable. We got playable? We playable at, people are playing I'm right now. Go over over there, they're there playing the game. It's later. crazy. Uh, so I can, uh, is, very important question okay. here. Is the Mushroom Samurai Badass playable? Uh, I believe Miko is one of the play. I, I have to double check. Yes, I, I'm pretty sure Miko's playable. I know we have Miko. We've I want to play the Mushroom, Randy. You know, we're shipping the game. It's it's this crazy hero shooter. Shooter. We're shipping the game with 25 playable characters. Wow. We have 10 playable on the show floor today. Okay. But 20. You know, Borderlands shipped. We had four playable characters. Yeah. And then we added a couple as DLC. Yeah. But we're shipping the game with 25 playable characters. And each character, we've invested about four times as much in each character as we did for the Borderlands characters. That's across the board. That's in voiceover and how many, like how much dialogue they have. That's in bones for animation. That's in fidelity of the materials and, and uh, how many, you know, how, how how much detail we build these guys out of. How many polygons of characters? Are. Every aspect of these characters about four times the investment. Does of a the bone character. budget get more expensive when you have four? Hands? I know, right? <laughs> so the, yeah. So right now you're looking at a Rendy who's this bitchin uh, witch basically, and uh, she is super wicked. Uh, one of her uh, uh, special abilities allows her to create this column of dark matter and dark energy that just rips guys apart. Uh, dark magic. I love Arendi. I, in fact, Arendi is one of the most, in my opinion, one of the most powerful uh, assassins in the game. Just really good at, at throughput and doing a lot of damage to groups of enemies. Good at AoE. This is Caldarius. Now these guys are all battleborn. All these characters are, are battleborn and Caldarius is one of the battleborn. He's just this awesome kind of Gundam guy and he's got jet packs he can, he can zip around with. Battleborn really is the name for them in addition to just being the name of the game? Yeah, we call them Battleborn. They're, they're each members of factions that are around the last star. Uh, and the last star uh, in the entire universe is where it's all going to go down. We know that eventually all the stars will burn out. That's that at grim, some Randy. point in the future, Real dark. at some point, <laughs> the whole universe will be dark. Man, at some point, it's too it's early all to over. get that heavy but, at E3. But but before that moment, there's going to be one star left, and every species that has the ability to travel the stars will end up there, and they're all going to disagree, right? Some factions will think they need to protect that star. Others will want to study it and to understand what makes it work, maybe to keep it alive longer, or maybe to create other stars. Some can't wait for the end. They're almost like religious fanatics. They can't wait for it all to be over uh -huh. so that they can... Uh, they can, um, you know, maybe maybe they believe there's going to be some some future. But, Who knows but, what the mushroom men believe? Right, but but in the story of Battleborn, uh, all these opposing factions realize they have to come together to fight against the real madness, and that's the the what's destroying the universe. You see, uh, we know today the universe is being torn apart, uh, being accelerated. Um, and everything's spreading apart faster than, than it should. Mm -hmm. and, and it's dark matter and dark energy that's behind that. So our, our crazy little fiction we've invented um, uh, personifies that. We've, we've created this entity called the Varelsi, which are like the bad guys that are tearing the universe apart. And you have to deal with the Varelsi. you got to take care of them. you got to become one of the Battleborn. Now but it's, it's, yeah, go ahead. You, you talked about the Battleborn as sort of uh, being potentially antagonistic towards each other. Yes. That's your... Maybe your competitive multiplayer sort of side of this. Yeah, but yeah. The factions are at war, yet uh -huh. they all have to come together to deal with this uh, greater struggle. But what we're seeing now is the cooperative side. Yeah. So Battleborn actually has several game modes. You can play a campaign. You can play it totally solo, so it's a single player campaign, or you can play it cooperatively, and up to five people can play together. So uh, it's 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 pretty full featured in that regard. And there is a PvP mode, a, a full fledged. Uh, I'm hoping people really like it and and enjoy the competitive mode because I'd 
love to see I'd love to see us invest in more of the esports kind of stuff with this game. We're having fun playing competitive every day. Here at E3, people are playing the campaign. Uh, it's broken into a series of, of chapters. Uh -huh. So each scenario you can consume in, a, in a, a scenario of gameplay, a little session of gameplay, and you'll level up your hero, you'll earn gear and loot, and you'll deal with bad guys and badasses, and uh, it's a lot of fun to play cooperatively. It's also a lot of fun to play alone because it gives you kind of more time to check out the environments, which are just beautiful. Scott Kester, the art director, and his team have just done an incredible job rendering uh, this environment. And you know, Scott was the character designer for Borderlands, so we've really just t taken the shackles off of him. Yeah, and his you, team you had some, you know, you had some creative-looking characters in Borderlands, but I think Battleborn, you guys have definitely taken it to a new level That's in terms right. of. Also, just the sheer diversity of uh, characters you have. Yes. Any look at sort of art for the game reveals any number of wildly different looking uh, heroes. And yeah. that's driven not merely by the art direction, but also by the game design. And um, Randy Varnell, who's just an awesome designer. He was the design producer of Borderlands 2. Mm -hmm. Just an incredible, talented guy. Super passionate about the game. Uh, he's been uh, working hand in hand with the engineering team, the creature team from Borderlands that did all the enemies is 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 on on Battleborn and uh, Art uh, Scott Kester and his art team. Um, and these guys have all been working together to make this just incredible experience that I'm in love with. I remember when I first talked to Scott and uh, and Randy about about doing this game and the idea of it. And here we are. We're playing it. It's incredible. <laughs> and when you talk about play, the play experience of play here, uh, in Borderlands, you know, it's first-person shooting action. It's, uh, you, you know, you're sort of generally ground-based. I mean, there's some jumping, there's some mild platforming in the environments. But when you look at the Battleborn characters, you've got to imagine that sort of being nimble, moving around the environment, and also having specific powers that feed into that is a lot more of a part of Battleborn than it was Borderlands. And so... I mean, is that true? Is, well, is it sort really of depends on the character. And the actual experience of playing It really diverse? depends on the character. Part of the yeah. fantasy we have in creating Battleborn is to make sure that all of our different archetypes, all the different kinds of uh, characters we like to play as in first-person shooter are represented in some way. So yeah, you'll find super nimble characters like Thorn who can leap across incredibly far distances. Um, uh, or, or you'll find these like stout, like Baldur is like this this really stout dwarf guy who's just super tough and he wields an axe and he's got a kilt. And in fact, from certain camera angles when his kilt flies up, we actually do the blurry thing. Oh so you man, don't see you guys privates. put dwarf <laughs> upskirts in the game. I know, it's 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 uh, <laughs> only only in Battleborn. There's uh, there's a, there's characters with stealth abilities. There's character like super tanks like Montana is just massive, so he's a slow and lumbering but Hulk. His head is like this big. Yes, he's but, so tiny. but his head is in proportion with his feet. If you look closely. <laughs> So All right. Just, At least just there's some rhyme and yeah, reason yeah. in the world. But but these guys, um, there's a spectrum. So so really, we're trying to think of. Uh, uh, if you have a certain style of play character of character that you like to play in a first-person shooter, you can find something for you in Battleborn. It's for every every badass is represented. Every and 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 it's just um, it's it's cool for me because I like I'm a snack boxer. I like sampling uh -huh. different characters. So snack boxers a type as well. You guys yeah, cater to yeah. <laughs> I like sampling all the different characters. But you know it's weird. Sometimes I'll I'll get into one and I just and I'll just stick with that for a while trying to master it. And one of the other things that's cool that we learned from Borderlands, you know, to feel the full potential of a character, you have to invest at least 35, 40 hours yeah. to feel the full potential. We wanted to feel these characters in more accessible gaming sessions. We want gamers that, that like to have fun playing with their friends for short periods of time to be able to get the full experience of a character. So in the course of a scenario or in a story chapter, you'll be able to get the full growth potential of that character. So if you want to try out Thorn, for example, the elf and archer, and you want to feel what her full capability is, get multi-shot arrows, be able to create like poison AOE blasts and all the cool stuff she can do, you can feel her full growth tree in a single scenario. And then the next scenario you play, the next chapter you play, you can try one of the other characters like Montana. And even within the character, there well, are... Wrath, Wrath is, and that's a Rendy. Yeah, go Even ahead. within the character in uh, games of this ilk tends to be uh, a certain amount of branching pathways. You know, if you have yes. a certain character to play, over the course of one match, you play the second match with that character, you could spec them in a real different way. Yeah, just in the scenario itself, we have a helix system, which through a series of binary choices, every time you level up, you can do this skill or that skill, this skill or that skill. And through that series of binary choices, you have radically different ways that you can build each character. Thousands of combinations per character, just in the scenario Thousands, that you play. Randy, this game sounds like a balancing nightmare. How do you guys make <laughs> sure is. that all of these it characters oh, are like... it's a disaster. <laughs> it's a freaking disaster. We are playtesting it every day at Gearbox, and 
e each week there's like a new meta about which, because you know, we're constantly <laughs> tweaking. And, and what, what's also cool is we have a focus test group. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we have uh, hundreds of people uh, that, that are part of our focus test group that come into Gearbox and play the game with us. If you happen to live in the Dallas area, look, go to the Gearbox website, you could sign up, and if you're lucky, you might get chosen to play the game with us. And I hope, and, I, and I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to do it, uh, to, we're going to do a beta later, uh, and that'll get more people involved. And the combination of our crazy, incessant playtesting internally, our focus test group playing it with us every single day, and uh, in the beta that we'll unlock, hopefully we'll be pretty well balanced by the time we launch. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you know like all the support we did for Borderlands, you can expect us to continue to support the game after we launch. I, and I think that's part of the fun too. Certainly Borderlands, to like a modern <laughs> standard for DLC support yeah, in terms not, of not just the just, amount of stuff you guys put in. And but not just DLC too, like we've, we've done a host of updates and we're still tweaking um, the drop rate balance. In fact, just, just um, last month we did a, a run of each week doing different um, drop rate uh, changes for legendary drops in Borderlands 2 mm -hmm. and Borderlands the pre-sequel and we've, we've updated that. I still give out shift codes. If you follow me on, on Twitter, uh, which is at Duval Magic, uh, I give out content. I give out free stuff uh, for I can Borderlands. attest this is true. Yeah, like yeah. every I, so often your tweets are just a jibber jabber of numbers and letters. <laughs> and I can't wait to do it for Battleborn. We've got so much more stuff that, that outside of these simple scenarios where you can build your character completely within just a short session. We have a very large metagame so there's a hobby grade experience there. You'll be getting loot. You'll be finding gear and you'll outfit your character with gear and you'll modify your gear setup in between matches. That's and you'll be sort collecting of characters broader progression yes. in, in addition to yes. the like in match progression. That's correct. That's yeah. correct. There's a broader progression for each character that you collect. There's also a broader collection for your profile. For you yourself, uh, the player will rank up and you'll earn benefits from ranking up. All right, so Randy, who's your flavor of the flavor of the day? Who's oh, your give me a, oh, give man. Me a hero? Okay, um, I've been playing. Ooh, that's a tough one. I've been playing Arendi a lot. Um, that's the forearms. Yeah, she, yeah. I love I love Arendi. Um, I I tend to go back to Montana. One of the um, augments, one of the helix choices in the middle, lets you choose between fire and ice. Mm -hmm. So like half the time I'll pick fire, which does a lot more damage as a dot on the enemy. You know, light them up on fire. Your your barrel of that minigun heats up and just lights on fire, and it's just so awesome to burn guys down. But then the other option is ice, where you can freeze enemies, slow them down, mm -hmm. um, cool everything off. That's awesome too. Uh, Montana is just one of the standbys. And what's funny about Montana, he was originally in uh, a Furious 4, which just completely got converted into a totally different thing. So uh, it kind of exposes our evolutionary process in doubling down on this game design that we've evolved. And kind of echoes of Mr. Torg in Montana, Yeah, too, there's as a little well. bit of Torg Certainly in Certainly in terms of his uh, <laughs> stature. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I'll tell you also, uh, Oscar Mike is a lot of fun to play. He's just the classic, you know, if you like Halo and like Space Marines, he is the classic Space Marine. If you are, if you've played Halo and that feels good to you, you can pick Oscar Mike and you'll know exactly what to do. And you'll feel exactly at home. And he is super fun to play because he's just that classic, you know, standard arch type that we've all played a million times. Mm -hmm. And he's there for us as well. And he's right in yeah. there. Uh, amidst the mushroom people and the four-armed witches. Miko is a trip, dude. Miko's <laughs> actually a healer. And, um, but he, he's pretty powerful too. He can actually take his mushroom head off and throw it into the world, and it creates this healing mushroom cloud around oh, it. Yeah, he, ta he just takes his head off. I, I say he, um, I actually don't think Miko has a gender. Has a gender, yeah. It's not neither he nor, it's some weird species that is that can um, reproduce with themselves. I don't know. I don't know how Miko Sounds has like sex. Sounds like you guys had some interesting <laughs> brainstorming yeah. sessions when it yeah. came to coming up with so these characters. So Miko has no gender. <laughs> <laughs> And there's plenty, and Phoebe's awesome too. I've been playing Phoebe a lot. She, um, she's part of the LLC, so she's kind of this Victorian steampunk looking girl. Mm -hmm. And she, uh, she's, she summons these foils, which are swords, and she creates these magic swords and summons them, and she can have them rain down on enemies, and she's a lot of fun. I'm down with magic swords. You know, I when, I I when I talk to Randy Varnell, one of the designers, he reminds us of like back when we were kids, he still has his Star Wars like Darth Vader uh, collector's case that you put all the action figures in. And he's like, this is like the video game version of that. <laughs> like the collector's case that you put all your characters Get in. Get all your action yeah, figures. Yeah. yeah, so you guys are saying you have 10 characters here playable, aiming for 25 total. We will ship with 25. You're going to ship with 25. Can you believe that? It's crazy. That's yeah. a lot. You That's think a lot about that. You know, when we sold the characters as DLC, we shipped four in Borderlands. Uh -huh. When we sold those characters as DLC, the publisher marked them at 10 bucks a piece. We're including 25 characters that are all 
more investment than we've ever made in a character mm -hmm. uh, at ship. It's just unbelievable how much content we're putting in. And it's only because we were so successful with Borderlands that we can invest so much in this game. Well, you guys had great success with Borderlands. We've been very here's, fortunate. Here's wishing you success with Battleborn. I Board. hope so. I hope people like it because we're going nuts. We're, we're really trying something that no, no one's ever tried before, so I hope people really enjoy it. Well, thanks for coming on stage and talking Battleborn, folks. If you're here at E3, go ahead and check it out in the South Hall. Now we're going to be back on stage in just a minute with a quick check-in with the folks at Kind of Funny Games who are broadcasting just across the way. We'll be back. Talk to you then. Jack. Astute GameSpot viewers will notice that while we have two stages this year, one of them is GameSpot Cross Kinda Funny. Joining me from Kinda Funny Games, Nick Scarpino. Jack, is this mic working? I don't know. I can hear do you we have Do we have confirmation that people can hear my voice? I don't know. I'll tell you one thing they right now. You guys have a lot more coming through. Uh, uh, comfy of a stage than we do. I'm just really? gonna, yeah, I mean, it's been a long conference. Well, I'm just why gonna, don't you just make yourself at home? I'm just gonna kind of sprawl out a little bit. Oh, God. Can I put the you mic? Can expect from the fine folks at I'm gonna put the mic. I'm gonna put the mic right on my tummy. Nick, uh, I understand it's been a big few days for you getting the production going. It has. It's been fun. Have, We've you, been, um, have you looked at a video game or two? I've seen a couple of video games, which have been great. Um, I probably, this is the sad thing, and I don't know how much you do of the stage show for GameSpot. By the way, thank you so much for having us. We're Dude, having a great time. It's a pleasure. But we don't ever actually get to go play games. Oh, yeah. Which is the most oh, annoying it's killer. part of it, right? And so there are, I mean, I'm looking at, you know, Star Fox Zero over there. I'm looking, I'm, there's a, a, Nintendo's just taunting all of us. Black Ops 3 right over, over here. Well, yeah, we're not going to be able to play it, but. Um, no, I get home from E3 and people say to me like, hey, cool, you were like just immersed in video game yeah, like, heaven all week. No, like, this beautiful was, half circle is my room. I was immersed in live. video game temptation all week. I didn't get to play a single video game. I, can I just play video games all weekend? Right, right, right. Which usually works well because I just want to be in a dark, quiet place. Yes. After E3? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or, Especially after E3. <laughs> or the bottom of a bottle, but we're not going to go too far into that. Oh, my hair looks good. It Hold does on, look good, man. That. You're looking sharp. Little, uh, you guys have been having some fun on your stage over there already this morning. We did. Earlier this morning, we had Cisco drop by. The, the dragon. Cisco. The Cisco. He brought mm. a couple of his boys. We had some good time with him. Uh, he fits right in, I want you to know, into the chaos that is kind of funny. I believe it. Uh, 
great guy, really nice guy, super into games. And a lot of times, and I don't want to, I don't want to call people out here, but oftentimes when you meet celebrities, real Sh celebrities, sure, not faux internet celebrities like myself, yes, um, they don't really know what they're talking about. They've got a few lines. They used to play Mario. Or they're being paid. Yeah, they're like they're being paid to rep the game, and they're like, no, sure. I really love Which is this legit. game. It's totally cool to have that kind of investment in video games. Sure. However, if you put yourself onto a video game stage. But Cisco came and he brought the heat. Oh, and really? He know, and he knows what's up. And he is super cool. He's going to be coming back and joining us throughout the day today. Uh, and we're super excited to have him. Well, you guys were talking your game of show. Did Cisco offer up his. Cisco uh, absolutely did. We, we have a top five list. Now, okay. he's allowed to change it until the end of today because he's not with us tomorrow. Okay. But I believe top on his list was Horizon. Horizon. That's top on my list, too. He had Horizon. I believe he had Uncharted 4, uh, Last Guardian, and two others, which, which escape me right now. But you gotta give him you gotta give him props for that. And that's, what about that's you? Not a bad what's list. your what's your number one? My number one currently, currently. Currently. Man, I gotta be honest, I'm excited for a lot of things. I don't play a ton of games. But one game that I did play that I felt went really, really um, was underwhelming to the mainstream public, but was near and dear to my heart, uh, was Mirror's Edge. Mirror's and so Edge? to see Mirror's Edge coming back and having a little bit of a show at the yeah. EA conference was nice, I have to admit. And although I'm not a h I wasn't a huge uh, fan of Mass Effect 3, starting a conference with Mass Effect. Is not a bad way to That's go. That's a pretty good move. Not bad. I mean, it's not starting a conference with the Last Guardian, but again, I brought this up on <laughs> our our uh, uh, slightly smaller, slightly inferior stage. To your this is amazing. You have a ton of space Spacious. here. Spacious. We can fit a, a party here. Um, Colin, of course, everyone's excited for the Last Guardian, but you have to remember how long have you waited to see this, and is it really coming yeah. out in 2016? Exactly, and you're just getting a taste of it. Honestly, what they showed. He pushed a box. He jumped a ledge or two. I'm not. I don't. I don't want to get blasted on the social medias for saying this, but <laughs> was he trying to kill that Chihuahua the entire time? Because it looks like he was not accomplishing anything other than getting himself or the animal killed. Come on over here to this rickety platform. It's gonna be great. Hey, I'm Trust falling. Me. Let me catch onto your tail and add more weight. Yeah, <laughs> it's completely ridiculous. Um, having said that, ever I, I, growing up, I loved Never Ending Story. I always wanted a Falcor of my own, and this kid has one, and I'm, uh, you know. A little gel. Little a little jealous. gel. It's okay to be jealous. It's just own it. Yeah. All right, Nick. You Thank guys you are so broadcasting much. all day. Kind of funny. All day, every day. It's going to be awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming on stage. We'll My be pleasure. checking in with them, folks, as the day goes on. And we'll be right back on this stage with a demo for Deus Ex Mankind Divided. Stick with us.
one of my favorite series of all time, Deus Ex. So Deus Ex Mankind Divided here on stage. Yes, please. Joining me now, Jean-Francois Dugas from Eidos. Jean-Francois, we are here to talk about the future, talk about augmentations, and uh, I'm just real excited to have you, man. How are you doing? <laughs> Great, you. Thank you. I'm, I'm doing very well. Uh, on stage at the Square Enix show, of course, early this morning. Yeah. Uh, you guys showing the things off to the world. And uh, you got a demo to show that we're going to yep. jump into here in a minute. But uh, let's lay the stage for Mankind Divided. You know, Human Revolution ended with some pretty dramatic events uh, perpetrated by Adam Jensen. Uh, took a shot at the shadowy organizations. But so there's one thing I know about shadowy organizations. They don't go away so easily. <laughs> and, and I guess you're right. Yeah. I, actually, we're, we're two years past Human Revolution. And now after the, the events you were talking about, now the world is way more divided than before, hence the title. And um, uh, uh, augmented citizens are now seen as a threat for the normals, normal people. And uh, there's a lot of fears and now governments are enacting laws to make sure that those people are put in ghettos as much as possible. And if they're not, their life is miserable among the other people because now they're being uh, pointed. They're being uh, persecuted. Uh, exactly. So uh, it's you a tough You guys don't world. shy away from that heavy stuff, huh? Uh, I guess not. <laughs> but, you, but you grapple with it in such a fascinating way. It's one of the things that I think people love about the series is the way you take on, you know, you use the, the augmentation sort of divide to cast light and to address these big social issues. Absolutely. I think uh, that, that was important to, to us through entertainment, through fiction, to get into the, the real stuff that is going in real life and make, hopefully, maybe uh, people think a little bit about these things. Yeah. And uh, But uh, from the entertainment standpoint, uh, Adam Jensen is back. Uh, like Now he's not working for Sarif Industries yeah, anymore. Yeah, who's paying this guy? <laughs> <laughs> it's an international counter-terrorist agency called Task Force 29. It's a subdivision created by Interpol. Okay. And uh, now Adam Jensen uh, is trying to fight the chaos, is trying to bring some stability to the world. But he also has a double agenda. Like you said, like the people in the shadows, they don't go, they don't go away easily. And yeah. is, uh, he hopes through that agency gets, he can get closer to them and hopefully uh, stop them from shaping the world the way they do. Stop them from, yeah, putting their, their hand on the wheel in such an overt way. Yes. Uh, yeah, so here we are, like, launching into a mission. We've got sort of a dropship taking us in. Uh, can you set the stage for what we're going to be what we're gonna be seeing once his metal boots hit the ground? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I don't know if he's upgraded to metal boots yet, yeah. or metal legs. <laughs> we, we don't know yet. It yeah. depends on players, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> um, now he's going to... Uh, uh, a complex or a ghetto in the outskirts of Prague that uh, we wow, call uh, that place is with, uh, affection. Yeah, it's called Gollum City, or the real name it's the Utilek Complex, and it's a ghetto where a lot of uh, augmented citizens are being put in, uh, etc. And there's a faction there that is called the uh, Augmented Rights Coalition, that is led by a guy named uh, Talos Rocker, that are trying to defend the rights of augmented people and okay. trying to make sure that they're not persecuted, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, early in the game, there's a big terrorist attack that happens. And guess what? Those are the prime suspects. Uh. And, but they're in this ghetto. It's hard to get there. Even like the police are just going at the beginning of the ghetto. They don't go deep in. Uh -huh. And you have to go and blend in and try to find a way to get to the guy and confront to confront him and see if those people were behind the attacks. Now, so. we're going to talk about infiltration in a sec. But yeah. one of the things that I, th that I think is wonderful and sort of plays to that conspiracy about Deus Ex is the way that Okay, there was a terrorist attack, and these activists were blamed for it. But if they are, you know, sort of activists for augmented rights, you know, maybe someone's setting them up to smear them. And then also, if they're activists for augmented rights, you're an augmented dude. Like, they're going to make their play on your loyalty and your identity. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, sort of that's... I think that's one of the fascinating things you guys get into. Absolutely, and uh, one of the things we say is that Adam Jensen, when he's in the normal world, let's say he's in the streets of Prague, or when he goes into this ghetto, uh, we call him he's a stranger in a strange land uh -huh. for different reasons. Because when he go into the, the ghetto, uh, people have uh, problems. Uh, it's more dirty, uh, sickness, uh, shortage of the drugs they need for the augmentation. Yeah, they don't have top of the line slick new augs like exactly. this dude. Exactly. So when they see that guy, like you're not, you're not part of us, you know, because you're so shiny and uh, and everything. And when he's in Prague, when he's in Prague, actually, like he's, he's an augmented 
uh, citizen. It's yeah. like, oh, you uh, you don't belong here. Go back in your ghetto kind of thing. So no matter where Jensen goes, he's not outsider. the welcome. Exactly. Yeah. But that also gives him, you know, a unique perspective and gives you guys a unique perspective to work from. Now we're looking at uh, some stealthy infiltration here. Absolutely. Like, it's one of the things that so far in our communication, we showed a lot of the combat-oriented uh, uh, sequences uh, and everything. And today with you guys, we wanted to show that stealth is still like alive and you can do the same map or the same demo as we have uh, behind closed door, but in a totally uh, stealthy fashion. You can just go sneak around, use your uh, cloaking, use your smart vision. And now smart vision has been updated with, uh, you can know what the enemies have, like uh, what kind of guns they have, oh, do they have okay. like kind of uh, uh, like we call pocket secretaries with codes or things like that. So you can have more information on the characters to decide if you're going to go take down the guy or not, or, you know. That's kind of a nice touch because, you know, I definitely remember sort of, all right, I got to like non-lethal take down my way through all these dudes till I find the key card, you know, or find yeah, the code, that's uh, it. find the right dude. So I think just sort of giving players more tools to do that kind of scouting, to do that kind of stealthy approach. And of course, again, you guys are enabling a full stealth playthrough. Absolutely, from start to finish, no exception. Very, no exception. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, but not everyone wants to do the stealth thing. Like it's it's very exacting. Sometimes it's sort of a puzzle that a lot of people relish. Yeah. But I mean, come on, man! You've got these 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 arms, these gun arms. This you got gun all arms. sort of like <laughs> this power, these elbow blades. That's like it. sometimes you just want to wreck house. Exactly, and and that was important to us to really uh, beef up the, the combat experience, to bring it on the same level as Tell, because uh, for a lot of players, they thought that the SX, oh, it, it needs to be played stealthily. And it's not, and uh, for us, that's, that's never been true. Uh -huh. It needs to be played the way you want to play it, yeah. but uh, you, you want it. So it was important that we made the, the, the combat more greedy, uh, those gun arms that are punchy, that uh, the way you play with your augmentations, it's faster than ever, and uh, you'll be able to, uh, to sustain uh, quite a lot of uh, intense dramas on, uh, drama on screen. Yeah, we're getting a little bit of drama here exactly. right now. Is <laughs> exactly. that, uh, that sort of uh, triangular impingement, is that it's, that? It's uh, the Titan shield. Yeah, where he, <laughs> is that the one where he just sort of looks like this black matte exactly. geometry guy? I don't know how to describe it. Yeah. <laughs> it. It's true nanotechnology, and he has this cover shield. Now he can go in the open without taking cover and just shooting at things. But of course, your energy is going to deplete, so you have Pretty to quickly, yeah. exactly you have yeah. to manage it uh, a little bit. But uh, you're going to be able to take way more risks as you move forward uh, into uh, Mankind Divided. Definitely some cool new augmentations on display. Uh, one of my favorite things actually in series history was the in Invisible War being able to like maybe choose a, an augmentation that some other guys developed. It's maybe like not quite the functionality intended. Uh, you guys dabbling in the black market at all? Anything shady coming up through Mankind Divided? It's a very interesting question. It's, a, it's very interesting. <laughs> oh, all right, all right. I got you. I got your E three vibe right there. Uh, <laughs> I mean, come on. In a place like that, it's got to be something shady going on. <laughs> Always something shady or conspiracy going on behind the scenes in Deus Ex. That's one of the thrills of the series. Jean Francois, thank you so thank much you for very coming much. on. Such a great sport to talk to us about Mankind Divided <laughs> here at E three 2015. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break. Up next on the stage, the show that kicked off Microsoft's excellent press conference yesterday, Halo 5 Guardians.
Halo 5 Guardians. Microsoft bookended their show with Halo and Gears of War, their big first party franchises. Halo 5 Guardians on the show right now. From 343 Industries joining me, Chris and Kevin. Guys, Thanks. big show for you. Yeah, we're really excited to be here to yeah. show off what is the most ambitious uh, Halo game we've ever made. So. It's a really yeah, it's big show for awesome. us. Yeah. Well, I mean, Halo games have really been short on ambition in the past, so that's not saying a lot. <laughs> we always like to push the boundaries, yeah. for sure, yeah. Seriously, and you guys showed off uh, that campaign during the press conference, yeah. of course, showed off the four different perspectives, different characters, yeah. and then uh, Warzone, I believe, on display as well. That's yep. right. Warzone's our uh, big new uh, multiplayer mode. It's 12 on 12 uh, with everything in the Halo sandbox in one place. Yeah. Everything in the Halo sandbox in one place. That is a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's start by talking about Warzone a little bit because yeah. I'm a huge Halo multiplayer fan. Uh, I love the way that sort of movement is as powerful as the weapons. Uh, but like, let's give the overview of Warzone. Everything is a lot of things. What do you got? We have uh, AI bosses, which are sort of upgraded AI characters from the campaign that have a really unique personalities. And the players can team up to go after those. OK, so that's like a cooperative endeavor. That's yeah. right, yeah. When you're spawning, you can go after enemy players, after bases, or after bosses. Wait, oh, that's all in the mix? Yeah. yeah. And we oh. also have every weapon and every vehicle that's offered in Halo 5 all in one place. So it's really fantastic. How? Yeah. It sounds like it's got to be kind of a big place. Yeah, oh, absolutely. The, We're dealing with maps that are four times larger than the ones we previously had in Halo. Than yeah. like the typical multiplayer map? That's yeah. right, yeah. So you if you think of Valhalla, like the, think of four of them together. Yeah. Four of them together. <laughs> Man cannons all over the place. Yeah. Did you build the Definitely. deluxe man, like end to end man cannon? <laughs> we don't have an end to end man cannon, but we have a, a ton of man cannons yeah. on the map to help with player movement for sure. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you you build the scale up that much, it just kind of, I imagine it multiplies exponentially the kind of uh, flow decisions you have to make, the kind of like enemy deployment, yeah. weapon placement kind of stuff you got to deal with. Absolutely. We also have to think a lot about vehicle paths. And one of our biggest surprises was when we scaled up the maps this month, we, we ended up with way more airspace. Yeah. So that really opened up all the air combat, where oh, we were featuring yeah. the Banshee and our uh, new vehicle, the Phaeton. The yeah. Phaeton? That's right. That's yeah. nice. Was that we got a glimpse of that in a trailer? We did. Exactly. It's a yeah. Forerunner um, uh, Promethean VTOL. It's sort of like a hovering vehicle that just rains death on players. <laughs> Sounds like it might be kind of fun to fly. Uh, I think I could get behind that. Yeah, you'll get a chance on the show floor today. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, what we're taking a look at now is the uh, campaign demo yeah. you guys showed off at the Microsoft press conference. And of course, uh, showcasing one of the things that I think that I'm certainly most intrigued about for this campaign is the, the return of uh, sort of a foursome of specific characters that yeah. are sort of voiced and uh, with you a significant amount of the time. Yeah, it's actually more like an eightsome. If that's Ate a thing, some. yeah. Um, we have uh, two Spartan squads in the game. Uh, the one that we showcased in the, the media briefing was uh, Fireteam Osiris, which is led by Spartan Jamison Locke. Yes. And uh, he has with him uh, Spartan Olympia Vale, uh, who is a linguistic expert who came from the Navy. Uh, Spartan Columbia Vale sounds like the most badass code name for something <laughs> mysterious and yeah. awesome, by the way. It's I don't know. Olympia Vale. Olympia. Yeah, Olympia yeah, Vale. Right. Yeah. It's even better. Yeah. Yeah. Columbia. Yeah. Uh, Olympia Vale. Yeah. We have uh, Holly Tanaka, who survived the glassing of her homeworld, and she came from the army, so she's this tough uh, Spartan in the squad. And we have our fan favorite, Edward Buck, who oh, has Buck. been minted a Spartan after uh, playing through uh, ODST. Uh, he became a Spartan in the Spartan 4 program. There oh, yeah. he is, taking down a VTOL. There goes that yeah. VTOL. <laughs> I think yep. it's one of the most yeah. interesting things that uh, you guys at 343 have done with the whole, the whole Spartan, the idea of a Spartan that now, yeah, you can become a Spartan. You don't have to yeah. be bred in a vat. You know, I, not that they were bred in vats, but you don't have to be like yeah. abducted as a kid and then become this weird sort of Master Chief level Spartan. It sort of gives you guys a lot more freedom to play with personality yeah. and to play with this dynamic of, uh, really the core conflict of Halo 5, this dynamic of sort of the future of the Spartan program and what we want it to be versus what it was, which is something you touched on in Halo 4, but is now back in a big way. Yeah, you get to really experience that a lot in the game because while we uh, do have the Spartan 4s, which are you know some of the best of the best from each branch of the military, um, we have the Spartan 2s in the blue team with Master Chief. So Master Chief has Linda, Fred, and Kelly from the extended fiction that'll be joining him, which is a great, uh, really exciting for our fans who, you know, they weren't sure if uh, Fred, Linda, and Kelly were uh, actually alive or not based uh -huh. on the fiction. 
but we brought them back and they're like chief surrogate brother and sisters from the Spartan 2 program that were abducted. So you get to see the contrast of the two teams as you play through the game. I like the contrast of soldiers who grew up independently and then joined the Spartan program, their names, versus these kids that we abducted and made Spartans. Fred, Linda, yeah. Yeah. Olympia Vale, like Holly yeah. Tanaka, like just that, I think that the, the contrast there is certainly something, uh, you know, you guys are sort of leaning into a little bit, which is cool. Yeah, awesome. Uh, all right, so we're, oh, here's a Phaeton in action, yes? Uh, yep, that is the Phaeton. Yep. And so now, this is a glimpse at Warzone. Like, make a little sense for me of, in terms of, well, I guess we're hopping between different stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, what's the goal for uh, someone who jump into multiplayer and say, I'm going to go hunting some Prometheans? What's the goal? Well, each team has the goal of getting to 1,000 points, and then your team's going to win by getting there. So you score points by killing players, uh, capturing and holding bases, and then most importantly, taking down these powerful AI bosses. Uh, so just a second ago, you saw a guy going after Baron Strom, yeah. who is a legendary boss in Warzone, uh -huh. and he flies a Banshee around. And uh, we get to see these fantastic combat situations where two teams of players are going after him at the same time because he's worth so much. And they're just trying yeah. to get that last shot in, right? That's right. Yeah, last and then are uh, key. we also have an alternate win condition in Warzone where if you capture all the bases, for example, you can see this player's in the armory and the garage is in front of him. Uh, if you capture them all, the enemy team's shields will go down and you can take out their core. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. there's... Kind of a lot going on, and that's definitely, you know, in terms of the objectives of Halo multiplayer historically, they've always been pretty clear, pretty focused in terms yeah. of you've either got just kill everything that moves or you've got achieve this little objective and also kill everything that moves. But now you guys are really sort of diversifying the battlefield. That's right. We wanted it to be open to all sorts of Halo players. Yeah. So if you're a campaign player, if you're an arena multiplayer player, if you love big team battle, if you love taking down AI, we just wanted everyone to have something to do in Warzone and let them play their way. Yeah, if you ran a bunch of Spartan Ops and that was your jam. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Here you go. You can take those AI killing skills <laughs> into the competitive forum. That's right. Super key to winning the match. One thing we did want to make sure, though, is that when you're playing through with all of this choice, uh, we spend a lot of time really working on how the objectives show up and are presented to the player. So you have a really clear idea of when a boss is coming into the battlefield and when your, your team is going to capture these bases. So while you can make a choice to play how you want to play, you always understand what you need to do on the battlefield where to the help your team win. Where the priority is, like where yeah. you can be the most effective. That's, yeah. right. that's always the peril, right? When you're designing something big with so many options, you yeah. don't want players to feel lost. That's exactly. right. And sometimes teams do have to make a decision, though. When it's coming down to the wire, it's like, do we go after that last legendary boss? Yeah. Do we hold down these bases, or do we try to go for their core? And the players that play Warzone a lot and are experiencing the depth, they're really getting to come to these awesome battle situations. Yeah. It seems like you guys have also probably had to put some serious work into your AI to like sort of make them function in this place that has these objectives and has multiple teams sort of battling it out. Is that true? Oh, absolutely, yeah. because we also have Marines. So uh, when, he, when you ever you capture one of the bases, like the garages or the armory or your home base, you have Marines on your team that are friendly and will support you. So with dozens of AI running, we really had to upgrade our technology and get everything on dedicated servers to deliver this. Yeah, we use does the that mean that yeah. I'm going to be coming into Warzone and killing Marines? <laughs> that's right, yes, for the first does. time. Oh, Enemy man. Yeah. Marines, yep. <laughs> oh, that's dark. That's Hopefully all right. one's on the enemy team. <laughs> yeah, that's true. An enemy is an enemy. And yeah, yeah you guys are certainly... Uh, breaking down the idea of what an enemy is, or, or just expanding it historically from what the enemy has been in Halo. Uh, yeah. Narratively, I feel like that's kind of a tricky business because you're taking this guy, Master Chief, he's like on a pedestal for most of the past decade plus, yeah. and really just kind of making it, well, hey man, you're not the, you're not the guy anymore. Well, so Chief still plays a central part in the story of Halo Absolutely, 5. Yeah. Uh, we're continuing on the saga of Halo 4, um, but we are introducing the new uh, Fireteam Osiris, so you do get to play uh, in the campaign as well as Spartan Locke. So there's a lot of uh, great story there. So, you know, Chief is still a, a really important part of the story. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. you got to have Chief. Yeah. Chief is Chief. That's yeah. right. uh, but we're looking at right now sort of something reminiscent of the beta you guys rolled out earlier this year. Yeah. Gave people a look at the new Spartan abilities and kind of how they work in combat. Yep. Then, of course, during the campaign demo, we saw those Spartan abilities in play. Uh, how's the development and tweaking and balancing been coming on those? Because it's taking Halo combat and adding some significantly different things in there. Yeah. So one of the, the best things about the beta is we got a ton of community and fan feedback. And so we took 
that feedback and we've been tuning all sorts of things to help improve the experience for when we launch. We've done things like change the way core movement speeds work. We kind of removed the top end of sprint because we felt that was a little too powerful. And then we increased base movement to kind of close that gap, but still providing a good tactical option there. Um, we saw that when people were using our new Smart Link aiming mode, uh, automatic weapons were too powerful uh, in the oh, beta. So we actually tuned that down a little bit to kind of balance out uh, Smart Link versus hip fire and uh, automatic weapons versus precision weapons. So we've been really using a lot of that feedback. Uh, so thank everyone very much. <laughs> thank you everyone uh, yeah. for providing that because it's been really helpful in dialing it in. Um, and of course we have our pro team at uh, 343 who consists of um, some of the best Halo pros uh, that have played the game and uh, they keep uh, giving us feedback day to day to help tune and refine this as we get closer to launch. All right, what's current currently? I know, I know this is gonna change for you guys week in, week out. What's your favorite new Spartan ability to use in combat? What do you like in these days? Oh, I'm gonna go with uh, sh shoulder bar shoulder charge. Yeah, yeah, shoulder charge for sure. The yeah. shoulder charge. Yeah, because you can get on Warzone. You there's some places you can go through, uh, new tunnels you can open up if you bash through them. And also when you're like running up on an enemy and you kind of coming around a corner and you hit him that hard, it yeah, oh, it feels amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I I love the Spartan charge, yeah. but I think my favorite is ground pound where you get to the elevated position, yeah. you kind of hang in the air, it's this risk versus reward oh. thing. But as soon as you contact someone, <laughs> you, you feel amazing, and everyone in the match goes, talks yeah. about it on the headsets and everything in playtest. The like, play oh. lab goes crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that's like the marquee play, <laughs> right? Because yeah. I remember, yeah. I tried that move a few more than a few times in the beta, and had some success, and when yep. I did it felt awesome, but also, Hung myself out to dry a few times. Yeah, more yeah. definitely put yourself. If you miss <laughs> and you hit the ground, you, you know it takes a little You're while like to worried. recover from it, and people can pelt you quite a bit. Yeah, so take advantage of that for yeah. sure. Yeah. But it's an awesome feeling when you pull off the ground pound. It absolutely yeah. is. Oh man! All right, I'm getting the Halo jitters. Uh, this game's coming out later this year. Are you guys planning a beta or anything else? A, a second round beta before the game comes out? We don't have a second round of beta, but we're still using all that feedback from the first beta. Okay. Um, so. There won't be an additional beta before we launch uh, this year. Yeah. Give me the launch date, man. Launch date is October 27th. October 27th. Yep. That's Halo 5 Guardians. Chris, Kevin, awesome. thank you guys thank so you. much for coming yeah, on the show so and talking yeah. about it. Yeah. Ooh, that's going to be a big one. It's going to be a big <laughs> fall this year for Microsoft. Awesome. All right, folks, going to take a quick break here from the stage at E3 to take a look at an update on a Ubisoft game recently announced from our friends at, that courtesy of our friends at MSI. MSI Computers. MSI, number one in gaming. Find out more at us.msi.com. All right, that was the Ubisoft press conference right here at E3 2015. Uh, let's start talking about what we saw right at the end. It looks like yeah. uh, Ghost mm. Recon's back for the first time in a long time since Advanced Warfighter yeah. 2 with yeah. uh, Ghost mm. Recon Wildlands. Wild. Well, we've had Ghost Recon, you know, on online. Yes, right. so it, 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 it lives. It yes. lives. Oh yeah, Future Soldier as well. It lives. Oh, we've had a few actually. My apologies. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about Wildlands? From it what we saw, it's fr just fresh off. So this bit looks there. just cozy. We were we were saying while we were watching, it looked a bit is far this cry. cry? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it had like a touch of Watch Dogs with the um, at, the, at the end, the very yeah. end. Yeah, you're saying quite quite mer it's almost like mercenaries co-op, uh, Kevin. You a little bit. Well. Yeah, yeah, it was very explodey. Yeah, in that sense. So uh, what we know so far, I guess, is that this is uh, an open world co-op game, but with specific missions as well. 
Yeah. Uh, this drug lab uh, set up here was what they sort of focused on. Um, Alexa, any thoughts on what we've seen here in terms of like what this might be in terms of a grander game? Because all they're showing here, I guess, is a bunch of dudes going in to shoot a bunch of other dudes. Like, how do you how, how do you think this looks differently to other yeah Ubisoft shooters? Ah, uh, I don't think it does. Like, I'm seeing <laughs> Far Cry. I'm seeing. Um, like some watchdoggy elements. I think it's sort of an amalgam of everything that they've been exploring with other with other franchises. I mean, that can work. That's super cool. When they got to this part, I started thinking it might have been Call of Juarez. Yeah, mm. no, there's a couple of people yeah. on Twitter saying the same thing as well. Huh? Uh, Lucy, what are your impressions of this? I think, first of all, got to celebrate the fact that this was a genuine surprise. Yeah, true. I yeah. mean, they've kept this really under wraps, and Ubisoft are not really known for uh, keeping their ship, their ship watertight. Um, so I'm kind of, yeah, I'm excited to see more of it. It was weird, though. I expected more of a fanfare. It is a new game, mm. um, but we just got this trailer. Um, so I'm excited about seeing it. I assume they're going to have at least this trailer or some representative on the booth to talk about it. Yeah. You'd hope so. Uh, um, but it looks cool. Um, uh, also, car doll moment. Yeah, car boom moment. Good point. Uh, that technology spread across all of uh, Ubisoft's various teams. Um, it's kind of an interesting take, I, I think. Kevin, I'm kind of... I like the fact that this is, I don't know, the, the co-op stuff in Far Cry 4 was good fun. The idea of expanding that out, almost like the crew, where you've got this mad open world, you can team up with a couple of buddies and, uh, and take on missions right. uh, all around the place. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited. What do you yeah, think? I mean, I think it's going to be super fun. I mean, I think the downside, of course, is that it does remind us of all of the other Ubisoft games. Yeah. I mean, we mm -hmm. looked at it and think, hey, it looks like, is this, could this be Far Cry? Mm -hmm. Maybe? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think that's the only the only real drawback. The the specific might have been a surprise, but what this game is, I don't think is actually a surprise at all. Yeah. Um, whether that doesn't mean it's not going to be awesome or fun, but I don't think that it makes for much of a surprise. Yeah, uh, it's crazy to think like how far removed this is from the original title of Ghost Recon as well. It's kind of uh, it's it's the things they've done with this uh, franchise uh, have been kind of all over the place. But uh, the head tattoo. Yeah, mm, the head tattoo. That, that might be my tattoo. next don't, tattoo. Just don't mess yeah, with people who've got crosses tattooed on their face. Mm -mm. I feel like that's something all of our mothers have told us at some stage or not. Uh, that's Ghost Recon Wildlands. Uh, that's all we know about it so far. Mm. Uh, that's our initial. And we literally saw it like three minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. fingers crossed there'll be more information about that, and we'll have it right here on Gamespot.com. Nintendo kicked off the morning of Tuesday at E3 with a press conference full of some familiar faces and some surprises. And now we've got a Nintendo game right here on stage, Super Mario Maker. Joining me, Ali Rapp from Nintendo Treehouse. Ali, welcome to the stage. Yay! Nintendo time! Yay. Uh, this is one of many Nintendo games you're going to be bringing by this yeah, time around because you be guys have a big lineup. Super BFFs. It's going to be exciting. Well, you're going to meet some of my friends, too. We have oh, a lineup right. of right. iconic hosts that our people <laughs> love to see year I after year. I need your year. autographs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we're kicking it off with Super Mario yeah. Maker. Mm -hmm. People getting to make their own Marios. Yes. Stages. Yes. Blocks. <laughs> make their own Marios. Wherever you want. That's for fan art. Yeah, it's like kind of fan, your own like fan art. Fan your art Marios. is yeah. like a bit kind of more and more a thing, especially yeah. with the Wii U. Yeah. Uh, Splatoon fan art is basically my favorite thing to look at Isn't on the internet great? now. It's magical. The Miiverse art? Yes. Yeah. It's All the super cool. Yeah. But in good. Mario Maker, you're creating a level. Yep. Art, playable art, if yes. you will. Uh, Everyone is a game designer. And so uh. we're going to take a look at some stages here. Yeah, we are. So what we're seeing is uh, actually the course world, which is the online portion of, uh, or one of the online portions of Super Mario Maker. Okay. And so with course world, what you can do is you can sort through all of the stages that people from around the world have created. So say, for example, that you want to play a really, really hard stage. You can sort by difficulty. Like I'm talking like Lost Levels Plus. Yeah. I want it to get real nasty. Real nasty. Yeah. <laughs> Does it? Do people nasty. make real mean stages? Uh, they do. Yeah. Some of those people are in Treehouse. Are you one of these people, I'm Allie? actually not. Okay. I'm really, really bad at making stages. <laughs> But, um, 
Yeah, some of them get really tough. And so you can sort by difficulty, you can sort by um, all kinds of things. Like you can follow friends uh -huh. um, so that you can kind of keep updated with when they're making stages so you can play their stages. Can you follow someone, like say you happen to download Kristen's stage and like, yeah. Damn, this Kristen is good. Like, yeah. you, you follow that person? For yeah, so like if you play a stage that you like, you can say, oh, I really want to follow this creator, even if, even if you don't know who it is. You nice. know, you just like, you like their stage, you want to see what else they do. Um, or I see that a lot of people are following this creator. Maybe I could check that out. Right, yeah, yep. Um, so you can sort by like, you know, popularity types of categories. Uh -huh. Like I said, difficulty, um, all kinds of stuff. So that's how you can find um, courses that are made better for you. I think kind of the easier stage. I'm not a very good platformer yeah, what's, compared to some What's some kind of a stage that appeals to you? Is it a, a certain strange design? Is it yeah. an aesthetic? Is it one where you jump around as Zelda, mm. or Link rather, being able to jump as high as he can? Don't look at me like that. <laughs> I mean, I deserve it. Yeah, I absolutely deserve it. It was a slip of the tongue. <laughs> so sorry. Never forgiving you. Um, has Link ever jumped so high me, in his little life? Has Link ever jumped? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm sure he's he rolled off he ledges. Does, yeah, yeah, he falls <laughs> gracefully. Um, my kind of stage is the folks who can get kind of like what I like to think of as like the Nintendo design way where it, everything is intuitive. Uh -huh. um, there's challenge there, so it makes you feel like I'm smart, even yeah. though the game is kind of walking you through these challenges. But that right mix of, you know, I'm doing something but I'm not crying while I'm doing it. Right, you're not trying, yeah. you don't have to do it 50 times to yeah. do it. But and there are gonna be stages because, you know, they're gonna be stuff created from everyone you know uh -huh. in your whole life. So there are gonna be stages that are gonna make you wanna cry. Yeah, this one is looking pretty tricky. Yeah, itself. Sarah's practiced it quite a bit, um, so she's rocking it. But, you, so you notice that you're playing as um, a Link character right now. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so the way that you do that is there's something called the mystery mushroom. And the mystery mushroom is this item that you can put into question blocks. Um, basically, you can put it wherever you can put a regular mushroom, right? Okay. And a mystery mushroom is this thing where when you pick it up, you basically wear like a costume. So you're like costume Mario. So you can be Link, you can be Wii Fit Trainer, you can be <laughs> Isabel. I love Wii Fit Trainer, keeps showing up. It's, I'm oh, so yeah, excited right, Wii Fit right. Trainer is a new like, member of the I stable. I don't know how that happened either, right? Like it just, it became an amiibo because there was Smash. Yep. But then people were like, I'm really digging like the weirdness of Wii Fit Trainer yeah. and it just kind of spiraled like, from there. There's this trainer next to a blooper. <laughs> sure, <laughs> that fits, that's good. So you can be Wii Fit Trainer. Um, and so how that works is we're not going to go into too much of the secret sauce okay. uh, quite yet because it comes out in September, so there's still a little bit of time. Um, but needless to say, if you have Amiibo, that's going to kind of expand ah, the, amiibo. the possibilities. Yes. Now, if you don't have all your Amiibo ever, you're still going to be able to use the mystery mushroom. Those things are, those things are hard to get get a handle on sometimes. I feel like I know a few people who have multiple copies of some, so they're, wow. they're hoarding it. Amiibo hoarders. I'm not going to tell you who because then everyone's going to swarm them. Do they them. refer to it as their retirement plan? <laughs> sometimes jokingly, yeah. But the Amiibo, you know, you're going to get some bonus stuff, as yeah. you guys do, but it's not going to lock the magic mushroom away by Correct. any stretch. Yeah, you're yeah. still going to be able to have fun with that. You're still going to be able to play some cool Mario costume characters. What the hell is going on here? Is it? This is one of my favorites. So The one that's just like a magic Koopa slumber party? Yeah, yeah. You get... <laughs> that's a good name like for a level. Sleeping. You can use that, They don't that, look Allie. like you're sleeping. Yeah, it's like <laughs> fan fiction. So <laughs> this stage has basically an infinite number of, uh, you know, the, the fire flowers. Uh -huh. um, but it has also seemingly an infinite number of enemies. So you have to keep going back, not being hit. Yeah, you got to run back to, to the through. bonfire flower, yeah. go kill enemies, make a little bit of progress, yeah. back to the bonfire yeah, flower. Yeah. This is the Dark Souls level of right, Mario right. Maker. So, you know, we're showing that there's all kinds of different things you can do. You can create short stages, you can create big stages, you can create stages with lots of enemies, you can create stages with no enemies but really hard jumps. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just all about, like, what kind of Mario stage you want to make. And sometimes, like, I'm, like I said, I'm really not good at mm -hmm. making. It's very I modest suck. of you to I, say. I yes. stink real bad. Okay. <laughs> I stink. You would have to go full self-deprecation. I stink real bad. <laughs> um, but so that actually is why I really am excited about the online stuff. Because at first I was like, oh, cool. Uh, I can create Mario stages. 
Oh, oh what do that I do? sounds. I guess I'll make some pipes. <laughs> There's got to be a ledge. I think maybe I can put something in there. I don't know. <laughs> um, and so this ability to like see what other people are making, to sort by maybe I'm really feeling. Uh, masochistic, and I'll try really hard stage one day. Give it a shot. Load it up. I right, got right. This. Or maybe I'm really feeling just like, I just want to take it easy. I just want to play some fun, easy levels. Uh -huh. um, just being able to see the creativity of other people is, is for me, going to be what's most exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, creativity also, now, when, you, when a creator sort of makes their stage, yeah. do they pick an aesthetic? Because mm. you've got Super Mario Brothers, yep. Super Mario 3, yep. Super Mario World, yep. new Super Mario Brothers. You, yep. And we're seeing it, or we will soon, um, on gameplay. So we're seeing the creation options. Look at that and little Mario. Do, Fly through the realm. If whoa! only life was that easy. And what you can do is you can change the type, the course type. So yeah. you can go from, you know, like you said, Super Mario Brothers, Super Mario Brothers 3, et cetera. And you can also change the course theme. And what the course theme, theme is, is uh, like you've got the ground level. You've got like a ghost house. You've got underwater. You've got a uh, castle. And you Lava can, world, ice world. Right, right. Yeah. And so you can only pick one course type per stage. So okay. you can't have like mixing generations, but you can mix themes. So you could, oh, for example, start okay. out underwater, go into a pipe or a door, and then end up like in a ground yes. part of the stage. Okay. Um, so you can mix themes. Nice. Yeah. All right. So we're just, this is a little stylist demo. Yeah. With very well manicured. Yeah, band very well model. manicured. Uh, the oh, you got to make a Goomba. Can she, I don't even know if she can hear me. I like when they float. Floating Kind Goombas. of helplessly. Have it's you like, seen this yet? I'm out of my element. I don't really. Yeah. I mean, I'll give it a shot, you yeah, guys. Yeah, but really, yeah. could you? Yeah. Maybe a gig maybe on land would be better. Oh, <laughs> and she also, um, Sarah, our game player, she's shaking the Koopa Troopas. Wait, you, she's doing this right now. She's doing this right now. Yeah, this is live gameplay. But that's not, whose hand is that? Do you get to pick the hand that you use? Do you guys have, <laughs> Sometimes you guys have you downloadable hands? <laughs> Sometimes you might notice that there's like a cat paw, yeah. which is my favorite part. Nice. Um, but so you can shake certain things, like for example, some enemies, um, some of the like items, and they'll change. So uh -huh. the Koopa Troopa becomes a red Koopa Troopa, which if you're familiar with kind of this very deep canon of Mario enemies, Absolutely. the red Koopa Troopas are a little bit more aggressive. They don't like fall off of ledges, etc. They follow you. Yeah. Um, and you can also shake items. So if we look at the palette when she pulls it up, um, there we go. So we see two lines right now. Yeah. You'll have those five filled in the full game, in the final in the final game. Um, the sixth one, the sixth bar is your custom bar. So you can like, if you want a bar of all green, you can have a bar of all green, so you can pull it up. I'm so a green man. You can even kind of customize your palette, which is yeah. good. Yeah. And, and go for the aesthetic you want, obviously. Yeah. Making funny shapes and. Making uh, funny. Oh, are we thinking of specific things. funny shapes? Well, there's a lot of funny shapes we in the world, about Allie. Butts before, butts before we started. Butts are a funny shape. Yeah, butts, funny shapes. Uh, <laughs> you guys can allow butt levels in Super Mario Maker. I within we'll reason. Have to see. <laughs> How general of a butt does it look? Yeah. yeah. Who's on butt watch for Mario Maker? Yeah, yeah, butt watch. Nintendo's got this all figured yeah, out. Yeah, the magicians. They? Fantastic. Yeah. Well, that's Super Mario Maker. Yeah. September? September. Fantastic. For the Wii U. On the 11th. Alley Rap, thank you so much for coming by, yeah, showing us off. Yeah, thanks for having us. Looking forward to more Nintendo awesomeness as E3 continues. Oh, snap. Yeah. Yay. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Coming up next, we're going to take, like, total 180 from Mario Maker and Nintendo. Danny O'Dwyer is going to come on, take off, kick off his segment with Hitman. It's going to be good. Stay tuned.
Hello and welcome back to GameSpot's continuing coverage of E3 2015 live from the West Hall right here in Los Angeles, California. I'm Daniel Dwyer taking over for Chris Waters for a little bit and I'm very happy to be joined by Hassan Ebrak. How are you doing, my friend? Hey. Pleasure, IO Interactive. Uh, it says it on the shirt, Hakan, you've got Hitman coming back. Tobias Reaper's <laughs> back. <laughs> I will never stop calling him Tobias Reaper. I don't care how long. Agent 47 is pretty cool, but Tobias Reaper has got a certain ring to it. Uh, yeah. The trailer is actually playing up here on the Sony booth behind yeah. us. Uh, yeah. Tell pretty us cool, about right? the impetus to, to get um, Hitman back. Absolution obviously did pretty well. Uh, what were you guys, what is it about Hitman that IO just love going back and, and creating new games about him? Right, I mean, uh, we've been doing Hitman for uh, 17 years now, right? So uh, all the experiences from the uh, earlier games in the series, um, you know, also from Blood Money and um, Absolution, uh, yeah. the last game we did. Um, it's kind of, you know, we just call this our new game Hitman because mm. it's just all the experience we've had in this game to make the best possible Hitman fantasy, right? Yeah. Um, we're trying something new, something bold, I'm very excited about it. Yeah, the delivery <laughs> method is interesting because you guys are launching almost like a base game in December of this year and then you're going to be adding to it right, like right. chapters. It, it kind of suits the form of a Hitman game actually because all the levels are always like just individual Yeah, I mean it, it's very hit driven, right? Yeah. Uh, this game is, you know, going back to its roots, classical Hitman experience with rich, uh, you know, high profile targets mm. and, you know, strong story about these targets and the subplots uh, around these targets. That's what, what this is about, right? And as you said, you know, the, uh, the, the experience is going to start the uh, December the eighth. From there on, we're gonna just uh, you know grow grow the uh, grow the world of assassination yeah. and uh, you know just deepen it and, and evolve from there, right? So you'll get uh, new locations, you'll get new missions, you'll get new hits, you'll get uh, live events. Uh, for example, imagine that all the Hitman players in the world will have 48 hours oh. for a live event where you have to take this target out, you know, and if the target target escapes. Gone. It's done, right? <laughs> one one try. One one hit, one shot, one kill, right? Awesome. And the way you kill the target, that's the way the, the target is killed, period. Cool. Let's talk about some of the footage uh, we're seeing here. I, it's all like an embassy or something. Look like an Irish flag on top. Uh, you're Irish, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, what are we looking at here? It, it looks. Uh, that sort of Hitman, there's always been a fashion, a sort of a very, like, almost European flair right. to Hitman. Uh, right. Tell us about what we're looking at here. Well, we, we, need, we, we love to go to different exotic locations, and this is one of many. This is Paris. Mm. Uh, we're here at a uh, fashion show. Um, there is this um, um, evil corporation covering this up as a fashion show, mm. but there's really more shady things going on yeah. underneath. There uh, always is. I always knew it. Yeah. <laughs> Fashion's a filthy this, industry. Exactly. Always like that, right? <laughs> so this, uh, this uh, target here is uh, Novikov, and, um, and you have to infiltrate, come in and understand, you know, so how, how can you take this guy uh, out, right? Mm -hmm. He's protected at all times. And this is also the, the core experience of Hitman, right? So um, we have reintroduced some of the things that our fans love. Yeah. You know, um, there is a loadout, very uh, advanced loadout. There is a stash point. So before you actually enter, yes. enter the, uh, the location, you can strategize and you can put, uh, you know, a sniper gun, a specific place where you can, when you come into the location, mm. enter the location, you can, you can, you know, pick it up later and use it for a uh, orchestrated uh, assassination, right? So uh, very deep sandbox. This is the biggest sandbox, you know, without checkpoints. This is the biggest oh, yeah? high-dense uh, sandboxes we've ever done. So we're looking at, compared to the biggest levels in, uh, in Absolution, we're looking at six, seven times bigger, mm. uh, and also bigger than the, the blood money levels we've done before. But this, this is it. This is the ultimate uh, assassin experience. Yeah, yeah, well, I guess you guys are, oh, the ultimate assassin experience. Yeah. I guess in many ways, uh, Hitman's been around for a long time and Assassin's Creed has tried to sort of usurp it. Uh, that uh, series not having the, mo the most popular time at the moment, so maybe you guys can oh, put you in. Know, um, I love the uh, assassin, uh, yeah. assassin series. So this is, this is the ultimate assassin experience, Hitman ex uh, uh, assassin with experience that we see, right? Yeah, and yeah. we are really confident and happy with what we have. Yeah. One of the difficult things to balance in a game like this is that in those early Hitman games, say one and two, uh, when you got caught, you really had to just try and hide and, and try and like attack from a different angle. Um, right. In some other games, and, and I guess when people change difficulty levels, there's uh, this temptation to try and shoot right. your way out of a problem. Oh, yeah. Uh, how, the temptation. How, how are you guys like, <laughs> dealing with that? Because we play with that. Yeah. Right, obviously, that's a part of it. Right? It's, a, 
freedom of choice, deep, uh, deep sandbox we're doing, it, it, it's even more now. And obviously, we want to tease you, mm. right? You, you have the option to go in and uh, do a brutal assassination and try to get away with that, you know, guns blazing and everything. Yeah. You can also orchestrate this, uh, you know, uh, this, this was the brutal one you saw there, right? And here you have a, a more, uh, you know, <laughs> More uh, ele elegant, uh, elegant yeah. uh, assassination there, right? With poison uh, and whatnot. So um, of course we do that. We do plays, you know, a security room shotguns lying there mm. with some shells, and we, you know that when the player comes there, it's like, ah, I would really like to, right? So we we do uh, we do play with the temptation. Yeah. But it's really, you know, all the opportunities are there. It's up to you how you want to play it. Mm. You know, silent assassin, sneak around, and make these very elegant assassinations, or just guns blazing is up to you. Yeah, one of the um, uh, great things about the, uh, the Hitman franchise is being able to go back and replay levels. I always loved right. the first time seeing a level because I kind of felt like I was scoping it out or I was like doing a bit of reconnaissance and then on my yeah. fifth or sixth attempt, I'd actually, I'd nail it. I'd get in without anyone seeing exactly. me, I'd get the target and I'd get out as quick yeah. as possible. Yeah. And hopefully no one finds any sleeping guards. Yeah. Um, are you guys taking that s similar approach? Do you, do you kind of, do you know that when people play the game that they're going to go into each level kind of blind and that they'll they'll learn as they pick through it? Totally. I mean, this is a very non-linear game, right? Yeah. Uh, coming in there, there's so many options, uh, so many directions to take, so many rooms, so many NPCs with different purposes. Uh, so obviously, that's, that's very, very important. Mm. Walk around, try to understand what this uh, target is doing and this NPCs are doing and how can I use them uh, to get close to the target, yeah. right? Um, as I said before, the, the, the systemic part is a lot deeper. I mean, you can, you know, there's a frisking zone. You can, as an example, there's a frisking zone. You can't get into the area, right? Yeah. But uh, you could just uh, throw your gun on the street and just, you know, go back back a bit and hide a bit. And you'll see the police will come and look at it. Really? There's a gun here, right? <laughs> They'll pick it up and they will look around and then they will secure the gun, obviously. So they will take that with them into the building, into a, a oh, se wow. secure room, and, and hide it there. And then you can get through this uh, frisking, uh, frisking zone, right? Yeah. And uh, you know you don't have any guns on you. Find a way to get into the room, get your gun, and you know take the target out uh, that way. So there are all these systems going on, and it's really, really fun to mm. uh, to play around with. Um, that. Obviously, you're taking this sort of chaptered approach to it, uh, but we hear that Diana Byrne was returning. Um, in this game as well. Um, I guess my first question is, is this a sequel to Absolution? Because, no spoilers for anyone who's played that. Um, or, and also, how much does story play in a game that you're going to be releasing over the course of you know, a year or so? Yeah, so this, uh, this, uh, the story here is after, uh, after Absolution. But, uh, but really, I mean, Agent 47 is uh, timeless, right? Uh, mm. So, um, Absolution was very uh, story-driven, yeah. whereas Hitman is very hit-driven. So it's uh, it's really back to the core experience, back to the roots. Mm. So um, the the really important part is the the hits. They're really really rich, and the stories around uh, around them and the locations are really really rich. But there's an overarching story that connects these uh, yeah. these hits and drives the story, right? And that story will be concluded during uh, 2016. It's exciting. I like the idea of uh, us getting to play Hitman over the, the course of a year. Yeah. Uh, I have to ask you, does Ave Maria turn up at any stage during it the game? Might. It might. It might. <laughs> it will. <laughs> uh, I've got a couple of more questions here. Obviously, this is based on the, uh, the uh, Glacier 2 engine, which is what you guys use for Absolution. Yep. Um, did you find porting that onto next generation console or like sort of scrubbing it up, keeping up with the technology? Uh, did it allow you to, to scale up in the right way? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, technology is a part of our DNA. We've been doing that from, from day one. Yeah, so Hitman it's very 1's. Exactly. Uh, like, I remember walking in and out of like flags and watching the, the stuff move. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so this is the next generation of, uh, of Glacier uh, that supports Hitman and, uh, uh, you know, just to just to give an idea what we're capable of, you are, we have the graphical fidelity from from Absolution and the big uh, sandboxes from uh, from Blood Money. We took that to another level, right? Yeah. And uh, so uh, also going digital, uh, adding yes. uh, content later, being able to adjust uh, features, uh, mechanics, uh, content together with the community and the gamers mm. with their input. I mean, all that is enabled by the new functionalities and the higher fidelity engine we have today. Yeah, so December 8th is when it's uh, coming out. Is that going to be on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC as well? And the PC as well, yeah. yeah. So the experience is going to start in, uh, on December the 8th, 
and just going to continue and evolve through, uh, throughout 2016. Is that going to be a full price game at that stage? Uh, and, then, and then they'll keep adding on to it as well? Exactly. It's not like some but, but early access situation where you're... I mean, it's not an early access. Everything that, c that comes out from uh, IO Interactive, it's very important to say this. This is its final quality, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's finished game. So everything we release is going to be finished uh, and high quality, obviously. Um, th that experience is just going to evolve, right? Mm. So the last location of missions right now will be will be shaped by what we learn and you know from how the game is going to play this game, and that's yeah. a huge opportunity for us, right? So now we don't just you know put the baby in a box <laughs> and uh, that's it, right? We actually have an opportunity to tune the experience and make it better for the gamers. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you can say um, now how much, but are you guys committing to like a roadmap for that year? Is there like, by the time the game comes out, will you be saying there will be, you know, six or eight or three or? There'll be lots more uh, information yeah. about that when we come closer to the uh, December the 8th, right? But it's very important to say, this is uh, everything here, all this experience we get for 60 bucks. There will yeah. be no hidden costs, no microtransactions or anything. Mm. For 60 bucks, you get the whole experience starting from December the 8th, throughout 2016. And a little bit something extra for PlayStation 4 users as well. Tell us about that. Yeah, so uh, so we have a beta coming up. Uh, we'll come with more details uh, with that. So also a great opportunity to uh, get feedback before uh, before the launch of the uh, of the mm. game, right? Um, so really excited about that and looking forward to that. Really happy with the collaboration with, uh, with Sony on that. Yeah. Also, there will be exclusive uh, contracts, you know, with story and some, some special hits uh, around that for Excellent. For, for the Sony platform. So are they are they exclusive contracts uh, within levels that already exist in the game, or will they be like new levels? Well, that that would be uh, that would be a combination, but uh, mm. but yeah, they, they will they will be a part of the huge locations that uh, they will be re releasing, right? Cool. And that's a big part of the game, right? That's the globe trotting uh, fantasy, yeah. traveling around the world and visiting fashionable Paris, the uh, Marrakesh, and, and uh, then the sunny, sunny, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <well. laughs> uh, are you guys at all working with? the movie guys, because this is like the second Hitman movie. Like when the first one came out and Timothy Oliphant was, was right. playing uh, Agent 47, it, it almost seemed like just a, a really, uh, I don't know, it felt like a PC, like everyone loved that game and nurtured it. It never felt like a massive blockbuster. It grew into a massive blockbuster. Yeah. But it seemed so incredibly odd that there was a movie. It must have been successful because there's another movie. Yeah, Are yeah. you guys working with them at all? On I mean, obviously we have uh, had some collaborations with them, like creative, you know, you know, telling them about uh, the universe and Agent 47, mm. right? But, you know, we are game makers, we are not movie makers, so, yeah. uh, but we're really happy with the guys and doing a great job. And we're also really looking forward to, uh, to watch the movie when it comes yeah. out. <laughs> I'm sure they'll send you a, a, a DVD. Well, or well, something. Maybe, we'll maybe, maybe not a DVD, maybe something higher DVD resolution. DVD is so less. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 480p stream. Um, uh, so you've had obviously had a massive showing here at E3. Uh, last question. When are you guys going to be dropping details about the rest of this game? Because we haven't really seen anything in terms of like actual full gameplay. Are you guys going to be showing stuff at Gamescom? When are we going to actually see the new Hitman in action? There will be more uh, information soon, uh, and Gamescom is most likely will be mm. there as well. That that's that's what I can say right now. Awesome. But there will be more information uh, and also about the beta uh, up to December the eighth. Cool. Hakan from IO Interactive, thank, thank you, so you so much, much. for your Great. time. Really cool. appreciate it. Uh, very much looking forward to seeing more of, uh, of uh, Agent 47. Uh, we'll be back on the GameSpot stage in just a minute's time. Bunch of cool stuff coming up. Uh, Nick Yu is coming on to talk about Mighty Number no. 9. Tony Hawk's going to be on the stage later. But uh, our boys from the UK, Jamie Jackson's on next to talk about Guitar Hero Live. Stick around, we'll be back in a minute.
Sinister and one Hello, job. welcome back to GameSpot's continuing coverage <laughs> of E3 2015. We're here on the live show floor. Oh my goodness, Jamie Jackson from Freestyle Games just turned up. Hey man. And Matt Shadows just, Avenged Sevenfold so just buddy, turns up as well. Just thank you. Out, man. Thank you for, I had no idea you were coming. What a pleasant surprise. Uh, yeah, well, it's, such uh, as it's the, good to be here. Uh, yeah, such as the madness of, of E3. Yeah. Uh, and of course, Ben's here with your, with your fancy new ass plastic controller situation. Uh, you are no stranger to making new controllers. Obviously, you guys based in Lemmy and Spa did DJ Hero 1 and 2. Uh, what was it like tackling the guitar? Uh, it was interesting, man. I mean, you know, when we started to think about it, we were like, you know, it's, it's going to be five years by, by the time we come back. Yeah. When, when, when we come back, and, you know, Guitar Hero will have been gone. And we were thinking, look, we've got to come back with something new. Like, if we just bring the same gameplay, everyone that's an expert player or whatever is going to mm. get straight at it. Everyone that only ever hit medium is going to straight hit medium. And we were yeah. like, look, we've got to give you a new challenge. So we started to think about how could we do it. And we tried loads of different configurations with the buttons and things like that. But what we figured, and, and, and some people say to me, what is it about you guys and three buttons with the DJ here and everything? <laughs> but, you know, the six buttons. And, um, but we were like, you know what? So many people only use three fingers when they yeah. play the game. Like, as soon as they have to use the pinky, and I was one of Just them. freak out. Yeah, yeah freak yeah. out. Couldn't do it. May as well chop it off. It's useless to me, <laughs> right? And, um, you must think those people are just massive pieces of shit. So they can't even use like all their fingers. <laughs> I, I so, don't judge anyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we we were like, right, we need to make something that is going to kind of play into people's play patterns. You know, yeah. where they got where people are just using their three fingers. But how can we add depth to it? And that's really where the idea came from. Is kind of bringing that second row of buttons in above mm. the top. You know, we only bring it in on a slightly more difficult level, and it, and it allows us to kind of add difficulty, but people don't get out of their comfort zone by yeah. having to use their pinky. So that was kind of one of the first drivers. And then really it was like, we started to go, you know, what, what makes people feel like a rock star? And it was always the guitar. You yeah. know, everyone was like, the, the motion of putting it on. And we said, you know, what is that? And ev everyone kind of does this like air guitar. Like, can you do this? It's like the universal sign of it. And this bit we got pretty <laughs> right. Yeah. But then we started to look, well, people do this with their fingers. Yeah. And it, they were kind of going up and down the strings kind of thing. So that helped us kind of drove us down that route to kind of make this mm. hand do something a little bit different. Excellent. Uh, Matt, did you play these games at all uh, during the whole like progression of the series? Uh, yeah, I did, them? yeah. I played them and I enjoyed, you know, the more technical stuff when Dream Theater had some songs and yeah, then yeah. it got more progressive and metal. I, I enjoyed that because it was, it was, you know, quick fingers and people that can really play the game, it was really impressive to me. Yeah. Because yeah, it's a completely different thing than... Uh, yeah, the, 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 when you go and play your songs, does it ever feel any way approximating what you're actually doing? Uh, with your real guitar, is it like? Is, are there ever moments where you're like, ah, oh, that's kind of there? Well, you know, Sinister would be the one to ask, but I, since I do play guitar, there, I mean, it's close. It's yeah. really close, especially with the way that the six buttons is set up. Mm. It's more of a chord, I mean, a chord progression, right? You can do chords. You would do chords down there. You can do multiple buttons instead mm. of going all over the place, because that would be like playing a solo at all times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is more like playing a real guitar, so it gets even closer with with this controller. Uh, speaking of solo, does all the hammer-ons still work? Is yeah. that still okay? Still got all that in. I mean. If you see anything come up there with a little glow around the base of it, that's uh, that's what that is. So for those who are watching now, the, the white ones are the ones on the bottom. You guys sort of telegraph that by having them pointing down as well. Yeah, we uh, thought we would try and make it as easy as possible. So those pointing down and white, that's bottom row. Pointing up, black, top row. And then where you see the half and half squares, you might yes. have just saw that. That's both buttons. Cool. Uh, one of the other things that's happened with you guys sort of reinventing this guitar is that I guess when the Guitar Hero franchise continued and you guys kept like adding instruments and whatnot, the guitar stayed the same for the most part. There were some mechanical differences. Um, so when a new Guitar Hero came out, I was like, oh yeah, I know how to use this. You know, I'm a fan of video games. I can't play a normal guitar for shit, but I, can, I know how to play this. It's familiar. A kind of interesting thing you've done is you've set reset the playing field. So even people who are big Guitar Hero fans are going to have to have that like eureka moment where their hand does what they want it to all over again. Yeah, and, and what's interesting is it's still familiar, right? You know, we, we were playing it earlier, and, and you know, as Matt said, these guys have played the game before. It didn't mm. take long for everyone to get back into it and, it, and and it doesn't take long, especially like our expert players. One of the things we find our expert players who do use the pinky and run down, they kind of have ghost pinky. Yeah, they keep yeah. trying to do this <laughs> for a little while. Um, but it, we found it takes like maybe two songs, and the, the kind of familiarity of what you're doing kicks in, but then you're into the challenge, and it's like I'm learning something new. I've, uh, the mm. game is challenging me on a different level, which is, it, you know, I think you got to do that with a new game. Well, people, people don't want the same thing. There's no point in relaunching the series if you're going to do the same thing. Yeah. It's like when Nintendo moved on and you got the Xboxes, the controllers change mm. and they progress and it just gets better, but you get used to it after 
you know, a couple yeah. of minutes. You know, you, you gotta keep. To. Yeah, you gotta. It's like you gotta keep up with the times, but then once you're in yeah, there, it becomes second nature again. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I want to ask you in a second, Matt, about the Guitar Hero TV stuff. Uh, but first of all, since we have this uh, footage up in front of us here, uh, just speak a little bit about the FMV situation. I, I saw you, I, some of your guys came to our studio a couple of weeks back and I was playing, I think it was an elbow song and it was like straight up green screen in the background still. Yeah. Um, talk about the process of making that because there's there's sort of two different levels to each um, FMV or yeah, full motion video crowd you have here. I love that you call it FMV. I know <laughs> even, you know, FMV since I was a little kid is always like that awesome part of the video game that looked yeah. rad and I'm like, 3DO. Oh, yeah. I kind of suppose it is a little bit. Um, so basically, you know, what we wanted to do, we wanted to, we wanted to put you on stage, looking at the crowd, and, and kind of make you the rock star, uh, mm. and and you know, so you can see what it's like, yeah. you know, being Matt and whatnot. And, is there and a mini game where you have to come and talk about the game on an E3 uh, stage show? So that's a great idea. Yeah, stick it in. We're gonna do that. Um, so you know, the first thing was let's turn the camera around, let's make you perform to a crowd. You know, we had a code word when we were making it, which was stage fright. We wanted to give you stage fright. Yeah. So then early on with them said, well look, you know, why don't we do it a little bit differently than you know, just inside a game engine, let's film real people and then let's try and figure out a way for them to react to you. So um, the way we filmed this was we used a Mocon rig camera, mm. uh, which is like a giant robot with a camera on the end of it, uh, much like a robot that you would see building cars on a production mm. line. Um, it's a motion motion control rig, is it? It's, it, it's yeah. well, it, it's run by motion, yes, but it's not like motion control in the sense like you do motion capture. But yeah, motion control, um, it does the same thing every mm. single time, and I, you know you don't have to feed it; it doesn't get tired. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like all these cameramen that will do eventually, it doesn't do that. So it allowed us basically to film, you know, the positive pass and, and then the negative pass, which means you know if Ben finally decides to try and screw up for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, he'll change like it did there, and the frame it changes is going to be exactly the same. The only difference is, is the, you know, the bands and the crowd's reaction mm. to you is going to change. Um, and we filmed it, uh, we actually had only about 200 people in our crowd, you know, yeah. which is the one you saw with the green screen was still, we hadn't finished that one yet. And we would basically take those people and then we would move them back. Just copy paste. Yeah, essentially we <laughs> copy and pasted, but we did real life copy and paste. So we'd move them all back do it again, do it again, and all of a sudden those 200 people, they're like 400 people, yeah, they're yeah. 800 people, and we'd move them around, and all the tall ones we'd put in different places so you couldn't tell. And, and what I like is that you don't just have massive amphitheaters, you've also got kind of like shitty dive bars, which presumably is when you're starting off in a band, you gotta, you got to make your way up as well. got to make yeah, your way up. Well, well I mean, we, yeah, we're, we're in uh, festivals and stuff like that, and then, I mean, we use the dive bar in a slightly different way. We want to have it as a, like, you know, imagine this band goes and does a gig for its like 100 biggest fans and yeah. stuff like that. So we wanted to make it feel a bit more kind of exclusive. So talk a bit about the, the sort of the wider world of Guitar Hero. Obviously you couldn't do this for every single song that you were going to release and digital downloads is a massive part of any of these types of games. They've almost become like services. Um, so talk a little bit about that, the expanded one. So the other part of the game, you know, GHTV is what we're talking about a lot this E3. And, you know, I guess the way, easiest way to think about it is if you go back five years and, um, and you think about, you know, how many people were connected with their consoles, it was a relatively low number. It's something like less than 40%. Really? And then, like, you fast forward to today, um, I think it's upwards of 80% across all consoles were connected, which is a completely different landscape, And right? people have just gotten used to buying shit on the internet. Well, that's the thing, like, you know, think about how many of us have all got Netflix accounts and things like that, and, and you know, we don't own that content, but we just use it when we want to use it. Yeah. And we, we, as consumers, we've become these people that, when I want something, I just want it when I want it, and, and I, I'll go get it because mm -hmm. I am connected. So TV was about building a, a game that spoke to that, and, and, we were, and we were able to give our fans, and fans of the bands, content and music quickly as possible without having to wait and do another disc you know we can constantly update it so TV you know it, it's it's, it's going to be several channels that are always going to be broadcasting when you jump into it you're going to uh, you're going to uh, jump into whatever channels on and you're going to jump into whatever shows on and you can just play and you yeah. just play along and it'll be multiplayer and you can play against your friends you'll be match made against people you can plug another guitar and you can play and then there are going to be other on-demand shows with some really cool content and you know, I'll, I'll let Matt talk about that because we're, we're doing something with Avenge that's really rad and it's going to be out at launch and yeah, it's, we're excited. Yeah, so I mean at launch uh, we wanted to be a part of this game and uh, one thing that was intriguing to us was to release something that's never been released instead of, uh, you know, a song that 
you know, kids go online, they make their own versions yeah. of these, and it's cool to give them something that they've never had. So we have a bunch of live shows from the last few years. Um, we have playing at Donington and, you know, Download Festival. We have Mexico City. We have all these huge shows we recorded. We thought it'd be cool to insert what we do mm. into the game and do some live tracks that no one has yet. And if you order the game, you know, pre-order the game, then you get those tracks. So it's the only way to get them is to get the game early. Yeah. And you get three events, seven full tracks. And we're going to do a lot of other stuff with our artwork and with, with the band in general. But that's how we're going to start it off. Mm. And so that's what we're excited about is to give people content that they've never seen. Yeah. Obviously, that's really cool for uh, Avenged Sevenfold fans to be able to get access to that stuff and play with it. Um, Matt, you've obviously been, been doing this for a long time, and earlier today I was talking to Tony Hawk, and um, we were, were doing this sort of documentary about the, the impact that his franchise has had on video games. And one of the things we talked about was how those games, they, they sold different types of music to people. Like, I remember listening to bands in Tony Hawk 1, 2, and 3 that I'd never heard of, and there are yeah. bands that I, like, listen to. Like, the reason I'm wearing Vans shoes is probably because I played a bunch of Tony Hawk. Yeah. When you get involved in these games, do you ever feel like you're, uh, apart from, you know, getting stuff out there for your fans, do you feel like you're scooping up new fan bases and getting into places you didn't Absolutely. weren't there you know, we did a poll on our website recently and asked people where they heard of us. And it, it went everywhere from Madden 2004 <laughs> all the way to Guitar Hero and then hey. Black Ops in between. Um, so for us, you know, you look at the fan base and there's so many people that were introduced to us yeah. through either Beast in the Harlot or Chapter 4 on Madden 2004 or Backcountry or Need for Speed, these games. And that's what people, they hear the stuff, they never heard it before, they're being yeah. exposed to it the same way radio used to do it, yeah, which totally. doesn't have the power anymore. And so being a gamer, it makes sense for us because I play so many games that yeah. I want to hear our stuff in it anyways, you know, so I'm a fan of it in the first place. So, but it's also, yeah, I mean, the audience is huge and it helps the bands, you know, as much or more than it helps the actual makers of the game. So it's it's a good uh, relationship. Cool. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you very much for coming in. Jamie, pleasure Thank to meet you. you. Thank you, man. Ben, great job. Yeah, go on. Fuck it. Uh, Guitar Hero uh, Live, when will people be able to play it and what platforms? Uh, well, you're going to be able to come and play it on the show floor now, so if you're around, come well, and check it out. What if you're on the internet and you're not anywhere near LA? If you're not anywhere near LA, then you're going to have to wait until October 20th in the US. All right, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Uh, gentlemen, thank you all so much for coming thank on. You, Enjoy the rest of your E3. Uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, appreciate especially it, you. Nice thank work. You. <laughs> I know there was a little bit of a delay there. You did a good job. Yeah. Uh, we got a bunch more stuff uh, coming up today. Uh, Infinity is going to be on later on showing off his brand new game on Microsoft. But uh, first of all, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes with Mighty Number no. 9. Stay tuned. Awesome. Thanks, Jens. Thank that was you.
Hey, what's up? Welcome back to GameSpot stage right here at E3 2015. I'm delighted to be joined by Mr. Nick Yu, producer over Thank Concept. You. How you doing, my friend? Uh, we're here to talk about one of those Kickstarter games. I don't know if you heard of Kickstarter. Apparently <laughs> now you can just put what one is on that? a conference. What is that? Yeah, you can just put it on a conference now and it'll <laughs> earn $2 million <laughs> uh, it, it pretty quickly. Um, that was amazing. It still hasn't caught up with Mighty Number no. 9, though. You guys... Uh, it was 3.8 or something? 3.8 on Kickstarter alone, and then on PayPal, we had about $20,000. So overall, $4 million at the very end. <laughs> they just knocked it over the edge. I liked it. That was pretty cool. Um, and what's cool about uh, your game is that it's really proof of concept for when Kickstarter works is that we're going to see it in September. So yes. you guys have turned it around in, in two years. Two years, a little bit less than two years, mm. but um, we really worked hard on it. Yeah. We really did. Um, we got some uh, uh, gameplay we're going to get to in a, in a little while. Uh, for those who don't know anything, I'm sure that there's not many people who don't. Um, obviously, um, the, the lineage with Mega Man and KJ Nifune. Uh, just l give us a sort of a backstory as to how this game came about. So, you know, Inafune has been making action games for almost his entire, entire career. Mm. And that's like, what, uh, a little bit less than 30 years now. Wow. So you know he's always been a you know huge fan of the action games and he likes to make them, and I'm pretty sure you know 2D side score games always you know in the back of his head. Mm. And uh, when our agent uh, brought up this idea of you know starting a Kickstarter, this is the first place he wanted to do. Like mm. you know let's do uh, 2D side score games, and then we'll gather from there. Uh, we'll see who should we you know asking this game to uh, be made mm. from. And uh, immediately, uh, he saw you know, Integrates. Yeah. They have been making you know, 2D side score games for a bit, their own whole life. And we also you know, talked with uh, Tom Fon and Matsumai san if you know, guys, you know those people. Mm. They are actually the, uh, the original Mega Man team oh, really? with Inafune himself. So the original team coming back together to make this game. Excellent. Uh, we're sort of used to Kickstarter um, here in the West. Uh, in, was this a game that was being sold from Japan to like the Western audience, or is Kickstarter a known quantity in Japan? Well, uh, not too many people know Kickstarter, the, the brand of Kickstarter in Japan, but I think uh, once we got our project funded, uh, we had some media, uh, media coverage on Yahoo or you know, those websites. So now people are kind of know about Kickstarter, and also they have uh, their own you know, crowdfunding hmm. system in Japan as well. So I think uh, more people kind of know this thing about Kickstarter. And uh, I think, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, uh, uh, a project just ended their Kickstarter. It's called uh, Bloodstained by uh, yeah. Koji Garashi. So, you know, <laughs> more people, more Japanese devs are trying, I think, looking into Kickstarter now. Uh -oh. For sure, and uh, we, we, uh, we saw a lot the more of it on Sony's fine. stage, of course, as we it's talked about control. earlier. That one, yes, I know. that's huge. I've, I think we, have, we bought, I've, I've, I've dropped $29 on that. Have you, you done know, it yet? <laughs> before I came to E3, I just backed Bloodstained. <laughs> I just bucked that one, and now shaming comes around. I was like, yeah. come on. You have to wait for years to get all these games. Uh, but we won't have to wait that long to play Mighty Number no. 9. It's in September, uh, and we're looking at it in action right now. So guys, talk us through exactly what we're seeing so on stage. So right now, I think Will Powers uh, playing backstage. This is the intro stage of the game. It's basically the tutorial stage, and uh, it should be the easiest stage to go through. This, in this stage, you'll learn the basic controls and uh, the, you know, the basic you know, game flow of the game. And the, I think the core, or well, the base of the game is, we added this feature called the Absorption Dash. Mm. Basically, you shoot enemies uh, a couple times, and then they will change color. And that's when they're kind of stunned. So when that happens, you want to you know, use your dash, dash towards them, absorb their powers. And then that's the easiest way to defeat enemies. Mm. But also, at the same time, it'll, you, you, the players will kind of risking getting hit in cross range. So there's all that, that you know, risk uh, versus you know, reward kind of thing. So if you want you know, to get higher scores, you want to absorb them as soon as possible. Yeah. So now you see you know, the numbers popping up on the enemy's head, you know, 100%, 90%. That's, you know, how, that's showing like, how fast you absorb that enemy. Mm. So if you want, you can actually chain all the enemies at 100% throughout the whole stage. <laughs> and by the end, you get like 100% absorption rate. <laughs> And you know, I, I'm pretty sure the hardcore fans will you know compete with that. Yeah, and Infinite's games have never been well. They've sort of been scalable, like in, uh, easy to pick up and play, but that's very, exactly very difficult. what we're aiming yeah. for. So, do do you expect that the 
the, the, the super hardcore players will have that level of difficulty to sort of aspire to? They, they will meet their challenges, for yeah. sure. I mean, this is only the normal uh, difficulty level. We also have hard and hyper, <laughs> which is even harder. And then we just added this new level, uh, difficulty level. It's called Maniac. <laughs> what it does is, basically, you'll die with one shot. Oh, man. Any kind of damage will kill you right there. F is, there f is there fall damage, or is he OK on fall damage? Any kind of damage, <laughs> any damage you'll receive, you'll die. Somebody looks at you <laughs> wrong and you die. And there it is, the yeah. uh, willpower is just died by the spikes. <laughs> I'm lucky, you, you, you never beat the spikes. <laughs> um, what, 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 how big are we talking in terms of the game? How many different sort of areas, how many different aesthetics? So we have uh, in total of 12 stages and eight bosses for the first uh, eight stages. And then after you get that through, you get into a different type of stages, and you actually get one different uh, playable character. Oh, cool. The call, the kind of heroine of the game. And her uh, gameplay is totally different from what we're seeing with Bex, the gameplay. Like, is this some sort of robot cash situation? Yes. And um, if you look at the, uh, the life bar of the mm. boss, the life bar isn't actually decreasing. And you saw that there. Mm. With bosses, you actually have to absorb them live to actually defeat them. Oh, wow. So once the bo boss changes color, you actually have to absorb, dash towards them, absorb their powers. Oh, wow. If you don't do it fast enough, they will actually heal that amount of damage oh, you no. gave to them and become, you know, heal again. So for every boss, you have to do that. I know it kind of sounds, you know, crazy and mm. you know, a lot of work to do, but once you start doing it, you will really see uh, the, why we put it in there, because we want players to take the risk to get in close range with the boss yeah. and absorb their powers. So you actually have to time yourself, see the distance between yourself and the boss. So it's all about you know, getting close and you know, personal with the boss. Yeah. And presumably, with, with, with Inafune's uh, previous titles, uh, variety in boss fights and sort of uh, as you unlock ab abilities and skills, right. uh, bringing those into the, the fray. Uh, is that very much the same in Mighty Number no. 9? Yes. Um, basically, you will gain the boss's ability once you beat them. Mm. And uh, you, know, you can use them against different bosses, as well as, well as you can use them in throughout the stage. Some of the stages actually require you to use some of the abilities to you know, solve the puzzles. So you know, you're not using the abilities against the boss, and you're using that in the stage as well. Uh, what was it like working with the Kickstarter backers? Because I, I remember I was keeping an eye on the project um, over the past two years, and there were often times where you guys were even setting up votes on what character right. models should be in yes. uh, should be in the game. Uh, what was that process like? How involved were the backers in, in the creation? So of you know, Inehune, he has been saying that he wants to make you know the kind of games with back or not backers but fans together. Yes. And this is it's pretty much what you know that dream came true. So we had um, throughout the whole Kickstarter campaign, we made updates on what's going on with the project every day. Mm. And after the campaign, every day, every day <laughs> it was brutal. What, been, what happens if it was like the day before you guys were just out on the town, had a couple of beers, and you just didn't want to do anything that day? Nobody was dr <laughs> drinking a single drop of alcohol <laughs> throughout the whole campaign. <laughs> you know, it's kind of Your launch party is going to be no. Fun. Now you kind of bring it back to uh, the nightmare, so to say, <laughs> or my nightmare, because I have to work from you know, 10 o'clock until, say, 8 or 9 yeah. at night and go home have some dinner and, you know, get myself a shower, have about maybe two hours of sleep, <laughs> oh my God. and then wake up around 12 o'clock at yeah. midnight, starting working with, you know, the states. Oh, really? Because it's different, two different time zones. Yes. We ha I have to check all the updates that we're putting up the next day. I have to actually translate all this stuff. Do you go back to bed then and then wake up again? Yeah. Oh, my God. So I, my work will end around, you know, 3 or 4 a.m. I sleep or for, you know, three hours, four <laughs> hours wake up, drug myself to the office, and starting checking things and you know, organizing these and stuff. I, I did that for the whole month. I guess that's what it takes to get a Kickstarter game out in under two years. <laughs> it's somebody like you who they're, who's willing to, to get up at night time. Now I'm, we are teaming up with you know, Deep Silver, yes. which is located in Germany. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's even worse. Now we're Do you speak German as well? No, I don't. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't. No, now I'm kind of working, you know, with three time different time yeah, zones. Yeah, yeah. Before uh, my you know my flight to E3, 
I was working, you know, before, you know, before E3, it's yeah. always chaotic. Totally. Before e E3, I was, the Thursday, I was working until 10.30 uh, in yeah. the office. <laughs> Got back home around 11.30, dinner, shower, and then I started packing my bag yeah. for E3. And then around 3, oh, sorry, 4 a.m., we started recording for the DLC of oh, my really? number nine. Oh, fun. That was... That was five hours of work. Great. I had to go through uh, on Skype. And then I, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I recorded, I, I stayed uh, stay in the recording for five hours. I was like dead by the end. Nick, you, you look surprisingly fresh for somebody who's just done all that work. Thank you so much for coming on our stage and showing off Mighty Number no. 9. Uh, Thank it's you. out in September. Uh, what date and on what platforms? So, platform, I'll give you the short version, everything. <laughs> and date, I was hoping you'd say them all. <laughs> the date uh, for Mighty Number no. 9 is uh, September 15th for yeah. North America and then September 18th for Worldwide. And uh, for the platform, we have you know, Steam, PC, Mac, and Linux. And uh, PS4, PS3, uh, Xbox 360, Xbox One, Wii U at the same time Great. in September. And for the handhelds, it's going to take a little bit longer than you know, the, the consoles yeah. because you know, it's more work. It's not just porting. We mm. actually have to remake mm. uh, most of the stuff for the handhelds. Cool. So that's going to come a little bit later than that. Awesome, and hopefully you'll enjoy your, your launch party. Nick, you, thank you so much thank for coming Thank you very on. much. Really appreciate your time. Uh, stay thank tuned you. here to the GameSpot stage at E3 2015. We've got a bunch more games coming up. We're going to do a little YouTube check-in in just a second. But right after that, Birdman himself, Mr. Tony Hawk, is going to be up on the stage to talk about his latest skateboarding as video game. Stay tuned. Hey, what's up? Welcome to GameSpot's coverage of E3 2015 right here on GameSpot.com or you might be watching us on the YouTubes. Who knew? YouTube live streaming. My God, Fiwiz and JT, you guys are here. Explain to me what, what's going on. You guys are yeah. the, the live YouTube and then also the, just straight we, up yeah, sticking yeah, up yeah, yours no, to yeah, Twitch. Yeah, Do it. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> well, so our mission statement at YouTube is to empower people to broadcast and share, right? Yes. And uh, <laughs> I think it was long overdue for us to have a really robust yeah. live platform for our creators. Um, so we did that, right? So we're going out, we're doing that. We owe it to our creators and fans to have a good live platform. Mm. And then on top of that, you know, I think finding gaming content in this big world on YouTube yeah. can be rather difficult. Even as big as it is, we do billions of hours of watch time every month in gaming content. Mm. Sometimes hard to find particular content. So that's kind of what inspired the YouTube gaming app uh, that, that the team's been working on. And uh, we're really excited to kind of get that out this yeah. summer. Uh, it, it's interesting because I guess with, with, the, with the way web platforms uh, work, people are ex usually, the, the, you know, a, sort of an incremental approach is taken where they can right. get into it. And you guys have, you know, live has been available and used a lot on, on YouTube uh, over the past couple of years. But it's clear to see that what you guys have done with this is essentially hold back and then go, oh, no, we're for real. Here's this whole platform. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I mean, we, just, we started from scratch and really uh, rebuilt things from the ground up. You know, the, like uh, Ryan said, there's so much great gaming content on YouTube already, but it's really hard to find it. And you can't explore it in a rich, faceted way. You can't say, I'm really into Hearthstone, or I'm really into Destiny. Mm. Like, give me all the videos about that. Let me explore that. And uh, you know, I only want to see reviews of Destiny. I want to see Let's Plays of Destiny. Yeah. And we can do all of that. And so that's really why we started from scratch. Mm. So let's start from sort of a blank slate here. I'm, a, I'm somebody who likes video games. Yeah. How do I interact with this app? Is this a web app? Is it on my so phone? Is it on a yeah, tablet? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So the, the one thing that when you look at this whole landscape, YouTube, Twitch, MLG, Hitbox, Zubu, mm -hmm. all these platforms, right, is your experience for gaming content is incredibly fragmented. You're on YouTube for VOD, you're going to other live platforms for live content. Totally. Yeah. So that needs to just change, right? <laughs> there needs to be a one-stop destination for all the content in the world, live and VOD. So like, First things first, that's hey, what we're give us, do, give us, uh, Throw us a bone. Yeah, we, can, yeah. we can still do some on yeah, yeah, GameSpot yeah, if you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah, no, GameSpot's <laughs> going to be a big part of it, man. you got a big YouTube channel. We love it, man. Front and center. Damn. So, yeah, really focus on that. But, um, yeah, it's on mobile, tablet, and uh, for the first time in YouTube's history, we're launching a desktop experience as well. Yeah. So you'll be able to go to gaming.youtube.com and check it out that way. So do you expect that you're going to have a lot of, you know, sort of uh, infamous um, broadcasters from, say, other platforms coming over to you guys, or is this also about unlocking the, the massive amount of personalities that are already on YouTube? Yeah, well, I would say that you know most uh, of those other platforms, their creators were already on YouTube in the first place, yeah. right? Yeah. Again, it was because we didn't have what we really needed to deliver an awesome live experience, uh, they went to those other platforms for that. So all of those folks over there already have YouTube channels. Mm. They already have huge audiences, um, and so we're really excited for them to be able to uh, engage with their fans in an interactive way right mm. on our platform and not have them have to go somewhere else to build up a new audience. Uh, the app itself, I'm somebody who consumes a lot of, like, I watch video game streams and I watch VOD all the time. I'm also somebody who streams uh, on GameSpot and I stream on my home as well in my downtime. Uh, is this app, is this predominantly for people as a viewing experience or is this also being used for people to, to, to broadcast as well? Yeah, it's just, YouTube gaming is just a viewing experience. Think of it as like a lens for YouTube for gaming content. Yeah. Yeah. So the way you upload videos and the way you program your channel, all that happens on YouTube.com. Mm. Yeah, and so all, you, all that happens in YouTube gaming is just it's a custom view on all of that. Right. So you as a creator, a video creator, you just upload videos like you always have, you go live um, mm. like you maybe always have, uh, and it just shows up in there automatically. You don't have to do anything as a creator. So there's no extra management. We merge your subscriber number, so there's just one big number that yeah. you're tracking. Um, and everything is integrated in our analytics tools. So it's not, as a creator, it's actually just a complete entire value add, you know, as, as a gaming mm. creator. It's, uh, it, it, it's an interesting thing that you guys have decided to, to put it in one place. Uh, final question. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I think music videos is probably the highest thing that's searched for on, on or just music in general uh, on YouTube. Games, close second. Why was it required, do you think, or why was the, the sort of reasoning behind really taking a, a massive effort to make this one, I guess, this one platform, this one place yeah. for just games? Oh, it's a great question. You know, as YouTube has gotten bigger, there's a ton of content and a lot of things happening, right? And what you really need to do is you need to have specialized experiences yeah. for people that are coming in to consume content. So we felt like you know it was long overdue that we gave the gaming community, which mm -hmm. is so big on YouTube, uh, a specialized and unique experience for the way for them to consume content. Awesome, Phoebus and JT, thank you so much for coming yeah, on. Nice Appreciate it. Right, Enjoy you, the rest Cheers. of your electronic triple. Thank uh, you. Fun time, uh, and make sure if you're watching this on YouTube, you stay tuned. Also, why not just subscribe to Gamespot while you're here as well? Uh, we'll be back in just a minute with the Birdman himself, Tony Hawk.
Hey, what's up and welcome to the GameSpot stage right here at E3 2015. We've seen a bunch of really great games today, a bunch of interesting developer characters, but I'm very, very proud to introduce uh, one of my heroes, uh, especially during my teenage life, and not only in terms of my, my uh, the things I was up to outside of the house, but also the things I was up to inside the house. Mr. Tony Hawk, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5. It seems funny to even say 5, considering that you got all the way up to 8, 9, 10. Uh, and what we're talking about here is basically a sort of a, a, a return to the, the, the formative years of the Tony Hawk experience. T tell us about this game. The challenge, two minute challenges, mm. um, the way the, the control mechanisms, and uh, but we're bringing it to the new generation of consoles. So obviously the graphics are, are much much better, mm. uh, the motion is better, and uh, the online element is a whole new thing for us. So we are able to have people create their own parks, share it with the world, and have up to 20 people playing with you mm. from all across the globe. It's crazy. Uh, the online stuff has been uh, involved in other uh, Tony Hawk games. I remember there was PlayStation exclusives for some of the online stuff, and Xbox fans wanted to get online so much that they actually hacked it uh, into their oh, system. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's system link. Um, has that always been a sort of a push for you guys? Because Tony Hawk is such a... It's almost like a competitive type game. I remember playing with my buddies, and I'd have a go on Warehouse, and then be yeah, like, "All right, you uh, try well, that's do always it. been an element. It was definitely multiplayer, but but the multiplayer that we were more used to was was same two people on the same console with a split screen, and we obviously had online play in the past, but but it just wasn't. It hadn't come of age like it has now. So the fact that we can utilize that, and I mean, we can we can offer the game digitally, we can offer downloadable content, like yeah. all those elements were not in part of the THPS uh, series originally. And uh, let's look at some of the gameplay here. You guys debuted this, I know, on Jeff Keighley's stage uh, for uh, YouTube E3. Uh, some familiar looking places here. Yeah, well, we got the, the some of the old Ferris school and the warehouse, um, a little bit of the hangar in there. And uh, we have new elements too, where you can you know, get electrocute your board or mm. set it on fire and, and actually bla literally blaze a trail behind yeah. you. That's excellent. Uh, are you guys going to have, um, in the two minute ones, collect, like, collecting skates? Yes. C would you collect a secret tape? Do people have secret uh, tapes anymore? Yeah, well, or maybe you a thumb drive. Yeah, oh, man, it just doesn't have the same ring to it. Not quite, no. Uh, what about the skaters you're going to have in there? Because obviously the world of skateboarding uh, has changed a lot. I was about to say it's changed a lot. You're still doing it. <laughs> it's been <laughs> well, like uh, Andrew Reynolds also has been skating actively uh, since our release and, yeah. and still killing us. So he and I are the two original characters in the game. Um, but we have a new lineup. I mean, it, I think it represents current the, the state of skateboarding currently. Um, Aaron Hamoki, Jaws, who's considered sort of the, the big stunt man these days. Nigel Houston, who's the winningest skater of our generation. Yeah. Um, Lizzie Armanto, who I think is the best female transition skater. Uh, Leticia Buffoni, David Gonzalez. Uh, it's a solid crew, so yeah. I'm, I'm really proud of him. Are you going to uh, dive into the unlockable characters stuff as well? Yes. That was, is that all you're going to say? Well, they're known as secret characters, <laughs> so I have point. to keep them a secret. All right, maybe office, maybe some some certain policemen. Be weird if Spider-Man showed up again. Who knows? That's not impossible. Okay, all right, we'll have to stay tuned, I guess. <laughs> and then in terms of the levels themselves, uh, at this stage you've got this just massive collection of fan favorites to pull from between the downhill stuff, um, like iconic ones like School and School 2, The Hangar, like Venice Beach. In a way, I remember playing these games in Ireland and I'd never been to America before. And then the first time I was in America was in Los Angeles. And the first thing I did was go down to Venice Beach. And I was like, holy shit. Oh, that's pretty actually, cool. Yeah, yeah it's actually kind of like that. Um, are you going to be diving back into the old stuff mostly? Are you going to be making new levels? Uh, it's a mix. Uh, there are some classic levels in there and um, some new ones. Like, the barracks is a, is a famous um, skate facility. That's that's the training grounds for this game. Yeah, it's just here, right? It's here in LA. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, but we are relying on people wanting to create their own, and I th and like I said, I think that's a big element that we were missing before. So the idea that someone can create a, a skate park that we hadn't even thought of hmm. and share it online, and you know, strangers could come and join them for a session. Yeah, create a skater uh, or create a skate uh, park rather. I think it was yeah. in the the second game. Uh, again, really increase the, the longevity of, of uh, the experience I think on so, that yeah. one. Um, 
in terms of, I guess, the, the, the sort of the wider conversation about Tony Hawk, this is a, a franchise that we're seeing return. We've seen Activision do it with Guitar Hero. We just had them up here yeah. uh, again. It's, it's, it's almost like the good old days, I guess. Um, what's it like to you seeing Tony Hawk's Pro Skater return in the THPS uh, sort of format? Because stuff got real big with Underground. It mm. sort of turned into like a Viva La Bam sort of yeah. stuff. And then it, it almost it grew with the way open world games were growing. What, what does it feel like to be sort of compacting? Oh, it's exciting again? to return to what made our series popular in the first place. Mm. I. Uh, I'm hugely proud of, of all the games, to be honest, but, but the idea that, it, that this is representative of what put us on the map and we're sticking with that, that same formula mm. for the fans. Um, I mean, this really is an answer to the calling of so many fans of the series. Totally. Uh, over the last four years, I can't even count how many you know, tweets and messages I've gotten about just wanting that formula. Mm. And so we're bringing it. Uh, the Neversoft worked on the game for the sort of the, 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 the most time. You guys have been working with Robomodo. Uh, the HD game came out, I think it was in 2012 at yeah. this stage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that game came out to sort of a, a mixed uh, opinion. There was some people that said it was very good. Some people said it didn't feel as tight as the old games. Mm -hmm. What's it been like working with Robomo Robomodo considering this is the one that kind of really matters? This is like uh, the, the it's, new one. It, it's felt that, that we definitely have a, a reverence for the series and, and it has felt that important. And we've actually consulted with some former Neversoft developers on oh, it. Wow. So um, I feel like all the pieces are in place for this one to to satisfy and, and hopefully exceed the expectations of the original fans. An interesting thing whenever we talk about old franchises returning, it's kind of weird to talk about it in terms of sports games because we never say that about Madden or, or FIFA. <laughs> yeah. And in many ways, in action sports, right. you blaze the trail. Uh, you know, well, I'm, I'm waiting for the return of track and field. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Could be, yeah. Do you think your fingers can go? Oh, my yeah, fingers exactly. can't just, do that anymore, just man. Just break all your joysticks, yeah. It's interesting because, in a way, you're, you know, that we've all these people here watching, uh, all massive fans of the games, I'm sure, but there's a whole new generation. Like, I grew up playing those games, loving them, when I was 11, 12, 13, the whole way through college. But there's a whole generation of kids who might never have played the pro skater games. Uh, do you think you're also sort of going for them? With yeah, this? absolutely. We we want to we want to share it with the whole new generation. I think there are a lot of people, uh, plenty of people that played our games that are now parents themselves and mm. can share it with their kids. There's some kids who are just going to discover it for the first time and think it's a whole new thing. Mm. Um, and I'm I'm proud of how it represents skating. So I I, I hope they find it. Uh, we talked earlier today for a, a feature that'll be on GameSpot in a, in a month's time or so, uh, sort of wider about uh, the history of skateboarding and video games and the influence that your franchise in particular had on, I guess, uh, sort of translating the, the vocabulary of skateboarding to the world. Uh, if we can sort of dive back into that for a little bit. Um, for you, looking back at games like Tony Hawk's uh, 1, 2, and 3, you're somebody who's actually involved in developing these games. You're not just like Tiger Woods Golf. Mm -hmm. um, just speak to what it was like being involved, being responsible for the skateboarders uh, video game, because it must have been like almost like a burden to get it right. It, uh, it was, but, but it, was a, it was a responsibility I took on myself, because when we first started the game, it, it did feel very much like something that was a test. Yeah. And so I, I play video games my whole life. Uh, I always appreciated that skating was included in video games, but I never thought it was represented that well. Mm. And so uh, if I had the chance to do it, I really wanted it to be authentic. I wanted it to, to represent the culture and the lifestyle, the music, the looks, the, the skating, the way it feels. Mm. And so I dove in head first, and, and, I, and when we first released the game, I just thought it would be something that skaters would enjoy. And yeah. maybe it would inspire skaters to start playing video games. <laughs> That's really the goal of what I, you know, that first and foremost, I wanted the skaters to be happy with it. Yeah. So it's definitely just a pressure I took on myself. And um, I, the, the, the idea that it inspired a generation to start skating or to mm. get interested in skating was kind of a happy accident. Yeah. It's incredible to think that, I guess, video games in so many ways allow people to do things that they, they can't do in real life, travel to places they can't or, or engage in experiences that they otherwise wouldn't have. Uh, the difference with this was that people could go out and spend a hundred bucks on a skateboard they if could, they really yeah. liked it. Yeah, they could go try 360 foot crooked grinds all day long if they want to. Uh, I've only got a couple of questions left because I know you're, you're a busy man here at E3. When you're selecting the skaters, 
for these games. And also when you're selecting the bands who get their, their music in a Tony Hawk's Pro Skater game, do people just like throw their hands up and are like, just like, me, 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 put me uh, in? Yeah, and especially with the advent of social media, I mean, since right. our first series, um, I've actually found a couple bands like through Twitter <laughs> that were, you know, that were very loudly and consistently mm. trying to get my attention. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I went and looked at their music, heard their music and thought maybe this will fit. And yeah. so there are a couple bands that we've discovered in that way and put in the game. Um, there is some classic punk stuff that I feel like there's, there's so much to choose from, from, from my generation yeah. that we didn't use in the previous game. So there's some of that. There's, there's new stuff. I mean, I, I feel like there's as much pressure to have a good soundtrack almost as there is to have a good mm. game. Excellent. Uh, when will we be able to get our own hands on Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5 and on what platforms? Uh, later this year. Uh, and, f well, first it'll be released on Xbox One, mm -hmm. PS4, and then the older systems right after that. Awesome. Tony Hawk's, thank you so much uh, for, for coming on and talking to us. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, very much looking forward to getting back on the skateboard because God knows physically I'm not quite... I don't know why I'm saying physically. You're, you're approaching well, your late 40s and you're still doing it. Uh, yeah, thank you for saying I'm approaching them. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I've I'm hit very... them, but I want the facade that I'm approaching them. I've, th I've got more gray hair than, than, than anyone twice my age, so don't worry about it. Uh, thanks so much for your time again. Thank you. Uh, stay tuned to the GameSpot stage. We'll be back in just a little bit with KJ Nafune and Houston Newgame uh, for the Xbox One. Hello and welcome to back to GameSpot stage right here at E3 2015. Tony Hawk still taking photographs with people. He's probably going to be there for the next little while. But it doesn't matter. we got uh, Bruce and James. Funhouse boys, what's going on? What's up? Uh, do, we, are we get, do we have to skateboard with Tony Hawk right now? That's what you get I to have do. to get in line, actually, uh, to wait for the autograph. That's a long line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, how are you guys doing? Rooster Teeth represent. Yeah, we're doing yeah. well. We're broadcasting over in the other hall uh, on YouTube, and it's, it's, going, it's going well. We're just have to scurry on over here. Yeah, that's exactly what we did. I've, uh, last year, I got to the South Hall once, okay. and that was the first time I'd been in the South Hall, because we're yeah. just like here yeah, you're stuck. most of the time. Yeah, you're stuck. What's going on in the South Hall? What's going on over there? Uh, there's a lot Smite? of... Smite. There's some smite over so there. So we're right next to a smite, or it's the curse, the curse uh, voice, uh, voice chat. Yeah, like, right. and, uh, yeah. but it's we. So we just hear the smite theme song over and Great. over and over and over. Honestly, again. we're just staring at a wall. It's like us and Atlas. Yeah, it's just Persona dancing yeah. non-stop. You just see the same thing yeah. for eight hours. It's great. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I know so much about Persona. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Let's step back from uh -huh. uh, E3 as it is open today. Uh, it's crazy to think that this is day one because we've actually had two days of 
ridiculous announcements. Let's go back to Sunday. Um, I've been having my iPhone open all the time because I'm playing this goddamn. You got a oh, yeah, out thing. You got a vault you're managing uh, over yeah. there. It's like the worst game to play when you're trying to do E3 because it's a bit like people management and you have to keep going back. Uh, what do you guys think of uh, uh, Fallout 4? Uh, I still think now, having watched all the press conferences, I still think Bethesda won. Yeah. I mean, they came out so strong, and like I, I like I said, all the credit to Todd Howard for keeping all that stuff secret. Yeah, it's ridiculous. For so long, I don't know how he did it. I have no idea how he did it, but he came out with a mobile game and Fallout 4, and like the collector's edition, he hit us over the head and just just ruined us. Yeah, uh, we were all so excited. So. Uh, do you guys have much love for Doom? I was I wasn't too hot on so, it. So so I I liked the Fallout franchise, but the Doom stuff that I saw was like, oh yes, oh so my good. god, I want to rip off someone's leg and I want to smash <laughs> it into their face. <laughs> yep. Like it, it looks so like gritty and like fun though. Yeah. I, and that's one of the, my favorite things about Wolfenstein that just yes. came out was it was like really really fun and that's what looks like Doom Doom is vague because he's going to end up being. Yeah. For sure. And like I, I'm sort of not, uh, Doom didn't wow me, but then Wolfenstein never wowed me when I saw it in demos either. Did you ever play it? And then when I played it, man, that might be the best Wolfenstein game. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So who knows? This Doom might, you know, that's a big tall order, but yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's certainly up there. Uh, let's go, go then to, to last night or yesterday. We had yeah. uh, Microsoft showing off uh, all of uh, their stuff. Was there anything in Microsoft that jumped out to you? We saw Gears, we saw um, Halo 5 oh, yeah, Guardians, Halo, we Halo saw. Was cool. Uh, we saw the HoloLens Minecraft stuff. HoloLens yeah. really kind of made me go like, oh, like, because we see a lot of like Oculus and Project mm. Morpheus and stuff, but I'm like, but I'm like, that, I'm just going to put that on and play a game yeah. like for the next little while. But HoloLens is like, can I put that on and then put in my GPS and then tell me where I go on the road? Yeah, like, yeah. like I could see applications of that, but but as far as games like Recore. Looks yes. pretty good. Oh. I like the little independent thing, and it comes from from the developers that made Metroid Prime. So totally, yeah. they have uh, they have some credentials. We have them. KJ Nifune is on with Recore right after you guys. Oh really? Oh, wow. Yeah, right yeah. On. So I'm looking forward to that one as well. I, I was actually really surprised about backwards compatibility. I was like, yeah. I was like, good Who's for them. Coming? Yeah, good for them. That yeah. was really good. I think they must have a lot of people who still own 360s. Oh, I was trying to like yeah, shift absolutely. over. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then Sony, <laughs> because if E3 wasn't exciting enough with all the Microsoft stuff, solid conference from them. Uh, a crazy conference from Bethesda. How, how much money have you given to Shenmue? I twenty nine dollars. Hey, I gave him thirty thousand dollars. I don't know if you're aware of that. He's the he's Thir the one that put him over the, the I'm two the big million Shenmue mark. Fan. No, oh, yeah. no. I, they, I thought Sony was a total fan service conference, so I yeah. got why everybody was so excited. But I don't care about Shenmue. Yeah. I don't care about Final Fantasy VII. Oh no! VII. So Last I was Guardian. Just like, nee. Last Guardian. So here's the thing. I don't care about Last Guardian. The game itself looked cool, yeah. and I was really excited to see a game that was playable. But I don't care. Like it didn't <laughs> matter to me, and like. I'm gr it's great that Shenmue made so much money, but yeah, all it, right. It's gonna cool. make a lot more if it's gonna if it's gonna stick. It, uh, James, it, what about yourself? I was I was gonna say it was really strange how games that have already existed overshadowed new games. Like yes. for me, Horizon looked oh, awesome. Yes. That game looked. I wanted to play that. Like I felt my fingers twitching getting yeah. ready to play that game. But then everyone exploded when they mentioned Shenmue, and I'm yeah. like, really? Like, like this game looks amazing, and yeah. Shenmue kind of already failed. But <laughs> whatever, <laughs> you know, to each to each their yeah. own. There's a reason that's getting kickstarted. Yeah, I guess, you know exactly. Uh, they're saying that the Shenmue 2 had a uh, if you adjust for inflation, uh, it cost about 60 million. Oh, so to make? they're gonna. I, I think it's a three and a half now. They're probably just as well. They're yeah, gonna yeah. have to keep it going. It costs 60 million to 60 make. 60 million. Shenmue adjusted for 2? inflation. Yeah, that's forklifts, man. Are you kidding? Apparently, I need to give another three million to Shenmue. <laughs> Get more jackets. Okay. <laughs> as much as bad, did, did any of you guys pick up? Like, I, I dropped twenty nine dollars on Shamu, okay. but I, I bought the special Pip Boy edition of Fallout Four. I, I gotta do that. I gotta do yeah. that. Yeah. I, apparently, there's a, a Star Wars Battlefront collector's edition. Oh really? That just they were just released. I don't know what's in it. I saw the tweet and I wasn't able to look at it because my internet went down. <laughs> so there's something going on with that that I gotta buy like right now. It's, if one of George Lucas's fingers, Ooh. they're just chopping them off, cutting them right off. In. Oh man, that's nice. I like uh, that. Dudes, what are you doing for the rest of the, the show? Obviously, you've come over and give us a bit of your time. Uh, what are you guys doing over in the South Hall? We're live streaming over at YouTube.com/e3. Uh, for the next two days, yeah, um, and uh, we're just covering, talking to developers, and, and trying to have a good time. Yeah, we're stuck in one place there. just like you are. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole thing. Absolutely. Uh, gentlemen, uh, great to meet you, Matt's fan of fun. Nice to meet you, so much Danny. For on. Really appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. Enjoy the rest of your E3. Uh, we've got a couple of more check-ins over the next uh, couple of days here on the GameSpot couch. I'm here for another three appointments, and the next one's going to be real fun. KJ Nifuni is coming on to talk to us about Recore. Stay tuned.
Hello and welcome back to GameStrat's continuing coverage of E3 2015. Uh, as we know, every E3 is full of surprises. Yesterday had no shortage of them, and uh, one of the best ones we saw on the Microsoft stage was a new game from the one and only Keiji Inafune, ReCore. Uh, and I'm delighted to be joined by Inafune-san. Nice to meet you, Hi, sir. Nice to meet you. Uh, uh, Mark from Harbinger as well uh, here, and Kyoga, you're going to be interpreting yes. for uh, Mr. Inafuje. Yep. Thank you so much uh, for, for coming on and talking to us today. Uh, this is a game that I think sparked <laughs> a lot of people's uh, uh, interest. Uh, obviously, we know the Mighty Number no. 9 is, is, is continuing, so uh, really fascinating to see that uh, another AAA game uh, from, mm. from uh, Mr. Inafune well, here. Mighty Number no. 9 is more, this is the most surreal thing. This is a great surprise for the new IP title. これもまさにまたトリプル A 級のものだと思うんで出来上がってきてると思うんですけれどもちょっとまあ簡単に紹介そうですねあの今回あの割となんていうのかなあのただ戦うだけの世界観じゃなくてその哀愁のあるゲームを作,作りたいということであのこの主人公のジュールとマックっていうあのロボットとの友情であったりとかそこにあのバトルが入ってきたりとかするようなあの。人類の未来とかそういうところまで感じさせるようなそういうゲームになってるんであのまた新しいな船ワールドみたいなのを出せるんじゃないかなと思ってます。<笑> So my hope is that with this brand new title Recore that I can show you a completely different dimension of my world, Inafuna's world. And by that what I mean is that you know uh, just from looking at the trailer you might think, oh wow, combat heavy and it's going to be all action adventure, but there's layers and layers that are going into this game. One being uh, the main character here, Jewel, and her relationship uh, that she will hopefully build her over time with uh, companions such as Mac here. Um, so it's a world filled, filled with uh, combat, but also friendship, love. There's a lot of themes that yeah. are really building up the story. Um, and uh, at a very high level, at a very sort of conceptual level, the backdrop is set uh, at a time when you know there may be only a few human survivors, mm. and what the world is going to be like at that time. Um, I'm interested to know. Uh, you've been involved in Dead, of course, games like Dead Rising, Lost Planet, uh, all of these uh, wonderful games to come out on on the Xbox console. Um, obviously, we knew you were working on Mighty Number no. Nine. But how long has this been in development? これ実際に開発期間はもうどれぐらい経つんでしょうかね。そうですね。これあの14ヶ月ぐらいもうやってると思うんですけど、本当にアマチュアと一緒に考えながらやってて、あの彼らとのそのリレーションシップともちろんマ
Um, and so it's got its own sort of personality. It's got its own character to it. And what I think, together with Armature, based on that core idea of really taking the value and the importance of the core, mm. adding in flavors, adding layers, and constructing something that not just a specific type of genre fans or not just a specific type of J you know, Japanese game fans or Western yeah. audience members can enjoy. Something that hopefully will speak uh, on a global level, universal sort of language. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the center of everything, is that the core hopefully will be something that can be interpreted mm -hmm. by gamers around the world. Uh, Mark, uh, you must be a fan of, uh, of his previous work. Uh, what's it like working, uh, what's it like for you guys taking on this project? And uh, what f what sort of form is it at now? Because obviously 14 months isn't very long time at all. Yeah. And from what we've seen from the trailer, uh, there, there's, this could be a very, uh, multiple different types of games. So what, is, what does it look like at the moment? Yeah, I mean, we um, <clears throat> the way Concept and Armature work is that uh, Inafune San's group really kind of uh, gives us a high level structure and ideas, mm. like the core, uh, everything kind of uh, filtering back into the essence of what are these characters and how in every aspect of the game that they touch on that uh, concept. Mm. And very early on we kind of talked about what the game would be like. You know, we had uh, very early was a third person action adventure game. Yes. So it wasn't just a platformer, it just wasn't a combat game. It was a really nice mix and blend of the two. Mm. Uh, exploration was a very big part of it. And on top of those things, uh, how can this aspect of these characters and these cores filter into every part of the game mm. so that people are constantly reminded about the themes uh, about the core and you're uh, immediately drawn to these characters but you know Mac this character is the core <laughs> but he's identified as the dog right now yeah, but you yeah. see in the video he quickly is put into a different form yeah and like, no, the poor yeah. dog. <laughs> I love dogs. Like, oh, okay. And you're always going to have the opportunity to do anything you want yeah. and customize them any way you will like. Uh, but there's going to be certain situations like that one where Mac basically sacrifices himself for mm. the character. And those are situations that you're having to deal with. And how do you uh, adjust your gameplay for that? Awesome. Obviously, we're very far away from seeing this game, I'm mm. assuming, um, in, 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 in store shelves or digitally. What, when will we see more about ReCore? Mm. このゲームに関してはあの、so obviously this week at E3, you're only seeing a very small slice, yes. a glimpse of what to look forward to in the world of ReCore. Um, I'm confident, the team is confident that hopefully within the next few months, you will be able to show, tell, talk about it a lot more. Awesome, Mark, Kyogo, Inafune-san. Pleasure, thank you so much for spending time with us on the GameSpot oh, stage. I uh, really can't wait to see more about ReCore. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. And thank you very much for watching. We're still going live here on the GameSpot stage. Stay tuned, Iron Greenberg from Microsoft's going to be on in uh, just a little bit. He might bring his other controller with him, and uh, we'll probably ask him what he thought about all the conferences uh, here at E3. So stay tuned, we'll be back in a second. Next up to talk about, we've got a bunch of games to get through here, folks. Uh, I want to talk about The Division next. We've seen The Division at the Ubisoft conference uh, a couple of years in a row here. Uh, this is the third year they've had a big yeah. Uh, yeah. fanfare around it. Is it just me, or does this game look not really as pretty as it did a couple of years Are ago? Are you going down the Watch Dogs route? I don't want to <laughs> say like this downgrade nonsense, but like, man, yeah. like the, the Ghost Recon trailer looked better than what I, what I saw from The Division. We'll we'll come back to that in two years' time. Oh, let's <laughs> see. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, I, I'm I'm happy about today's 
gameplay because yeah. it finally showed off the sort of online connectability, what it means to be playing this game uh, with a bunch of people and running right. into other people yeah. and whatnot. Also, that Ryan guy oh God, what at the end of the demo. Dick. So, I mean, the, yeah. the, the thing is, I mean, we've seen a lot of these multiplayer playthroughs on the press conferences, but no one's really acting like they would in a real multiplayer situation, yeah. apart from that guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who griefs everyone at the end. Uh, so what we saw in the demo was that uh, the, the sort of the main human team here were following uh, three characters going around basically doing a mission in the, in the world of the Division, get accosted by this other group of uh, online players, and then they sort of band together, and then at the end they decide to turn on them, mm -hmm. uh, and then on the end it turns out that one of their... Uh, friends decided to turn on them as well. Wow. So this Taking is really interesting to me. I mean, other games, like Kane and Lynch is the first game yes. that comes to mind that's done this mm -hmm. before. But what's interesting about that is in Kane and Lynch, it always just devolved into everybody's just going to betray everybody yeah. else and whatever. And so my, my, my first question would be, what's to keep that from being a thing that you do? What's yeah. to keep mm. that, you know, it sounds like a good idea, but in practice, is it really going to be meaningful or is it always just going to end up being the same anyway? Yeah. I'm yeah. really curious about that. Yeah, it's got good to see them show off a, a little bit more of the connectability stuff, but still, it's, it's almost that thing that we're so intrigued by that there are as many questions that get answered, we sure. get loads more questions. Like, for instance, why do you leave a Christmas tree lit up when electricity seems to have gone out of most of the city? Because, yeah. you know, the spirit of Christmas lives on, Danny. <laughs> because sometimes you need a good shot, and yeah. sometimes the shot overrides logic in film and in games. That's a good point. Uh, yeah. this, is the, this is the, the, the quintessential moment, moment oh. where he's like, no, nah, I'm not going to help you up, bro. I'm going to finish you off, because this is internet video games. <laughs> God. <laughs> Look at oh, the numbers. Just guns them down. Yeah, it's Ryan. pretty good. I like how he kind of just looks at him, stares him in the eye a little bit. And uh, we also got a date for The Division, uh, March 8th, 2016. Yeah. So yeah. we can look forward to that slipping probably one more time before. <laughs> 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 at least once. <laughs> cynics, all of us cynics. Uh, I, I'm really excited for The Division. I like it on paper. I like the, mm -hmm. the, the idea of the interconnected multiplayer, the idea of being in groups. I'm a little bit down on the graphic stuff. Uh, final thoughts on the division. Alexa, what are you thinking? I don't know. I'm sort of, I feel like there are so many military shooters or military-esque shooters. Yeah, and Ubisoft's making all of them. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm still, I still don't think I've seen anything different other than, I guess, the ability to turn on your team Yeah. and take their stuff. So. Yeah, what do you think, Liz? You know, I kind of, I, I like the idea. Um, it kind of reminded me a little bit of uh, I Am Alive, Ubisoft's oh, yeah. fabled, uh, another post-apocalyptic game, where it just had that kind of feeling, you know, when the two groups kind of came up against each other, mm. and you're like, do I trust them, do I not? And they nailed it in that yeah, one. Yeah, I yeah. mean... That game could have been so much, so much more, mm. but maybe some of the ideas went into uh, the division. I don't know, yeah, but it looks. I, I'm still cautiously uh, excited. Mm. Yeah, Kevin, final thoughts. Yeah, still same, pretty much cautiously um, optimistic about it. Mm. Um, perhaps because I want the destiny-esque to be a, a, a burgeoning genre of its own yeah. that's, that's worthy of, of of getting attention. And this is the one game right now um, that seems to be really following in those footsteps. And I really want a better type of Destiny game. Hmm. So maybe this will be it. Maybe yeah. not. Maybe 2016 is the year of that sort of, maybe there's more and more of these games uh, coming out. Destiny yeah. 2. Dest yeah, Destiny 2 coming at E3 oh 2016. Well, we'll be playing uh, The Division by the time that comes out. March 8th, 2016 is when, hopefully, as long as it doesn't slip, we'll all be playing The Division. And if you want any updates on that game, of course, stay tuned right here to GameSpot.com. Welcome back to GameSpot's coverage of E3 2015. Uh, this is day one 
would you believe? I wouldn't believe it because it seems like we've had two days of incredible announcements from software uh, developers, from publishers, from hardware manufacturers, and uh, one of those hardware manufacturers' f corporeal form <laughs> is in front of us right now. It's ridiculous. Uh, Aaron Greenberg, thank you so much uh, for coming on and talking to us. Uh, I see you've got a little pouch there. I do have let's, a little let's pouch Let's leave here. that for a second. We'll, we'll talk about it's it a little It's a little Easter bit. egg here. Um, a lot of people on social media going crazy about what Sony re uh, revealed yesterday. You guys had a really solid show, um, uh, first thing in the morning. It's obviously yes. always hardest to go first. But in terms of, I guess, what's coming out this year, yeah. it seems like there's a lot of stuff happening on Xbox. Uh, there's a lot of exclusive games happening as well. Has that, was that a focus for you guys? Absolutely. I mean, for us, we have what we think is the greatest games lineup in the history of Xbox, mm -hmm. and we've been working really hard to kind of bring this together this particular year, and we know people have been waiting for things like Halo 5, we know people have been waiting for Gears of War to come back, uh, we also have Tomb Raider coming exclusively mm -hmm. uh, this holiday, we have a new Fable, we have Forza Motorsport 6, we have Gigantic, we have seven with Rare Replay as well, we have mm. seven exclusive games all coming this holiday. Frankly, we've never had that type of lineup ever before. And so for us, we just, how do we fit it all into one briefing? And frankly, you saw, we had a lot of games and franchises people want to see that we're even saving to Gamescom because yes. we just ran out of time. Yeah, you're right, Scalebound wasn't here. Uh, the guys from Remedy, I know, yes. have, had to t have had to sit on it. Scalebound, Crackdown, Quantum Break, even some other surprises. We're going to save those for Gamescom as we kind of shift our focus to 2016. But for E3, for us, it's really about the 2015 games lineup and all the big exclusives we're bringing this holiday. Uh, let's talk about your big cheese. We're looking at it right now. Halo 5 Guardians, obviously hotly anticipated. Uh, the sort of the, the, the main franchise when it comes to Xbox, what people think about. Uh, I was watching this presentation, and at times it felt like what you guys were doing was out out destinying destiny. <laughs> it sort of felt like that, yeah, that like co-op online experience that I guess we sort of now associate with destiny because that's what people have been playing recently. Um, what do you think is the core focus for Halo? Because obviously it's expanded so big yeah. into so many different types of game modes. Uh, when you're showing that game off, what do you really want to sort of sell? Well, it's definitely the most ambitious Halo title 343 has ever gone off mm -hmm. to make. And you know, people I think expected us to show campaign for the first time. But to be able to reveal that you can play both as Spartan Locke, pl also play as Master Chief, the fact that it is four-player co-op, but it's true drop-in, drop-out mm. four-player co-op. At any moment in time, you can instantly drop in. If a friend comes in for 10 minutes and drops out, they're instantly replaced by AI. The game, the campaign design is made for that. You know, this whole sort of hunter versus hunted sort of tension we've been playing up mm. between Chief and Locke, and we're going to reveal more of that. Uh, as we get closer to kind of getting deeper into the story. And then we showed, you know, people know we're bringing the traditional Halo multiplayer with the arena style, more mm. competitive esports focused. But the big new innovation, the big new hottest is Warzone. And yeah. so the team really invested a lot in multiplayer with this release and four times bigger than any other Halo map ever made. The fact you're going to have massive 12v12, blue team versus red team, you know, they're going to be tons of weapons, tons of vehicle, there's AI in there. I mean, it's just these massive scale multiplayer. You, we've never seen this before from Halo. And so, a lot of innovation we're really excited about. Yeah, it looks very exciting. I know a lot of people uh, on GameSpot.com are freaking out about that. Can't wait to get their hands on it. Um, I want to talk to you about Rare for a little bit, because it seemed for a while there that Microsoft wasn't really doing right by what Rare was. And this year, it very much seems like you've sort of, you know, in the way that Sony have taken some franchises and said, okay, you know what? you can have it. Uh, with this Rare collection, you're taking 30 of the best Rare games. Um, some some mo very popular ones aren't there. GoldenEye, for instance, isn't in there. Um, w w but was this, was this something you felt like you needed to do with Rare? You know, I was able to work with Rare from the original when they first pitched us the concept, and it's been a labor of love for them. I mean, this is their 30th anniversary, and it's very rare to have a developer that has that type of rich heritage. And, you know, they had hundreds and hundreds of games and we went through the whole catalog and, you know, really lovingly thought about how do we take this collection from, you know, Battletoads to Blast Corps to Jetpack Perfect to, Dark. You know, Perfect Dark, uh, I'm an old RC Pro-Am fan from the old school <laughs> arcade. Did I see like, Viva Pinata in there somewhere? Yes, well? you yeah. did. And so, you know, the uh, N64 Conquer, banjos and I mean like it's 30 like great games and yeah. probably some games you never you maybe have even played and so to be able to take that 30 year history to bring it together in a collection that people can play um, 
and we're delivering it 30 games for $30. Yeah, I think it's a great value. And the other thing is we said, nobody ever releases video games during the summer. Like, why yes. not? We're out of school, you know. <laughs> we're setting, we see people, a lot of people are on Xbox Live. So the, uh, the first week of August, time to the Gamescom, we're releasing the title. And uh, so we'll give gamers uh, some, you know, 30 new games to play and 10,000 gamer score points to uh, oh, really? unlock as oh, well. Oh, so. you are kidding me. <laughs> 30 bucks for 10,000 gamer. Oh, that yeah. may be the best ROI on That's gamer great. score ever. That's so. even better than that Avatar game I only bought for the points. <laughs> uh, let's talk about VR and AR for a second. Yeah. Obviously, um, you guys were, were involved in what Oculus showed off last yes. week. Um, uh, announcing a, a partnership with Steam as well this time around. Uh, and, and, and uh, of course, HoloLens, yes. uh, a very good presentation. Uh, Microsoft are obviously throwing in with their own thing, with Morpheus. You guys seem to be spreading the risk a little bit. Uh, wh wh where do you think Microsoft lies when it comes to this technology? Because at the moment it seems like you've got fingers in a couple of pies. Sure. I mean, we're really excited about what's happening with VR and mixed reality and all that. So for us, we, we see this as early days. This is pioneering, really, a lot of innovation is happening. I don't think people quite know you know exactly how this is all going to turn out. Yeah. We want to support and give consumers as much choice as possible. We don't want to bet on only one technology, one solution right now. And frankly, the beauty of building on the Windows 10 infrastructure is that whether it's on Xbox One, whether it's HoloLens, or whether it's working with folks like Oculus or Valve, you know, we stream Xbox One games to your Windows 10 PC. Mm. Oculus Rift is another great display for that. We'll yeah. be working with Valve and their VR solution on that. We're bundling the Xbox One controller with every Oculus Rift. So just supporting VR and mixed reality in multiple different ways. And then you saw with what we're doing with HoloLens is that we're innovating in that world where we're taking your real world environment and mixing that with, you know, with holographic elements. And mm. I think Minecraft was a great example of kind of seeing that come to life. And frankly, that was one of my favorite parts of the briefing. It was, it was probably one of the best uh, versions of selling that type of technology to people, already showing them, because the problem with, like we have a massive problem in terms of video coverage here on GameSpot, trying to show people how cool VR is. Yeah. Uh, so for a presentation, uh, to, to the way you guys uh, shot this, I think really helped. Uh, one piece of technology we didn't see uh, at all mentioned was Kinect though. Uh, obviously sure. there's a Kinectless version of Xbox uh, One now. Are you guys done with Kinect? We are We are absolutely continuing to support Kinect, but we're innovating with Kinect in a different way. I mean, we're bringing a lot more features to live, so we announced the new Xbox One experience. Yep. Uh, that will include Cortana, so you'll be able to have voice commands, building more intelligence into that. But we really want Kinect to be a choice for customers. For me, I love it. I turn my Xbox on with Kinect. I use it for entertainment. I use it to do screenshots and uh, you know uh, and all that. I like to be able to have a hands-on controller and use voice commands. But frankly, a lot of people also have the, want, want a better value and don't want to have to pay for it. So we're not going to force people to do that. We give people the choice. Mm. Um, and so we're continuing to support Kinect where it makes sense. Cool. Uh, speaking of controllers, What's this other thing you got here? Yes. That's what I'm guessing anyway. It is, by the way, our new Elite Wireless, this is the actual case that it comes in. Nice. So, uh, you know, we, we really care a lot about our controllers, spend a lot of time on the Xbox One controller, but we anyway, have- Anyway, you drop 150 bucks on a controller, at least you should get as a case. Fair enough, fair <laughs> enough, yes. But we have a lot of pro gamers that play on Xbox One today, and we worked with them and got a lot of their feedback on designing what we think is the best controller, frankly, that we've ever made. And mm. so. Even before you get into the functionality, just how beautiful the chrome finish, I mean, just how beautiful this controller looks. It's very, it's, it's really it solid, hold it, give it a feel. Um, oh yeah, it's super solid, oh I like these guys. Yeah, so we've got the paddles in the back. These are all mapped to the A, B, X, Y buttons. Mm. You can pull them out, you can customize, fully customizable. Um, for, you know, what programmers told us is that we, we have typically looser triggers for things like Forza, but yes. if you're playing Halo and you want the hairpin, it'll oh, tighten up that. just with a flick flick of a switch. That was my, one. oh yeah, super clicky yeah, there. Yeah, so then. faster. Uh, oh yeah faster shooting with the hairpin triggers. That was actually, because I'm a massive car game fan, and that in Forza, having yeah. that ability to do that was fantastic, but yeah. it is a bit of an issue when you're just trying and to And then you can customize up. and program every single button, and then making the D-pad even better. But if you said, hey, I wanted the traditional D-pad, <laughs> you simply take this out, and then you put this in, it's just a magnetic drop-in. Oh, wow. You want to just get a different size. <laughs> All of this is swappable. Hmm. You say FPS, you want a taller oh one my here. Goodness. You want a rounder one here. People I mean, want tall ones on the left, really? Some people like that. Man, I'm, not, I'm no eSports, I can't. And so the nice thing is you can customize it all. You can have uh, hundreds of different profiles. You can even in-game switch from one pro profile to the other. Oh, wow. So it's a pretty yeah. exciting device. Sorry, I'm, I'm super selfish. I just want to play a little bit. 
and you're right, it is the price of two controllers, but you get you get a true pro controller, and it's an elite product that we're really excited about. Excellent. So when is this uh, actually going to be available? We're folks? taking pre-orders now, but it launches this holiday. Awesome. And it does come with the case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got a bunch more questions about Absolutely. the Microsoft conference. Uh, yeah. But also, I just want to ask your opinion. Uh, Sony yesterday had a, had a pretty stellar conference of their own, obviously showing off um, a bunch of game people were very excited about uh, the, the Last Guardian, um, uh, seeing Final Fantasy in there as well, and then Shenmue. Yeah. Are those projects that you think you might see on, X on Microsoft platforms as well? Well, some of them that are owned by Sony, we would expect not. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, you're right, and they had a great show, and you know, it, we we watch their briefing every year, and it's great to kind of come to E3, and everyone sort of shows all their games and all the new announcements, and there's a lot of fan favorites, mm. and you know, I think they did a great job. You know, at the end, we we do do a little bit of a kind of a geeky scorecard, where we sort of look at, you know, how many games do we show, how many exclusives do we show, how do we kind of mm. stack up, and you know, we both showed 20. What's interesting, we both showed the same amount of games, we mm. showed 24 games in our briefing, we both showed 11 exclusive titles, we showed seven exclusives that are coming this holiday, and Sony actually didn't show any that we saw that were co they confirmed this year. Yeah. So I think that was the biggest difference. They showed a lot of games and some fan favorites and some games I'm looking forward to playing as well on their platforms, but for us, we think the big difference is we're delivering the big exclusive games this year, um, and we'll talk more about 2016 as we kind of move into Gamescom yeah. and, and they're going forward. And one of the interesting things from your conference was the idea that there are actually quite a lot of Xbox 360 owners who mightn't have transitioned to the Xbox One. Um, do you think that these are folks who have sort of gone to the dark side? Are these folks who have picked up PlayStation 4s? Or are there actually like latent 360 owners who just haven't bid on the next generation? Yeah, we look at that pretty closely. I mean, what we know is that today, there's tens of millions of Xbox 360 owners. When we do go out and talk to them, they basically tell us they've been waiting for the time and the reason to, to migrate. And a lot of people have been waiting for the next Halo. Mm. A lot of people have been waiting for Gears. A lot of people have been waiting for backwards compatibility. And so we think having all that coming this holiday, we expect we're going to see a massive migration. You know, we expect millions of Xbox 360 owners to migrate and move to Xbox One. And we see the majority of people that buy an Xbox One today own an Xbox 360. So our fan base has stayed very loyal. Mm. And frankly, they're waiting for those new releases to come this year. And, and backward compatibility would not underestimate how big that will be for them and getting them to move. Yeah, um, Aaron, another thing you guys showed off was that you guys are going to be stepping your toe into the early access world. And so yes. having games that, you know, it, it, it's, it's been a sort of a, 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 a tough road for Steam, but it's actually proved to be when it works, it works really well. Can you just talk about how that works and how you guys are going to be able to police that system? Because yeah. that's kind of an issue that Valve have had. You know, Steam's done some great work here with early access, and as we've been working with the independent developers as part of our ID at Xbox program, you know, one of the things we've heard consistently from them is, hey, we want to be able to have something like early access where we can let people play these games early, but one of the learnings we learned is that we want to do this in the right way when we bring it to the console. So uh, our program is called Game Preview. Uh, it's officially uh, launched here at E3. Mm -hmm. And so the way we're doing it is we're curating it. So it's not going to be Wild West, just any possible game. We're going to take games that we think fit in that model and are on a path to actual true release. Uh, every single game comes with a trial, so you get to try the game before mm. you buy it. So we're really thinking about the customer experience first and putting our fans first in this way. We're excited, so we've got Dean Hall, who's really sort of the father of this, this early yeah. access, bringing things like DayZ, bringing his new Ion uh, project to game preview. We have the folks bringing uh, a number of other titles. Um, and so we've got both Elite Dangerous um, and the long spacing. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a long day. No we worries. have two titles available today up in Game Preview. And so hopefully people will go check them out. And, uh, and then you know provide feedback to the developers, much like they do on the PC today. Cool. Exciting stuff happening over at Microsoft. Aaron, thank you so much for your time today. I got one more question, because upstairs I was asking people a bunch of, uh, well, what, if you had the chance to ask Aaron a question, what would you ask? What's going on with this Steven Spielberg Halo thing? Steven Spielberg is a huge fan. In fact, he's coming to E3 <laughs> on Thursday. I understand he comes every year. We have a great partnership with him. Mm. At this point, we're not telling people what we're doing, okay. except that you know the partnership continues, and stay tuned. All right, he's probably busy with that whole you know dinosaur thing he was doing <laughs> on the side, whatever he that was. He has a busier world than just video games, yeah, that's for sure. sure. That's yeah. a good point. Aaron Greenberg, thank you so Excellent. much for coming on. My pleasure. Uh, enjoy the rest of your show. Thank, thank you for you. spending time with us. Uh, and thank you for watching. We are still live here on the GameSpot stage. we got a bunch more appointments up. I've only actually got one left, but it's uh, for
fantastic series, one I've been a fan of since back in the days in uh, 1994, I feel. 98? 98, I think, is when I faded my first Rainbow Six. Uh, I'll be back in a couple of minutes with Siege. Stay tuned. Hey, what's up? Welcome back to E3 right here in Los Angeles, California. You're watching the GameSpot stage, and it would not be a GameSpot stage without a CNET check-in. Ashley Escada, good to see you again. Hey, Danny. Uh, it's been a year since we last talked. A I, whole year. I see your face on the television every single day. I hear this, and I'm sorry. On the I'm way so in. sorry. I oh, know, it's great. Um, uh, we're, we're so the, the breadth of games coverage across all CNET properties yeah. is alive and well. Yeah. Uh, it's great to have you here today. One thing that I want to talk to you about uh, always is Nintendo. But first of all, I overheard you talking to Peter Brown about amiibo swapping. I what? Okay, so sounds like some weird subreddit. I don't want to be involved. It is exactly in. a weird subreddit oh, really? that you can't be involved in. Uh, so I have wanted a Gold Mario, Silver Mario, and Rosalina for a long time, and I happened to get my hands on a NES, and okay. so I had a NES and a Wii Fit trainer, and I wandered over to our amiibo swap. And I did a swap, and I got those three Amiibo for the two that I traded. I was so scared that somebody was just going to steal my stuff. So did you just mail it, and they mail yours? Yeah. It, they, have a, they have a point system, though, so you can tell people okay. who have actually completed transactions. And, of course, you always go look at someone's Reddit history before you make a deal <laughs> with them. So, But I did that, and he seemed legit. He was really nice, and I did the trade and uh, got my three Amiibos that I wanted. So, but Excellent. Now I'm going to have to actually physically harm people in line, I think. I might have to get like boxing lessons yeah. so that I can get the woolly Yoshi amiibos. Oh my goodness. Yeah, there are probably people over there right now freaking out about it. They're Nintendo. squishy. Have you touched oh, them? Oh no, are they really? They are, they're totally squishy. You can squeeze them and they are so adorable. This is, I can't get into it. Like I've got my own problems. I bought, I spent $135 on a Fallout 4 Pip Boy. I'm gonna do that too. Let's let's all be honest. What's okay. wrong with I don't, me? I think it's gonna be heavy though. I have little tiny probably. matchstick arms and I'm gonna be like, uh, uh, what I, we have one that's a clock watch that I wear as cosplay for these uh, videos on GameSpot and it like hurts my arm. And I was like laughing to my girlfriend when she got an Apple Watch and now here's me with this goddamn. Yeah. Yeah. No, you gotta have a Pip Boy. A you gotta have a Pip person. Boy. That's uh, way cooler than an Apple Watch. Sorry, <laughs> Apple. Sorry. <laughs> Don't uh, hurt me. I was down here earlier interviewing Tony Hawk, and the Nintendo conference was on. So the only thing I got to see was Star Fox Zero. So what were your biggest picks out of the Nintendo uh, uh, meeting this morning? So I, I've been very skeptical about Super Mario Maker. Oh, yeah? Uh, but now that I've sort been. of seen what it can do, in ter like when I saw it at the Nintendo World Championships yes. this weekend, I was like, okay, this looks kind of awesome. I don't know that I'll have time to make my own levels, hmm. but I do want to play other people's yes. levels. So I, I'm looking forward to seeing what crazy, crazy things people come up with. Um, I also I also am very curious to see how the Legend of Zelda heroes, the that I want to see how that plays out. I don't know how that is going to sort yeah. of work. And I'm a little skeptical of multiplayer Zelda, like on 3DS after, because they've done it before and it was kind of okay. I don't like, you know, it, Zelda spin-offs have been disappointing in the past. You think of Hyrule Warriors never yeah. really caught fire. I was hoping, I love the, the Hyrule Warriors on 3DS. Mm. I think that's a great idea. I was hoping for Splatoon 3DS. That game is like, 
actually getting really good positive waves. Like, people my are talking about Splatoon. I have been playing Splatoon nonstop. Really? Nonstop. I'm level 18 now. I'm almost level 20. I've almost maxed out. I finished all the single player challenges. <laughs> I was watching it at the Nintendo World Championships, and I was just like, oh man, I could be doing this right now. Yeah, yeah. I could be on that stage. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, it's uh, it's so fun. And I am surprised they didn't do something like Mario Kart with uh, Splatoon TV, because they yeah. already have sort of the Inkopolis, like the little hosts and everything. You're right, yeah. I'm surprised yeah. they didn't do a replay uh, sharing feature where you can post online. But um, you never I, know with Nintendo now, though, because they're able to do stuff post release. They might just add it in there. That is true. They might do that in DLC. And I I, like there is, I really liked what Nintendo had to offer, but I think it was a lot of stuff we already kind of knew was coming. So yeah. I, I'm, su I think I was surprised by what I didn't see, or wh I was surprised by what I wasn't surprised by. Yeah, I guess yeah, if that yeah, makes yeah, sense. True. I was really hoping to be shocked by a Wii U Metroid game, yeah. or you know, so, like some more actual Wii U Legend of Zelda footage. Like I would have liked to have seen more of that. Yeah, it's a shame they decided not to bring it here. Uh, I guess it's it's a little bit of a ways away. But even like we saw some gameplay, it would have been nice to see some more. Yeah, uh, yeah. One thing I actually barely caught out of the corner of my eye somewhere, and I don't know where it was, was was probably Twitter. Was is there Mario Tennis coming back? I did see Mario Tennis, and, and it looks like maybe if you have Amiibo for it, or uh, like course. somehow they get yeah. huge. They, they turn gigantic. They're, they were all huge Cheating. on the courts, like hitting at each other. It was crazy looking. and I But yeah, it looks really fun, and I guess this year. So I like that Nintendo focused on things that were coming out either this year or early next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As opposed to like, here's something that's coming out in a couple years. Like, I am so excited about Final Fantasy VII getting mm. a remake, but it's like, how long is that going to be down the pipeline? Probably in two years mm. when it's the 20th anniversary of Final Fantasy yeah, VII yeah. Hitting, hitting the U.S. Two years would probably go be good. Like, yeah, you, that this would could be, be a project that goes on. That would be best case scenario, yeah, yeah. everybody. Best Interesting, case. Interesting, because Sony were very much, like, Sony's conference was outstanding, but it was, it was very much a future thing. Nintendo and also Microsoft actually so focusing on stuff year, that's coming yeah. out this year. It was yeah. like, here's the stuff you're excited about this year, and then Sony was like, Here's some stuff that is going to make you freak out. Yeah. We put a saddle on a tidal wave of nostalgia and rode it into the yeah. show. But that wave's going to, it's not going to break for a while. But now you got to wait for the water to subside to actually enjoy what we're bringing. A tsunami of games from it everyone is. else, though, right? Oh, yeah. It's, this has been a great show for games. Uh, like, it's been about the, the new consoles for the last few years. Yeah. And I think now we're finally getting into, like, the meat of the cycle of Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and mm. Wii U. So this is, like one of the best times to go to E3 and mm. see all of the games because this is when everyone is locked and loaded, like fully understanding of the hardware they're working with and they can really start getting the most out of and expanding kind of what is mm. capable on these consoles, which is so cool. Totally, and it's all about the games at the end of the day. Ashley, thank you so much for coming on. What are you going to do next? You've got the this massive show floor to go peruse. I have to go check out the other hall. I'm dying to go oh see yeah. Fallout 4, uh, but I haven't been to the other hall yet. I've just been like, here, I did Morpheus earlier oh and cool. that was amazing. It's I real light. It is really light, yeah. and also I got to do the uh, the really awesome demo of the, the London Heist. Yeah, I did that as well. That was rad. I, I jumped on the floor and shot over the I top of the littering. table. I was littering. I threw my cup out the window, <laughs> and I threw my can at my passenger. I was like, this guy is terrible. And, and But then I was, like, shooting at people, and I loved how if you move the the controller mm. right next to the guy and you're pointing out his window, he leans back. Oh, wow. And he's like, whoa, whoa, okay, okay, go ahead. And like, lets you shoot. Oh, so that's cool. That's a new demo since the one I did at GDC then. It was really cool. I was really impressed. Awesome. Ashley Scott from CNET.com, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. I released you into the world. Oh, Have fun. thank you. Uh, yes, we'll be it's back. Time. I've got I've only got one more uh, demo here on the GameSpot stage. Then Lucy James, who's just walking into my field of view, uh, will be coming on. Hi, Lucy. Uh, we'll be back in a second, though. Rainbow Six Siege. Stay tuned.
Hello, welcome back to GameSpot's continuing coverage of E3 2015. We are live in the West Hall right here in the LACC in Los Angeles, California. And I'm delighted to be joined by Andrew Witts. How are you doing, sir? Good, how are you? Uh, I'm doing great. You're wearing a Rainbow Six Siege shirt. That probably means you're on here to talk about Rainbow Six Siege a little bit. Yes, I am. Uh, first question right at the gate. Where's Ding Chavez? Ding Chavez? Ding what are you doing to me, man? <laughs> I'm old school Rainbow Six fan. Where, where's my boy Ding? Can well, I name myself Ding? Well, we, are, we don't have Ding, but we do have a lot of stuff if you're an old Rainbow Six fan. Terror, Terror Hunt is back. All right, tell me about that, Bob. Well, uh, Terror Hunt is back. It's going to have four modes, three modes of you as an attacker, and one mode is we as a defender. Mm. And, we're gonna have, and one of those modes is Terror Hunt Classic, which is the one you know and love, just breaking in, eliminating all the terrorists. What you saw yesterday is a new mode called Disarm Bombs. Mm. You get to break in, disarm two bombs, and we have made the most challenging AI yet in the Rainbow Six game. Excellent. Uh, yeah, the, the presentation yesterday was, was very bombastic. I think you guys have done a good job of trying to sort of communicate what this game is to people through the betas, through, through coverage, uh, game sites have been doing. Um, at times it feels like this is, because Rainbow Six is a game that can be very, like the old Rainbow Six are very methodical and planning based. But then also when you think about Vegas or you think about what happens when, when shit hits the fan, it kind of gets crazy. How difficult is it to sort of balance those two worlds? Like a sort of a, a slow pace, but then when it, when it kicks, it, it really gets frenetic. Well, we wanted to have an ebb and flow, so we wanted players to have, you know, spawn into like a tense situation, or a tense mission, or a tense match on PvP. And then, by g being in a tense match, people just start talking, right? But then we have, you know, it's very quiet in this, uh, in, the, in this demo we had yesterday, uh, in the in the hands-on. But then you notice as soon as you kind of break into the consulate, into where, you know, into, into the Tarot stronghold, things just spike really quick and you have to just, you know, you have to move, you have to, you have to talk, you have to communicate, you have to move tactically a bit, you know? Otherwise you'll be a bit punished. So it's this ebb and flow of, you know, silence and then a crescendo and then, yes. and then it goes back down and then once you plant the diffuser here, and then this, the, it, the tension rises right again and the terrors come right back at you. So we've done a really, I think we've, We've experimented a lot, we iterated a lot, and find this ebb and flow of tension, silence, tension, you know, this, yeah. this crescendo, right? And both on PvP and now with Terror Hunt. Yeah, so PvP obviously was a lot of what we've seen over the past couple of months. So are you telling me, is everyone else involved in, in the terror side of this are AI combatants? Yes, so we have, it's, it's uh, one captain and, and four other teammates, and uh, everybody else here is all AI. Uh, is the setup different uh, each time you load up? Like, because uh, one of the cool things about Siege is there are so many different ways for the defenders, for the terrorists to sort of set up their uh, their their uh, barriers and their parameters and stuff. So each time you do this, does it change? Yeah, so we, all our design decisions uh, in making the new terrorist hunt has been about replayability. Like, uh, and, and players interacting with the sandbox. But now the AI is going to interact with the sandbox yeah. as well. So we basically, every single time you load up uh, a match with Terror Hunt or a mission in Terror Hunt, we, it could be two versions of a map, so day or night, three difficulties, but they also each, we have an AI strategy manager that sets certain things and certain traps. Every single time you load up into, into Terrorist Hunt, there's a new puzzle for players to solve. Mm. We, wanted, we wanted to make it, uh, make it so that you never had the same experience twice in Terrorist Hunt. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing, I'm delighted I, I got you guys on the stage because when I was watching, I was freaking out. But this is probably completely wrong, but is this the same level from the first Rainbow Six game, the, the front of the like uh, ambassador's house? It looks like almost identical. Well, we were definitely inspired by previous games yeah. ever since the get-go. We haven't been quiet about that. So in making a kind of a very Rainbow Fantasy, like unveiling, uh, unveiling Terrorist yeah. Hunt, we wanted to kind of keep it classic. So you're in a consulate here and you're moving through. And uh, yeah, we ha and uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's similar kind of on purpose. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. The, the, the front definitely gave me that uh, nice bit of uh, reminiscing there. Uh, the GIGN guy here getting helped up. In terms of difficulty, uh, one of the issues, I guess, with these games is that there's so many different pieces, mechanisms that a player has to learn. Uh, trying to teach somebody how to play uh, the, the, the siege levels you were showing um, in the betas and that we've covered, that's kind of an easy enough concept to understand. There's a defending team and an attacking team, and you, right. you kind of have to, you know, one team's role is, a, and is, is the way it is, and the classes sort of fit into that. Um, having multiple types of these modes means that every single time you have a new mode, you have to teach the players something new again. Um, in something like this, where you're, you're trying to teach four people or so to like work together against an AI, uh, what are the challenges development-wise to try and like communicate that stuff? Well, you player. said it's about communication, right? It's about science and feedback, letting the player know 
what's going on in the mode, what's kind of going on for all, what, what are players going to get into on a very surface level, right? Mm -hmm. But again, because of the fact that we, it is a very tense situation, we found that as because it's a very tense game and, and, and no respawn certainly helps with that and yes. the high lethality. Yeah. Um, Big Counter-Strike fan, I like that. That's why I'm so interested in this game. <laughs> so uh, players actually communicate a, a lot more. Really? Yeah, because of the fact that they, they just start talking whenever it's a tense situation. Like, it, it, it's the same thing people watch horror movies and like they just start like talking about what's <laughs> yeah, going to happen yeah, next, yeah. right? So we found that it's a very cool domino effect that happens here. And additionally, we want to make it all about the player experience here in Siege. As Across all the modes, all of our, all of our the players' progression, as they progress, you can progress and recruit operators, mm. regardless of any mode you want to do. So that helps us in the teaching component of, if you're a PvP player, you'll learn PvP by playing PvP. Yeah. If you're a PvE player, you'll learn and you'll, ex and, you'll, and you'll progress and learn PvE by playing it, right? We're a very hands-on, player-centric game. So the more, you the more you play, the surface level is very important, but then as you discover the depth, it's all about playing more and being interested mm. and seeing all the different nuances you can do. Another interesting thing about Siege, when I was first playing the, the, the various alphas, and, uh, was that it was almost like people didn't realize you could just blow through walls. Like, you had to communicate that to the player that actually this isn't like a normal first person shooter. You don't have to stay within the boundaries of the building. You can sort of make your own path through it. Uh, what's that been like for you guys watching players kind of get to grips with that concept? Well, we see players kind of are there. They, they just kind of seek things out, they kind of test things out. And as soon as they test something out, going, ah, this might not work, and it does, all of a sudden they go, oh, wow. And then they experiment constantly. Like players experimenting inside of this little playground, this sandbox we made. Hmm. This is the most entertaining part of what of, of, of for us as developers. In the closed alpha, we saw so many amazing things. We learned a lot yeah. and how to streamline and, and teach them a bit more. But just in general, the, the experimentation that players go through and the creativity and the things they come up with, hmm. both in their defense and attack, I mean, it's, it's awesome. And that we knew that that's, that's exactly what we wanted from them. And that's what they want from us now. So they get used to it. And they, stay, they like it a lot more. So we're going to keep that there. Yeah. Presumably, as well, when you've got th th these complex game modes that obviously take a lot of resources from, from you guys to make sure that they play well um, inside of these, 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 or the levels play well inside of these various game modes, um, does that limit the amount of levels that you then get to create? Like, how many levels can we expect to play in Rainbow Six Siege? You will have 11. And there's, there's two variations of each one. There's day and night. Mm. So it kind of changes things up in terms of visibility, reactions that people have, both on a, both the AI and mm. the players. So, but it was all about iteration for us. We had to iterate constantly. Otherwise, you know, it was going to be like a, like a very strange experience. We wanted to be very consistent. Every single map has just as much creativity as a previous one. The sizes may change, but we wanted it to be very, it was very important for us that we nail that there was so much fun and, and uh, it was still that awesome sandbox in all 11 maps. So we're still iterating here as we as we push forward uh, to launch, but uh, well, you know, the players will help a lot with that. Uh, have helped a lot with that with the beta. With, I'm yeah. sorry, with the alpha. So yeah, it's it's all about iteration. It's all about just constantly you know making it and testing and testing and testing. And that's helped us so much. Awesome. Last question for you, Andrew. Uh, the the Vegas games were super fun multiplayer wise. Like single player was excellent. Multiplayer was really good. I always had a bunch of like core friends who were really into that. Um, when you think about Rainbow Six, you think about Rainbow Six Siege, are you stepping into the sort of esports aspect of it? Because it, it's sort of a difficult area to, to really stand your ground. Counter-Strike GO seems to be doing, making a pretty good go of it now. So are you, with all this multiplayer stuff, are you trying to get into the esports side, or are you making this for you know a couple of dudes and girls to play co-op with their buddies? For us, our goal is to make a competitive tactical shooter. We want Rainbow to be a competitive tactical shooter about player creativity, and that's our mission right now. I mean, after October 13th, players want to take things into a different direction, and a community wants to take a direction. We'll follow the community. Yeah. I mean, we've been very vocal about that with the, with the feedback we got in the closed alpha and tweaking the game based on so much feedback. So again, we'll follow the community wherever they want us to go. So they want to go to that direction, another direction. We're on board. Awesome. Uh, when can we expect to play it, and on what platforms? We're gonna play play it uh, October 13th on Xbox One, PS4, and PC. This year. Video games coming out this year. Andrew Witz, thank you so much for your Thanks time. So much. Really appreciate it. And yeah. best of luck finishing it up. It looks like a, a great game. Can't wait Thanks, to see man. more of it. Uh, and thank you for watching uh, my little part here on the GameSpot stage. I'm done for today, but uh, the one and only Lucy James Games ready to come up here and do a much better job than me. So make sure you stay tuned uh, right here on GameSpot.com.
welcome back to GameSpot's coverage of E3 2015. I'm Lucy James, taking over from Danny O'Dwyer here on the stage with Mark Alexi, the creative director of Assassin's Creed Syndicate. So, Mark Alexi, let's talk about what you're showing this year at E3. We saw yesterday at the Ubisoft's press conference, we had a kind of Jacob sort of a better look at him. Uh, and then at Sony, you kind of busted out with Evie, the other protagonist. What was it like to kind of show the world these two uh, these two assassins? Well, for me, I'm very proud to uh, to have shown Evie yesterday, to have revealed her to the world. This is something that's been really dear to me, and it's been core to uh, the game that we've been trying to build. So uh, I'm kind of uh, relieved to finally be able to talk about uh, both Jacob and Evie, because the story is very much about those two characters and how they grow up how they, uh, they evolve and, and uh, from their different, very different personalities. Yeah, so is it, is it nice to be able to play with the duality of the two characters, like play them off against each other? Because I mean, obviously they're gonna have that sibling rivalry. Yeah, absolutely, and it's exactly something that's in the game. So Jacob is more, uh, let's say more brash. He takes tackles situations head on. He doesn't think too much, and he always does things with a smile. Uh, he's someone who enjoys very much what he's doing. Evie is more reserved. She's more strategic in her approach to things. She thinks things through. And you can imagine the clashes that we'll have between the brother and the sister as they explore this world of Victorian London. So let's let's talk about the twins themselves. So they come from Crawley. Yes. And they found their way into the, the thick of it in the big bad city of London. Yes. They were both born assassins. And the things are not things are not going very well for the assassins in nineteen in the nineteenth century. Uh, the Templars are firmly in control of the Industrial Revolution and the, the city of London itself. So London is kind of the center of the world at, the, at that time. It's one of the biggest cities in the world. It's the center of the Industrial Revolution. And one of the things that we're doing differently this year is that it, the players are not unraveling a strange mystery. Uh, the game, the setup is laid out before them at the start of the game. The Templars are firmly in control of London. You know who the Templar Grand Master is. And our two assassins decide by themselves to go and destroy the hold that the Templars have on the city. So it makes for a nice open playground and open setting for our players to engage in. So it reminds me a little bit of uh, the Borgia influence in, uh, was it Brotherhood? Um, when you're, you know, you yes. know you know who the bad guys are already, and you go take them down. Yeah. So one of the ways that you can do that in Syndicate is gang wars. Yeah. Basically, can you tell me a little bit about this? Because we saw a little bit in the gameplay trailer. So one of the things, the ways that Jacob and Evie will try to take back London is through the street gangs. So the Templars control the street gang, and through those gangs, they control the working classes. So one of the ways Jacob and Evie will fight back against the Templar is create by creating their own gang, and then from borough to borough, conquer the city and expand the influence of their gang. And they're going to be a super important tool for the player in the game, in the sense that you'll be able to recruit and power them up, and uh, they'll follow you around. So if you recruit, for example, five, uh, five gang members, and you hop on a vehicle, because you can climb on any vehicle that you want, uh, they'll hop on the vehicle with you, open the doors, get in, but if there's not enough space, they'll hijack a vehicle of their own. So you're moving through the city with your own gang. So it feels really cool, fresh, and different than what we've seen in the past. So you mentioned briefly vehicles there, and they have, uh, we're getting a very big GTA vibe from that. You know, you just go hijack it, run some people over. The question I have, so in Assassin's Creed typically, you can't kill civilians. You'll get desynchronized if you kill civilians. What if, say, I'm trundling down the street in a carriage that I've stolen, and I accidentally knock into uh, someone who's on the way to the bakery well, or something. You'll see that our civilians are very good at dodging those cards. So they jump out of the way uh, because I don't think it would be fun for the players to just desynchronize <laughs> as they mow through, uh, through, uh, through civilians. So still we keep that part of the franchise, but we've done a lot of efforts to make sure those civilians move out of the way for the player to have fun. That is good to hear. No no unneeded, unnecessary Absolute. casualties on, uh, on your watch. Absolutely. So the vehicles new, you, you're kind of reinventing the stealth a little bit as well. So yeah. we're very used to this cover-based, uh, hiding in the uh, hay bales, what, but you're also bringing back whistling, which is a great thing that I really yeah. missed. So can you tell me a little bit about how you're reinventing the game that is so well known for hiding in the shadows? 
So uh, last year, Assassin's Creed Unity in, uh, introduced a feature that was much awaited by our fans, the crouch. So, and you could snap on, uh, on the corners of buildings. So what we're trying to do differently this year is we keep trying to improve the game. So uh, we're moving to a soft snap instead of having a hard snap. So it's much more accessible and fluid. Fluidity is really a key word for us this year, making the experience feel more fluid for players. But also giving, for me, stealth is about manipulating the environment. So players have more tools now than ever. We're bringing back the whistle. But also we're trying to think about how our different tools can improve stealth. Throwing knives are a good example. So instead of just being used to kill enemies, you can throw them on a wall and create a distraction. So stealth gameplay has a lot to do with how you manipulate the environment, and players will have tools to do that this year. So we saw in the gameplay walkthrough as well, uh, throwing a throwing knife and not bringing down yeah. things on people. So there's going to be a lot more of that as well. A lot more environmental uh, usage for players to enjoy and try to draw enemies with a whistle under one of those things that you can just throw a knife at and it falls on the enemies and kills them. So let's talk about combat as well. So the Victorian era, that's when sword play was kind of dying out a little bit. You know, you, you couldn't just carry around a broadsword anymore. So Evie especially has her cane, the sword cane. Yeah. So she's kind of got best of both worlds. It's the cane sword. Cane sword, Our I'm historian sorry. says it's really, really important. It's not a sword cane, it's a cane, cane sword. sword. <laughs> um, so how are you kind of basically like taking that into account but still getting in some sword play? So it's an era more of concealed weapons, but it's an era of great innovations as well for combat. So uh, our players will have a revolver, which is something that really changes the way you approach si uh, situations. When you have a six-shooter, I mean, there are many different ways you can approach uh, that situation, obviously, but it's not a stealth weapon. So uh, you'll attract a lot of attention if you use it. No. So there are counterbalance to, uh, it's a, to, the it's a risk to its reward. power. Absolutely. Yeah. But in terms of weapons, we have brass knuckles. We've got the Kukri knives that comes from, uh, from the far side of the empire. And we've got the cane sword. I almost said sword cane. But, uh, so I, I'm a bad <laughs> influence. I'm a terrible influence. But one of the things that changes about combat this year that we're trying to change is shift the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, opportunity to the player to take the advantage, take the offensive. So instead of staying and waiting for, uh, to counter enemies, this is not a winning strategy you need to uh, stun the enemies because they'll attack at yeah. the same time and it becomes much more of a fluid dance between yeah. the enemies. And we're bringing back multi-counters, multi-finishers and all that to make the combat more spectacular and enjoyable. How difficult is it to kind of make your own mark on a franchise that is so well, it's revered, it's loved and you have these familiar threads and strands in each, in each iteration. How do you make your mark on that? Well, we've been working on Assassin's Creed in the Quebec City studio since Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. So we take a lot of inspiration from that game. It was really, for me, one of the best ones in, uh, in the franchise. But we brought to it a spirit of innovation. We were working on the Leonardo machines, the war machines, like the flying machine, the they were tank, my favorite part. and all, they those, were uh, all those things. So I was really glad to have built those for Brotherhood. And the studio brings to Assassin's Creed Syndicate this spirit of innovation, which is why we have the rope launcher, which is an incredible tool for players to, uh, to climb on top of buildings and zip line across the, uh, the environment. Uh, we've got carriages, we've got all those things, bringing a second playable character. So I feel that this is our true innovation and modernizing the experience that we will leave our mark on the franchise. Uh, and finally, I think I have to ask, because I, I, I live there, uh. London. It, it's a great time period, it's a great city. I mean, what's it like kind of just, you know, pouring more life into it? Uh, for me, the more I look at London, the more I feel like we've had the opportunity to create one of the most iconic, represent one of the most iconic cities uh, in the world. With the, the Thames in the middle, is just so incredible. And it's not something that we've shown yet. You'll have to stay tuned to see more of it. But it brings so much incredible life into the city. It's filled with boats uh, that I think will capture people's imagination. But it's also a city of landmarks. I mean, people, uh, I know when I scouted London to build the game, I couldn't get into Westminster Palace. But it's something that we can put in the game. And, and there's a good, uh, there's a fantasy there to be able to go into the halls of power. Um, other things like the, 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 the train stations, which I think will amaze people. Yes. It, they were the cathedrals of their era. 
and there are just so many things for people to explore. And we've had a lot of people from London come work on the game with us. Uh, Lydia Andrew, our audio director, is, uh, was born just across uh, Charing Cross. Oh, brilliant. And she, she puts so much detail and attention to making sure that every part of the city feels different and that it feels like her home. And finally, maybe on London, one of the things that I love the most about the city is how each part feels very different. Yeah. So from Whitechapel, uh, that, in which will represent more the poverty of the era, to Westminster, where you have like the halls of power, of yeah. politics, Buckingham with the royalty, where you feel that it's an empire, uh, you'll have the South Shore, which is something that's completely different from what we see today with all the industries. So really have a different story for, to tell players as they move through this, uh, the city. Mark Alexi, thank you so much for joining me. Can't wait to play more of Assassin's Creed Syndicate when it comes out later this year. Which platforms, what date? So it's going to come out on October 23rd on PS4, Xbox One, and later in the fall on PC. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Stay tuned here at the GameSpot stage where we will be having, well, next up, it's an iconic franchise. We're going to have some Star Fox Zero. Make sure you stay tuned. by MSI Computers. MSI, number one in gaming. Find out more at us.msi.com. And then, of course, Microsoft closed out their press conference with one of their big franchise. We all knew it was going to come. Gears of War. They said Gears of War Ultimate Edition. It's the original Gears, remastered, yep. modernized, coming out on August 25th. But it's Gears of War 4 that we saw the longer demo. For. Gears 4. They've dropped Sorry, the of you're war. Right. Very cool. There's yeah. no war Very happening. True. There's just Gears. <laughs> four of them. Gears apparently. 4. And yeah. uh, it starts off, and it's a guy we don't really recognize in a dark place. And then he's with a woman. They are, are they the new Marcus and Dom? Yeah, or Marcus Gears and four? Anya. Marcus and Anya? Yeah. But I mean, she's are. playable right from the get go. Yeah. It took till Gears of War 3 for Anya to yeah, take to the field. Yeah, true. Uh, but here we are. It's very dark. Right there, we see there are two, two moons. moons. And so I did a little Googling, mm. and according to Gearspedia, there right. Sarah, the planet that Gears, mm. Gears of War takes place on, has only one moon. So this, is are, another this could be a new planet. New Obviously, they share some technology. We, yeah. see, we see the chainsaw, the lancer, yep. <laughs> this shotgun on the Nasher on his back looks yep. very familiar. Yep. Uh, it but looks it looks really really cool. I love. I'm just having flashbacks to playing the first two Gears games in co-op, and I'm just so excited about it now. Um, I never realized how much I cared about Gears until right now. Like yeah. <laughs> seeing it again, being like, man, I remember having so much fun with Gears. I'm looking forward to seeing more of it now. And I mean, expanded fiction, sure, why not? This is a chance for them to actually try and tell a better story. I mean, the first Gears game had of the bunch had the most interesting story of it because it was laying out a universe, mm -hmm. and this it is had kind the benefit of, of being the origin. Yeah, exactly. Right? And if they treat this in a similar fashion, where they reset everything and kind of draw a line underneath all the other stuff that happened before and tell a new Gears story, it could be an opportunity to like go back to that first era of the first game and have an interesting story to Don't tell Don't touch again. that. Don't touch, touch that. It's not only that he touches yeah. it, he leans over yeah, it. Yeah, he leans so over he it. It's like, like right yeah, in his face. Uh, in terms of, you know, new, you were talking about new fiction, mm. we also see new enemies. So uh -huh. perhaps uh, instead of, you know, the emulsion inside the planet yeah. making locusts, Wretches. it made these creepy like more insectile enemies yeah. we saw right at the end. Yeah, I mean the enemies that we saw, like the f the f when it first popped up, I was like, wow, it looks like Rex from Mass Effect. It does. Yeah. yeah so that so like I just want to hear the gear just sound like Krogan <laughs> <laughs> as they're shooting, <laughs> as it's coming towards them. Oh, I miss Rex. Yeah, oh, man, he's what great. What Rex and Mass run. Effect were in the same universe. He looks just like Rex. Oh, look at his teeth. Well, except now. Except tongues. now, yeah. <laughs> and the main yeah, character looks. Many tongues. He looks just like B.J. Blusco. It's a bit like <laughs> I remember. <laughs> 
people made that uh, observation that wow he looks like bj he does but yeah, yeah i like the ui look evoking yeah. the same old, old gears of war kind of familiar feeling and i just sure. think graphically it looks fantastic oh it looks yeah great. it looks i mean the gears games are always stunning to look at and um chainsawing things is still rad That's apparently true. <laughs> yeah as you can see here are you guys sad to not see uh doom style dismemberment out of these chainsaws you know what i'm okay i'm okay <laughs> with <laughs> it i'm, I'm all right you. with it <laughs> Oh, and with that tongue party in the Gears of War guy, ah. or the Gears 4 guy's face, uh, <laughs> we're going to wrap up here our post-show coverage from Microsoft's press conference 2015 at E3. We are going to be coming back at you in just a short amount of time. Let me check the schedule here, because we have got the EA press conference coming up yep. at 1230. That's in just 45 minutes. Uh, we'll be back with the pre-show. And so please come join us then, get some food or whatever meal time it is for you right now. We're going to go eat. We'll be back to talk about EA here live from GameSpot HQ at E3 2015. Well, that crashed. Oh, no. Hello and welcome back to GameSpot's continuing E3 coverage. It is day one, and this morning we had a Nintendo Direct where we had the, uh, the lovely Miyamoto-san revealing more from Star Fox Zero. And with me is Ali Rapp from Nintendo Treehouse, and we also have this lovely lady offstage demoing the game for us. Uh, Ali, let's talk a little bit about Star Fox. He's back. Yeah. Star so Fox is back. Fox McCloud is back. Uh, peppy hair, slippy. Everyone loves Slippy the whole for team. some reason. <laughs> Falco. Um, yeah, and they're back and they're uh, going up against Andros. Yeah. So, you know, just kind of um, a lot of things that you love from the, from the old Star Fox games are back, but um, it plays completely differently. So it's going to be a completely new experience for people who've grown up with it and, of course, yeah. for people who maybe didn't grow up with it. Yeah, like, I mean, I'm going to put my cards on the table here. <laughs> I did not have a Nintendo 64, so... Stream me up for that later, but this morning, uh, before the hordes descended on the Los Angeles Convention Center, <laughs> I did get a chance to play Star Fox Zero yeah. on the Wii U. So let's talk a little bit about how the game handles, because yeah. it is it is gamepad heavy. Yep. Um, yep. And you have to kind of get to grips with that, and then yep. it all kind of it clicks. So let's talk about what the gamepad brings to brings yeah, to yeah. Fox. So we're actually going through the training mission right now. Um, Sarah's playing for us, and what the training mission is showing us is that. You think of it like uh, your um, your ship, your R wing, controls independently from your guns. Okay, and so what you do is you have the gamepad gyro as your gun aiming. Yeah. Um, so if you're familiar with Splatoon, you know kind of that aiming mechanic, um, and then you control the ship, the R wing, with the sticks. And so what you need to do is you need to be looking at the gamepad to aim the guns. Yeah. Um, and then you need to be looking at the TV to steer the ship for the most part. Because the TV is going to give you this kind of like big view of what's going on around the ship. Um, whereas the gamepad view is going to give you more of that like very detailed, okay, I'm hitting that enemy, I'm hitting that obstacle. Um, so it's this really unique use of kind of that dual screen play yeah. um, to make it feel like you're actually in the cockpit of the R-Wing, right? Because that's what the gamepad view is supposed to be, yeah. is the cockpit view. And so, um, you know, of course, you've got the six, you've got the gyro, you've got the dual screen, and then, of course, you've got, like, the button the button moves. Like, you've got your U-turns and your um, your uh, barrel rolls, of course. And uh, oh, Well, of course, it would not be a, a Star Fox game without, without it. Without the barrel roll. Yeah, the, the barrel roll does return. Um, so right now, you know, the game is just teaching us the basics, um, getting us used to controlling the guns with a gyro, flying around things, target view. Um, so what you can do is you can target onto to an object, um, whether it's your objective or um, like an enemy. And the you'll be able to then kind of fly around in this cinematic view. Um, and I don't think Sarah can hear us or else she would do it yeah. for us. But um, um, So let's talk a little bit about, I mean, how easy it is to get to grips with two at once. Because I found that, uh, like, because I, I was stupid, okay? I went straight. You're not stupid. Straight into the main mission because I thought, I've played a lot of games. Aww. I can do this. <laughs> Turns out I couldn't. Couldn't beat the boss. 
The lovely lady on the Nintendo stand felt sorry for me. Uh, if it makes you feel any better, I died in the Corneria bus too. That's good. <laughs> um, so it's just, it's, it's kind of crazy how, well, how quickly things can go from being steady, just a nice measured pace, yep. going through hoops, yep. into, oh my God, everyone's attacking me, help me. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, what we want to do is we want to get give people that that feel for how it feels to control in a in an open space or on rails before they jump into something like that, yeah. you know, and a boss or yeah. something more tricky like um, say maybe Area Three, uh, which is also in the E3 demo. Um, but yeah, I mean it's one of those things where you know listening to how it controls, like man, I don't know if I can do that. That sounds tricky. You know, that sounds like a lot of things to keep track of. Um, and you know, it is going to take you a little bit, yep. but once you get it, like you said, it's, it's just like, I get it, right? It clicks. You get it. It, it's, it is intuitive in a lot of ways. Like, when it was presented to me, it was like, you're going to have the hardest time with this. It's so hard. You're never going to get it. Nobody's ever going to get it. We're, everyone is bad at video games ever. And so I went into it thinking that, you know, it was going to be really tricky, but when I picked it up, I thought, hey, this is actually pretty intuitive. I, once I understand that I need to look at both screens yep. and that, that the, the idea that the guns and the ship are controlled separately, then it kind of clicked, right? Like, because, I mean, that's how it would be. Right, you right. You know what I mean? Like, right. Like, you don't, in real life, you know, you don't steer your plane where you want to shoot. No. You shoot while you're steering the plane in a different yeah. direction. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, early in the, uh, the uh, Nintendo Digital event, uh, Mr. Miyamoto was talking about how we wanted to kind of simulate what it feels like to actually fly the plane, and that's part of it, right? My favorite thing yeah. from that was that he, the idea from Star Fox not only came from the famous shrine that he lived right. by, Isn't that was funny? the fact that he let me watch Thunderbirds. <laughs> um, this, you know, the weirdest mishmash weird, of things. <laughs> weird things to come together to create something really great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a, it's a great story. Um, so yeah, we're in, we're in Corneria now, which old Star Fox fans might recognize. Um, there are some familiar things about Star Fox Zero, yeah. uh, which will kind of bring you back. Um, of course, some of the, a lot of the characters return, um, some of kind of the areas. Um, but it really is, especially with the way that you move around this space mm -hmm. and think about the way that you're controlling the R wing. Like it's it's such a different experience. It's yeah. a different way to experience Star Fox um, in a lot of big ways. So it's going to be awesome. It, oh, 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 we also have the walker. Oh, wow. I wonder oh, if yes, Sarah of course. can hear let's, us. Um, let's kind of see if we can get Sarah yeah. to show us one of the big things. So yeah. this, well, this was a gameplay mechanic that was cut from the sadly never surfaced Star Fox so there 2. So were, there were some, yeah, I think they were talking about that in the digital event, right? Yep. Talking about how some of those elements like the walker, um, you know, are kind of resurfacing. They wanted to share those things with, uh, with folks. So let's see if Sarah can pick up the walker. She's really, she's really into this. She's stuff. really intense. She, I think she's got it. Um, oh, there we so go. It's, it's kind of nice. Like we see this in games, like obviously uh, Mario Kart 8 yep. there's a transformation, yep. uh, Sonic All Stars Race Transformed. Mm. But this kind of gives it like a completely different feel because it obviously not on a track. You're free to run around. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Take the level at the pace that you want. Yeah, so. yeah. The walker is really good for. Um, I actually like it because. It is like it's not quite as fast as the R wing, and it's yeah. a little bit more of a st stable experience. Yes, um, because you're not super worried about like controlling your height, mm -hmm. um, and so if you need to like really focus on taking down enemies who are bugging you up in the air, yeah. especially like in all range mode when you're yeah. flying all around, um, I think it's super great for that. And of course, it's also good for exploring. Like there will be stages later where you like you go through tunnels, and yeah. you don't want to do that in an airplane, no. so you can go into the walker transformation. But a nice thing you can do is that if you're in walker mode, you can hover. So if you yep. if you do need to kind of be able yep. to, yeah, you need to get up in the air quickly. Yep. You just kind of pull the throttle. Yeah, back. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some. Um, the, there's the walker can do that. Um, the landmaster returns and has an, a mode sort of like that, um, where you can kind of hover above the ground. Um, there's the gyro wing. So there's a few transformations that you can go in, do in the game to kind of. Yeah. You know, change it up depending on what kind of stage you're going into, whether it's a more cramped stage or um, kind of a more stealthy stage. So let's talk a little bit about what Star Fox Zero is. So Mr. Miyamoto said, you know, we're, we're pulling things from old games, but yep. this isn't a sequel. Yep. This is kind of a fresh take, not necessarily a reboot. Right, 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 yeah. So I like to think of it as kind of like a reimagining. So if you're familiar with the Star Fox series and you're a fan, you're going to see a lot of things you're like, oh, yeah, that gives me feels. You know, I missed that. Um, like like Corneria, like the characters. Um, 
like you know, the rings, things like that. But it it it's not the same. Yeah. And um, like for example, the boss in the end of Corneria is completely different. Yes. Um, but that's not the only thing. You know, like I like to think about how even if it was a completely same game, which it's not yeah. to any of them, um, the way that you control the R wing is just like so fundamentally different than the way yeah. that you'd control the R wing in, in any of the previous games. It kind that of it's such it a feels, different experience. It yeah. feels like it's it's brought it into the modern age in that mm -hmm. so it's still gonna hit on all of those nostalgia beats for people yeah. who played the original game yep. uh, on the N sixty four or on mm -hmm. the SNES or whatever and but they, it's also accessible enough for new gamers because obviously Nintendo are they brought motion gaming yep. to the masses. Yep. They're continuing to do so with the Wii U. And being able to use the gyro yeah. is just sort of this new intuitive way of yeah. looking at it. Yeah, yeah. I th and I like I love the way that the gyro works. <laughs> I love that it works. Um, uh, I'm the same way with Splatoon. Like, you can use the six in Splatoon, but yeah. I actually prefer the gyro. Like, it's yeah. quicker. It's more accurate. Yeah. Um, and this, the same goes for the way that it controls with Star Fox Zero. Like, mm -hmm. I love having my R wing control with the six and then the aiming be able to have that like quicker turn with the gyro. Yeah. Um, it's just, and it's like, if you think about like if it were a Star Fox game from the old days and you brought it to just like a normal controller or whatever, like you've got like your four buttons or something and it's like, it feels kind of flat, yeah. right? But now you've got so many new exciting things to learn that I'm just like, I'm really excited to pick this up. I haven't really like gotten into a Star Fox game since, uh, Star Fox 64, I guess you could count Star Fox Adventure. Yeah. <laughs> but not quite. Yeah. A little bit different experience. Um, and so I'm super excited to, to uh, get into Zero and to just like kind of relearn what I thought I knew. Yeah, about Star yeah. Fox. So let's talk a little bit about the story. Mm. So Fox McCloud and all his friends return. Yeah. What is the kind of, is this kind of going to be running on the same themes? Is this a story we've seen before or is it going to take us in a kind of new Unexplored territory. Right, right. So all we know now is that Andros is involved, and Andros is still naughty, naughty pants. And it's uh, up to Star Fox's uh, gang, yeah. good gang, to take down Andros. But that's really all we're, uh, well, all we're all letting on. The only thing you're letting on to. Yeah. Uh, here is the giant boss fight that I mentioned yeah, earlier. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's the weaponized flying fortress. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> Ridiculous. Um, so, I mean, let's take a look at how uh, Sarah's going yeah, to yeah. tackle this. Yeah, and you can actually take this boss down in a couple different ways. Yeah. Um, you can shoot down, like, all the top guns and make it fall. So I was I was trying to take out each laser. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or what she did is she um, shot down one, and then it toppled one of the sides. Mm. And what she can then do, let's see if she's going to do it, um, is there's, like, a little hole that she can go oh, into with the walker. Yep. Yeah. And what she can then do is, is do uh, let's see if she can make it. Oh yes, nice. Okay. So this is a great, a great example of the, just the transformation and how you can yeah, tackle yeah, things in different yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah, And this is totally, this way is totally optional. I didn't know about it until somebody what? at work was like, "Did you know? Did you see <gasps> what?" Um, um, so you can go in and take, um, take down the core, which is so. Cool. I mean, we, we've kind of we've said how great the gyroscope is. Can you play it on just the uh, the game, uh, the Pro Controller? TBD. 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 <laughs> Teases at Nintendo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I strongly recommend um, really uh, spending some time with the yeah. with the gyro because it is, like, it is a really, really cool way to play the game. But um, there was the thing that uh, with Splatoon, someone mm -hmm. had a pro controller and just attached a nunchuck to it, right? Oh, I don't know. I always play with a gamepad. Yeah, I mean. Whatever you guys, whatever you crazy folks do. Yeah. It, it's like you're going to MacGyver it. Oh, Arsh, take it down. <laughs> Yeah, uh, which is, I mean, I've, I've not seen this before, so. <laughs> but no, I died the first time, too. Yeah, yeah oh, it took me great. a while. Oh, and a nice salute. Good Team job, Fox General there. Pepper. I also like to think of, um, I think it was maybe Star Fox 64 when the voices were like, my emperor, you know, yeah. like it was like the shaky <laughs> voice. Yeah. yeah. It's my favorite part. I don't think they do that in this one, but. Well, Ali, thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you so much to Sarah for demoing Star Fox Zero for us. When is it out? Uh, I believe it's this. It is. Later this year? Later this year. I believe. I believe. Check Nintendo.com. Later this year? Holiday. Holiday uh, 2015. Thanks, buddy. Thank you so much. Uh, make sure you stay tuned here to GameSpot because we have tons more amazing coverage from E3 2015. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back to GameSpot's coverage of E3 2015 from the Los Angeles Convention Center. I'm joined by an extra special guest who's joined me on the GameSpot couch. It is Tim Geddes from Kind Hello. of Funny. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I am doing great. This yeah. has been a great E3 so far. And oh it's only God. day one. Day one. I know. This is the beauty of E3, though, is it's one of those things where it's three days, but it's not really. It's yeah. really like three weeks leading into it. Then there's the At negative day two, negative day one, zero, and then we get into this, you know? It's, it's strange because so much more has been happening the weekend before. Yep. Or as it's been unfortunately dubbed, the leekend. The leekend. Oh, I haven't heard the that. The leekend. I like that. Because we had a lot of stuff we had that just... A lot of things were leaking. Oh. Some, some of them good, some of them bad, but you know, I overall... Yesterday at the press conferences, I was blown away. You know, when it comes I mean, down to it, Final Fantasy VII HD. Final what? Fantasy VII HD, The Last Guardian, Shenmue Three. Oh my God! This was a, like a solid 40 minutes of people yes. just going, "What? What? what? <laughs> I never thought this would happen." You know, yep. Microsoft killed it. Nintendo today, yep. they did great. You know, so many things. Star Fox. All Star right. Fox. I played it. It's great. Woo! I'm terrible at it. Woo. I just watched you play that for a bit. So those at home, I think you guys are. You saw that. Yeah. Wow. I love Star Fox, and like that was the thing when I got on the show floor this morning. I was like, I need to play this. I need to try. That's it what out. I did because the, when the doors opened and the masses just came in, yeah, I was like, oh, gotta so get in that our way. That's the thing. I'm I'm, I'm taking notes of what I'm gonna go. I like that. I mean, and sadly, Persona 4, Five is not playable. I mean, oh, it's okay. right there. It's yeah. I can, it's in my eye line, and yeah, it's not yeah, playable. Yeah. yeah, it's been it's been crazy. So today we, you know, we're we're doing live streams alongside mm -hmm. you guys. We have our stage over there. I we can hear you guys. Oh, uh, we're loud. I'm trying to like. See what's up? Dare you out. See, who, yeah, see what's going you should go on. over. You should say hi. Yeah, it's oh, totally sure. different than this stage. Mm -hmm. You guys are professionals. We uh, like to scream and make noise, and I'm sure you like to do that too. So you Thank should you. come over, jump on the stage, and have fun. I think uh, we started off the day with our game of the show. Yeah, which awards. was? Uh, we didn't announce it yet. Like oh. we just talked about it, and we uh, we made face size placards nice. that we're going to give out to mm -hmm. people, including Cisco. Famous for the thong song. Uh, no, you know what? I've been I've been kind of cheating and looking at your yeah. schedule, and I'm like, all right, so I got to be here for Cisco. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. We're gonna write that in my diary. Well, Cisco is a recurring guest, so he's gonna keep coming back and checking Amazing. in with us as he plays all these games at E3. I just love the fact that he's here. Oh, me too. Me too. Then what else did we do? Uh, me and Nick Scarpino got to interview Tony Hawk about the new Tony Hawk. No Skater. big deal. Just Tony oh, no Hawk. big deal. No so big we deal. had Danny O'Dwyer talk to Tony Hawk as well, and yeah. he was saying that it was just unbelievable. I mean. Yeah. How is he? What is the man like? Oh, he's such a good dude, man. It, I, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater holds a very special place in my heart. Yes. Like, I, I grew up with it, and it really kind of shaped who I am. Mm -hmm. Like, the soundtrack to that game is the soundtrack to my life, you know? Like, it I have, I have a Spotify playlist. Oh, great. Yeah, exactly, it just, you know? You know, it just kind of reminds you of that time the in time your life. The time period, exactly. Yeah. And it's, you know, the really, it's special. And to see it come back, I'm excited for that. It's not playable here. I was no. sad. I was running around the Activision booth, running around stuff looking, but uh, I didn't Batman see it. Batman voice, where is it? Yeah, come on, man, come on. But, but yeah, there's been so much stuff here. Like, I'm trying to think what else that, uh, what else we've done. Like, well, how, what have you been doing? Let's talk about you. So, let's talk about me. Yeah. Uh, so this morning, I've just basically been doing show prep. I kind of wandered around, snuck mm -hmm. a look at some of the booths. Mm. Uh, I was on the YouTube stage with the kind of, uh, no, you're kind of funny, with the Funhouse guys. Funhouse. Uh, oh, Adam really and them. Great. I love them. Adam, yeah. James and everyone. Uh, so I did an episode of Dude Soup. Great. Uh, great. Which Big was fan of that. a lot of fun. And then I came here. Uh, and I've just spoken to uh, Mark Alexi from Ooh. Assassin's Creed Syndicate, Great. a game that I'm very excited for. Yeah. Um, it's not only because it's set in London, mm. uh, but mm. because I'm a big Assassin's fan. Oh, there you go. Um, well, that's fun. So what, ex what else are you excited about seeing this I, week? I am so excited about Amplitude. Oh I'm my God! Huge, is it here? Huge! Oh, it's here! It's here! Yes, it's here! It's playable! It's great! I got I got my hands on it earlier. I need to go back and play it. I'm did a huge Amplitude it? fan. I did back it. Yes, huge Good fan man. of that game. So I'm excited to, to really kind of get into it and yeah. uh, see what the new one's all about. So which which press conference, if you had to pick, like like Sophie's choice between the, your children? Yeah, man, it's hard. Was it was a good favorite. year. It was Here's a great the thing: year. I'm a Nintendo fanboy. I've said it before, and I'll yep. say it again. They did not have the best direct this year. They didn't. They had like some really great moments. Star I loved. Fox. I loved the Mario Star Maker. Fox my, I think that my pick for game of the show is Mario Maker. Really? It's it's good. It's deep. Okay. And I'll be able to play that forever, specifically when other people are making the, the yeah. levels, and I just get to jump in there. But uh, I got to give it to Sony, man. Like They knocked it out of the park. Although, Microsoft had such a great conference. I mean, Microsoft were great when they were like, okay, we've heard you. Backwards compatibility, it's yours. Yeah. Uh, new controller, we heard you. Yep. It's yours. Yep. 
Gears of War Remastered. Yeah. All games, stuff. games, 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 games. And that's Holland. the beauty of this E3. It's been games, 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 yeah. and I love that. Yeah. I think the backwards compatibility might be the second biggest announcement this E3. Yeah. Right behind Final Fantasy VII HD. Oh, I know. Can't believe that happened. So that's definitely my number one. It's It's been a crazy, I mean, the only thing that could really top this off is Half-Life 3. Half-Life, that's the only, that's I was the telling, only I was telling Colin Moriarty, like, Half-Life 3 is the only announcement bigger than Final Fantasy VII yeah. HD. So, maybe. Um, so There's Val, still a couple days. We'll see. I mean, Gabe Newell. He's yeah, he's somewhere. Imagine. I'm sure he's running around. In a bunker. Yeah, it's going to happen. He's working on it. Mm -hmm. Tim Geddes, thank you so much for thank joining you. me. And I will be seeing more of you throughout the week, oh, no yes. doubt. I mean, you're literally just over it's there. right over there. Um, and also, we have a shared war room, yes. which is kind yes. of awesome. Great, great, great food, great coffee. Oh, yeah, it's good. Uh, so make sure you stay tuned to the GameSpot and the Kind of Funny stage uh, for all of your E3 coverage from this amazing year. 2015 is going down in history. Don't go anywhere. More amazing games coming right up. It's E3 2015. We are having one hell of a show. Welcome to the GameSpot stage. I am joined by Marcus Nielsen, executive producer on Need for Speed at Ghost Games. So you showed off Need for Speed at the EA press conference yesterday. How has the reaction been? Uh, you know, overwhelmingly positive, I, I must say. You know, we always knew that we are pushing boundaries, right? You know, we Need for Speed is about high production values, but this, this time around, I think that we're just doing something uh, to, to knocking it out of the water, to be honest. Um, you know, Frostbite, the Frostbite engine, together with a you know, very creative art team we have, um, you know, makes the game really, you know, stand out. Yeah. And, you know, we have this really, you know, cool, cool thing of blending. Um, we, we show this, this cutscene of, of, of what the narrative is going to be made up uh, by, by kind of uh, people and then blending it through game graphics, and it's seamless, and it, it's, you can't tell the difference. So, we, you know, we're reaching that point now with with game and real looks really the same. It's kind of it's an, also an interesting way to kind of bypass the uncanny valley. It it, because it, it was so smooth, and I, I'm certainly when I was watching it, I did yeah. Here it is. Uh, you couldn't tell where the game started and where the video ended. No, that, that, and that that was obviously the the real trick, right? Yeah, we can now you know as you play this game, obviously your car, the way you customize the car, mm -hmm. will be part of that real world that you're seeing. Right? So. Yes, we are definitely now blending real and, and yeah. game to a degree that where people can't tell the difference. So let's talk a little bit. So 2014, we didn't have a Need for Speed, which had been the first time, I think in over a decade, we had a year without a Need for Speed. Yeah, in many years. Yeah, yeah, so what has that extra year given you? So you know, it really happened, you know, when we started Ghost Games four years ago and we started making Need for Speed and we made Rivals and we shipped that in 2013, I think we actually spoke about mm. that back in the day. Then we... Um, we really sat back and wanted to do the game we really wanted to make, and, yeah. and, and to do that, we need to understand what Need for Speed stands for. So, you know, building up the building up the brand from you know kind of game pillars, we spoke to our fans. You know, what are the, what is the Need for Speed you want to be seeing? And fundamentally, that is the game we're building now. We're building the game that we know they want, and you know, the response we've seen has been, as I said, spectacular. The announcement trailer we put out like a month ago 
you know, five and a half million views. Um, Not bad. You know, it, well, you know, for Need yeah. for Speed, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so we, you know, I, for me, it kind of feels like we've woken up this dormant um, population of people who love Need for Speed, and we, you know, and now obviously here at E3, we deliver upon it because people can play it. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about what the game involves. So there's kind of five ways of looking at being a racer, really. So, you know, with this game, we're, we're going back to car culture, right? Mm -hmm. uh, car culture um, at large, uh, getting the details right, getting the most iconic cars in that world. Um, and yes, you've got five ways to play, mm -hmm. uh, which fundamentally kind of builds up five very interesting ways to be part of this culture. Um, so, it, you know, you can, you can go, you know, speed, style, crew, build, or outlaw, mm -hmm. which is also, in a very neat way, summarizes the kind of cool, you know, arcade, uh, arcade edge of your seat, mm -hmm. need for speed experience, right? Going insanely fast, sliding through a corner sideways in a customized ride together with your friends by, while the cop is after you. So yeah, you know, it, it's um, that those five ways of play, um, five ways of playing the game is kind of how you, you you're being pu pulled through the game. Yeah. So you you mentioned, I remember reading uh, when the game was first announced that there's going to be a kind of immersive storyline. How is that? How is that to how can you do that in a kind of a game that's about racing cars? So I, I take it, are we going to be able to get out of the car, you know, like that kind of stuff, or is it a way of you, you can are pull now the in world a together. place where there's a sniper somewhere who will shoot me <laughs> uh, if I go into if that. Go so into we're not going to do that. But okay. I can say as much as there are plenty of ways where you can you can tell a story in a racing yeah. game, and I go as far as saying you're not going to be. It's not going to be a story where you you drift around the corner to save the world. Imagine if that was a game, though. I'd play that, maybe. Yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, the, so Need for Speed is going open world. Uh, how do you kind of feel, uh, you said it's twice the size of Rivals, I believe. Yeah. How do you kind of keep that world engaging, filled with content, filled with amazing things for uh, racers to discover? So, you know, we're, we're basically looking at this world as, as uh, you know, we, we talk about distraction-based gameplay, right? Mm -hmm. You've seen in other open world games, you know, you go out there and you think you're going to be doing something and all of a sudden you're doing something else. And if you think about this all drive world that we have, where we have this seamless connection um, or, you know, a, a seamless blend between single player, co-op and multiplayer, really, mm -hmm. uh, play with play up to seven friends in whatever you do. You mm -hmm. can play alone, you can play with one friend, two friends, three, three friends. Um, it really is, um, it really is, that is part of the distraction-based gameplay. But then you have the, you add the cops to that. You yeah. add uh, all the different, uh, you know, roads, challenges, missions. Um, then all of a sudden you have a very, uh, you know, emergent world which is going to kind of pull you in and not let you go. Yeah. So you spoke earlier about car customization. And from, from the looks of it, this is going really in depth. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, one of the really first things that our fans told us and you know you had to be you know pretty mm -hmm. non-intelligent i think if you wanted to reboot need for speed and not do it with customization right but then you can do customization in many ways and you know we, we we've gone really kind of full on on it mm -hmm. uh down to the the you know the smallest little detail of cars mm -hmm. um you know you know from a color perspective from parts perspective one thing that's really key for us though is that we keep it um, you know, authentic. You know, yeah. the, we have we have chosen the most iconic cars. Uh, the, the the parts that we put on that are kind of authentic aftermarket parts mm -hmm. um, to to the to the you know largest possible degree. So um, it's 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 not only about you know making a customization system. It's about making it the right way for the audience that we want to reach. Are you also trying to encourage players to kind of form a bond, a, a sort of relationship with their vehicle? Yeah, I, I think that's natural, right? You know, regardless of what kind of game you're playing, um, you know, uh, we, if you have something that we want you to develop, whether mm -hmm. it's a soldier, a weapon, whatever yeah. it is, you, you, you do grow a kind of bond to it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I think plenty of games have done it outside racing. But cars, absolutely. Uh, you know, if we can give you access to a car that you've, you've always wanted to drive, you can, you can now personalize it from a, you know, how it sounds, from how it handles, mm -hmm. to what it looks like. Um, and, and, and follow the kind of rule sets and the, the hottest trends in car culture, um, yeah, yeah, you will develop a bond to that car. So, Need for Speed, going for over 20 years, it has real legacy. It has, you know, it's been handed over to a number of different studios, like Slightly Mad, Criterion, of course, and now it's found its home at Ghost. What's that kind of been like? Is, was there a pressure 
or was it? Uh, did you see it more of an opportunity to really stamp your name on this amazing series? Well, I, I think taking on Need for Speed is is a, is a big honor. Um, uh, uh, and if you look at Need for Speed, in all honesty, it's one of the most still probably one of the most globally known brands in gaming. Um, you know, if you look at you know different continents, China, you know, yeah. Need for Speed is massive. So yeah, of course, there's 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 pressure there to do something with it. But I think the you know, with Ghost, we've obviously built something up from from the ground up, and mm -hmm. and you know we have we have intelligent enough people in that studio to understand that we'll get to we'll get to what our people you know that our fans want if we speak to our fans, and that's what we're doing. And you do have a real strong bond with them because there is there is a, a dedicated car community just for Need for Speed. What's it been like with that interaction? Yeah, so we we obviously have this. Uh, um, Almost, almost like a car culture media uh, web house, mm -hmm. um, which was called Speed Hunters. Mm -hmm. Speed Hunters, as you can hear from the word speed hunting, they they are out there on the globe and they have people all over the world, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and they we call them that they are they are, you know our finger on the pulse when it comes to car culture. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they they are they totally making us a better offering because they, they, they give us the expertise. You know, yeah. these are the iconic cars. These are the uh, parts that you have, uh, you should put on your car. These are the people you should talk to. Um, this is yeah. the environment you should go into. So we try, you know, really with them, we can be more legit in, in our offering. Well, Marcus, thank you so much for joining me. That's all we have time for. Make sure you stay tuned here to the GameSpot stage for more continuing coverage of E3 2015. I keep saying it, it's been an amazing year, so make sure you don't go anywhere. We have so much more awesome stuff coming right up.
having one hell of a show. I'm joined by Eric, uh, from the design director from DICE on Mirror's Edge Catalyst. So Eric, what kind of a show has this been for you guys? It's been uh, a really great show so far. We've, uh, you know, we showed the, the trailer. People love the trailer. Sarah's uh, job at the press conference, everybody loved that. And now they're playing the game uh, down at our booth. Mm -hmm. And uh, people seem to love it, so I'm, I'm very happy. So the original Mirror's Edge was something of a cult classic, and it kind of, it, we never thought we'd see another one. So how did those discussions kind of go in so order for you guys to bring it back yeah. in, in, in such, a, uh, such a way? I mean, it's a game we always wanted to bring back. We always wanted to continue what we started. Mm -hmm. uh, we just wanted to do it in the right way. Uh, you know, everybody wanted to free roam in the first game, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's, that's one of the core things we wanted to do. And then there were lots of other stuff that we just felt we needed to get right. Yeah. Um, and also moving, on to, moving over to Frostbite Engine, and there, yes. were, there was yeah, lots of stuff to do. So. So we, we'll talk a little bit about Frostbite, because that's what's helping give the game its gorgeous aesthetic, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Yeah. So Catalyst is Faith's, it's kind of like Faith's origin story. Yeah, exactly. This is uh, it's a reboot of the first game. We're keeping lots of the things we like from the first game. But we also wanted a kind of a clean slate to be able to uh, to have a really stable foundation to build on. So this is this is Faith's origin story. You get to see how how she starts out as a, yeah. like a, a carefree runner on the rooftops, and then gradually becoming a heroine. So I mean, that's the thing that kind of not confused me, but I was uh, I was expecting a straight out sequel because the ending of the first game, no spoilers, yeah. did leave things open. Kind of a cliffhanger, yes. Uh, so you guys are kind of teasing us all there. But I am kind of glad to see, th we see how Faith became the amazing strong woman that she is. That's the idea, yeah, yeah. exactly. So th that's what we're down there. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the world. Yeah. Uh, it has this wonderful uh, trade-off between looking stunning, pristine, yeah. but things under the surface, and it's Pr not all as it seems. Yeah, the, yeah under, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful world. Mm -hmm. and, and at a glance, maybe it's a world you actually would want to live in. Mm -hmm. But if you just scratch the surface a little, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna see it's it's a horrible place. People are under surveillance 100% of the time. The uh, the conglomerate, the authorities, they know where you are all the time, and you're caught. Everybody who lives in this world is caught in this, just this endless cycle of basically work, sleep, yeah. consume, mm -hmm. uh, and nothing else is tolerated. Uh, and Faith obviously finds herself in that world as a runner, making sure that the underground is getting getting important messages, conversations yeah. are happening. Exactly. That, that's, I mean, uh, when the game starts, she's in a kind of a gray area. She's, she's doing jobs for the corporations. She's doing jobs for the, for the resistance. Ne not really picking a side. But then, uh, because of events in the game, mm -hmm. uh, she gets caught in the conflict and, and uh, takes a, takes a, picks a side. Mm -hmm. and, you know. Hopefully the right side. Hopefully the right side. I think she picks the right side. I think it's the right, it's side. The right yeah. side. Uh, so the game has moved from basically a 3D platformer to open world. Yeah, we, we like to think of it as a free roaming title, yeah. uh, as a, a, where, where freedom of choice is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still, uh, we've got a really strong story that you know, propels you through the yeah. city, but we've got lots of dip different other things for you to do, you know, side missions or just you know, races or mm -hmm. just look at hunting for collectibles, exploring this beautiful world. And so it's going to be like environmental puzzles as well. Yeah, lots of those. I mean, the, the game is about, uh, is about moving. It's about, because you can interact with anything, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you can climb on anything, you can run on anything, jump, whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot about looking at, looking at the world, you know, finding that spot way, way over there, you know, say, will I be able to get there? And yeah. And you can. Probably you, you can. You just have yeah. to figure yeah. it out. Yeah. Uh, so how do you kind of, how do you keep the player on track with the story then, if everything's free roam, very spread out. Um, I mean, the, 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 the story uh, is, uh, you'll always have uh, a number of objectives mm -hmm. to, to, to play yeah. if you want to. Uh, but the player can always choose when to continue with the story, uh, you know, and, uh, which, which missions will propel them forwards. Mm -hmm. is going to be uh, obvious for them, we hope. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about Frostbite. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's DICE's amazing revolution, I guess, in terms of gaming. And yeah. we have a ton of games powered by Frostbite now. Yeah. Mirror's Edge Catalyst looks absolutely stunning. We can see it here. Yeah. What, oh, yeah. What's the move to the engine been like? Uh, I mean, we've, uh, we've been working on Frostbite for, for several years, yep. since this Bad Company won. Uh, it's, it's an engine we know, and we have uh, you know, lots of influence, what we want to do with it, and uh, we're, you know, we're, we're deep down there digging into it. 
Uh, Are you still finding kind of new things to do with it? We're finding new things to do. We're adding new things to do. It's it's like uh, there, there's a great cooperation with the Frostbite team and yeah. and, and I. So, yeah. Uh, and it obviously it has this beautiful aesthetic. But let's talk a little bit more about gameplay. So yeah. Faith, at least when I was playing uh, the original game, I like to think of her as just a free runner. She didn't, ha she didn't have any kind of uh, want to do any gunplay. I tried yeah. as best yeah. as I could to keep was, away from it. It was pretty hard to be. To it was hard. Good. I mean, you were rewarded if yeah. you managed to do it. Sadly, yeah. I couldn't. Um, What's that going to be like in, in Catalyst? So in uh, Mirror's Edge Catalyst, uh, Faith will never use guns. Okay. So you, you just won't have the option. It's all about uh, using your, your speed, your momentum, and, and use, using the moves that you, the, that you perform while mm. just uh, traversing the rooftops. And, and combine. so we've built the combat system into that. So yeah. it's all about momentum, taking enemies down quickly, efficiently, uh, using your hands and feet. How has the parkour system changed then? I assume it's had a few tweaks, upgrades. It's it's had lots of tweaks. It's still based on the system. I mean, players of the first game are going to recognize it. Yep. Uh, but it's it's just way smoother, and there's just way more things you can do once you start experimenting with mm -hmm. it. It's just uh, it's it's a way more fluid system. How have you managed to incorporate? I assume player feedback from the first game, uh, or has it just been a buttload of playtesting? So uh, we have we have uh, we, we listen to feedback all the time. We have we have people you know from from the uh, community coming and playing. We we look at them. We listen to what they say, etc. And then there's lots and lots of play testing, of yeah. course, uh, and uh, and also you know actually just just new good ideas. You know, yeah. Why why don't we do this? And then we try it. And then yeah, this is a, you know if it's a good idea, we keep it. Are there any new kind of uh, moves that wouldn't be possible? You think that you know maybe if we push. We can make this happen. This would look really cool, or this would be able cool to do. Or is it? Are you keeping it kind of really rooted in? Uh, so I mean, we're we're keeping we're keeping we're keeping it rooted in free running or yeah. parkour. Uh, and uh, but we've uh, we've expanded on the system. So uh, we're adding gadgets to the game. We're not talking about that yet, but uh, we'll be talking about that more later. Yeah. Uh, but it's still deeply rooted in, in free running, and uh, it's, but it's a f it's a freer system. It just feels freer now yeah. when you play it. Uh, let's talk finally. Just end on a VR's big now. It's a thing. Yes. Will Mirror's Edge Catalyst ever come to VR? Who knows? Maybe. Uh, it's, I think VR is great. I love uh, I love stuff. Uh, I think VR is you can't just take Mirror's Edge and you know slap VR on top of it. I imagine. The discrepancy between you, you, uh, you move, doing you move a lot, you move a lot, yeah, and it and becomes problematic. So if we do VR, uh, we're going to make sure to do it right. Yep. That I can promise. Wonderful, mm -hmm. Eric. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, wonderful, Mirror's Edge Catalyst out early next year. Be sure to stay here at the GameSpot stage where we will be having. We've got one more big game coming up today. Uh, we are having one hell of a time here at E3 2015. Don't go anywhere.
Hey everybody, I'm Lucy and welcome back to the GameSpot stage here at E3 2015. I'm so excited I can barely get my words out because joining me here today is Lena, senior producer at DICE on kind of the big splash, one of the many big splashes, but certainly the big splash because it's coming this year, Star Wars Battlefront. Lena, how are you finding E3? This is your first E3, you were telling this me. Is, this is my first E3 and I'm, I'm finding it, uh, you know, quite spectacular to be honest. I mean, you can't, you can't go in either hall without seeing Star Wars. And I was here this morning when the, uh, the hordes ran in and they went straight for Battlefront. Um, what's that kind of reaction like, especially like as developers, to see something you've labored over be loved like that? I think, I mean, obviously uh, at DICE we are, are so, we're such fans of Star Wars mm -hmm. and we have, uh, we're so proud to be, we have been given this opportunity to work on this game and we've, you know, poured our hearts and souls into this project for a long time. And we've been so longing for the opportunity and the day to actually give others the opportunity to play it. And, and uh, the reaction that we've had so far with both of the, the multiplayer trailer, but also the, the missions trailer and, and, you know, how people have seen the game, how people have been playing the game and how happy people seem to be. To me, it's, uh, it's amazing. And, and I, I just wish my entire team was here that they would be able to see and, and and feel what I'm feeling right now. But it, it's been absolutely amazing. Let's talk a little bit about how the opportunity came about. Did you guys have to lobby for Battlefront? Did EA just kind of throw it open to all the studios and say, hey, we've got this really big franchise that people kind of love. Uh, who wants it? Who wants dibs? I think that uh, for us, you know, we obviously, I mean, we're, we're building two, you know, uh, you know, we're known for building Battlefield and, and you know, we're building Mirror's Edge and, and as a studio when the opportunity arose, uh, we were in, you know, hard at work in development on PF4, we were de delivering Mirror's Edge and, uh, but when we heard that the franchise was up for grabs, so to, so to speak, that EA had, uh, had, you know, struck a deal with Disney and was going to bring, you know, Star Wars experiences to gamers and, in, in, you know, through various franchises going forward, uh, you know, we were kind of the obvious choice, I think. Yeah. I think that, you know, people understand that the Battlefront, uh, Battlefront 1 and Battlefront 2, they were, you know, in many ways spiritually related to Battlefield. And so it kind of was uh, a bit of a case of the franchise coming home, so to speak. Yes. Uh, in that sense. So, so, but we, you know, kind of put our hands out there and said, hey, hey guys, we, we should do it. Yeah. And we got, then we got to make it. And, and that's uh, been a pretty amazing experience so far. So it was announced back in 2013. Uh, we saw, we heard, we saw the first trailer really uh, last year, and then we had a little bit more at Star Wars Celebration, and now we have actual gameplay. This is the uh, survival, I believe. No, Multi this is oh, the, the multiplayer on the hot. multiplayer. Yeah. Um, and people are getting their hands on it now. Yeah. It's because it's not long until it's out, which is a great thing. Yep. Uh, so how are you? I mean, when you're deciding what to show. Is this what encapsulates your Star Wars? I think that you know what what this shows is is that it you know it, it hits on the note. What we wanted to do with the game was that we wanted to immerse players in their Star Wars battle fantasies, mm -hmm. and this mode, Walker Assault, is the sort of the quintessential mode yes. in the sense it's a it's a big mode. It's 40 players. It's infantry. It's vehicles. It's walkers. It's starfighters. It's heroes. It's you know all of the all of the ingredients you know, in its most epic sense. So in that way, we want it. And it's on Hoth. Obviously, the mode is inspired by the Battle of Hoth. Yes. Uh, and so that's kind of what we wanted to show, that, you know, we wanted to show, yes, we're super true to the, you know, the visuals and, and the original trilogy, but we're, you know, there's a twist. You know, you, you, you get to play it your way. You get to do things that, you know, aren't strictly true to what happened in the movie, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. Uh, so, we, you know, we felt that would be a great experience to bring to, to was, E3. Was that in a way more freeing than kind of making an experience that was just you replicating what we've seen in the movies? Uh, and it kind of it allows for player freedom, I guess. Yeah, and I think, you know, freedom is so incredibly important in games. And I think, you know, various types of games have various restrictions, you know, yeah. on the design and the experience. But I think that, you know, yes, you want to be you know, you want to be immersed in the in the universe that you know and love. And yes. that's why we're bringing you to Antor and we're bringing you to Hoth and we're bringing you to Tatooine. Mm -hmm. 
but we're also bringing the vehicles. I mean, we, you're seeing an 8080 uh, on Tatooine, as an yes. example, which you've never seen before, which you will see in so our it's game. kind of cannon bending. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, in, in a way, or it's it's more about sort of you know giving you all of the ingredient familiar Im I ingredients in a way. Yes. And allowing you then to make out of them what you will, how you, you know play the game your way, mm -hmm. have the experience that you want. Do you want to take on you know? You know, do you want to take on Boba Fett as Luke Skywalker? You can do that. Yeah, I mean, that, that was the great, actually, it's, it's right now. Uh, we saw in the, uh, the EA press conference, uh, Luke Skywalker just walking right up to Darth Vader in a moment that could only really be possible in, in the middle of a big battlefield, a moment that could only be possible in a kind of video game. And it, mm -hmm. and it allows you the freedom yeah. to do that. Yep. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, the legacy of the original games. Mm -hmm. um, was it kind of a pressure to keep that? Like, I mean, those games were incredibly popular, I mean, both critically and commercially. Yep. So was there a pressure to kind of keep it very, very similar? Or were you guys desperate to you know, put your own mark on, on Star Wars, which is a rare thing for anyone to be able to do? Well, I think you know, we, you know, the, the original games were great. Yep. And they were, as you said, incredibly popular and, and beloved. And you know, by many of our developers as well. And I think, but the, the fact of the matter is that they were games that were out two console generations ago. Is it that long already? Yeah, it is that long already. And and of course, I mean, gaming as a whole and the genre as a whole has evolved since then. So we felt that you know the the right way to respect the franchise was to sort of, you know, we're, we're I think we're in many ways many ways keeping the the spirit of it and you know to the spirit of what made Battlefront great and we're nodding to it in many ways but we also said to ourselves we're going to do it the way that we want to do so obviously Battlefield is kind of your bread and butter what have you what experiences you taken from that game and kind of poured into Battlefront uh, yes, Battlefield is our, our heritage at DICE and uh, I think what's great for us is that we have a team that's uh, a mixture of, of Battlefield veteran developers and de developers like myself that have never worked on a Battlefield game. Mm. So we have a mix of, of people uh, and I think we take from Battlefield, I mean I, 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 I don't think people would argue that uh, DICE is, you know, is, is the master of, of you know, epic scale and vehicular gameplay and, and you know obviously that that fits so well with what we're, mm. what we're doing here uh, but at the same time you know there are other aspects of, of battlefield that you know we, we, we've kind of how best to say it we, we've kind of taken you know some of the aspects of, of what made battlefield great and and you know added them into our game and then we've you know gone in a very different direction on other aspects of it and I think that's a part of the sort of we want Battlefront to be its own thing, have its u own unique idea, mm. and and be you know its own unique experience. But of course, there's a lot that people will recognize. I mean, I, I think you know, in a way, Dice is a is a premier developer of, of FPS shooters, and obviously, we bring such a great amount of experience and knowledge yes. to the game. So let's talk a little bit about fan service. Yep. I mean, just. Being able to pilot an AT, AT, being able to pilot the Millennium Falcon, we play, play as Boba Fett, Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader. I mean, were those moments that you guys, I mean, did you have to decide by committee? Because there's so much to take from Star Wars. How did you decide which great bits to put in? Well, I wouldn't say that we've designed it by committee uh, because we have a, a, a very strong, very competent design lead. Um, but we've, we've, you know, basically what we've taken is sort of what to us is the, the core of Star Wars. And I think, you know, Star Wars is so vast. There are yes. so many things in Star Wars that, you know, are beloved by so many. And, and you know, so there, there are hard choices. Mm. But, I, you know, we, we kind of selected what we felt was the absolute core of Star Wars. And people can then debate that endlessly, whether, you know, this is more core than that. Or, or you know, why do you have this and not this? And, you know, and, and but it's... We can't do everything, yep. unfortunately. Uh, so, sadly, people were, were kind of uh, upset at the lack of a single player mode. Yep. But then again, you guys do have single player content. Yes. Uh, but I think one thing you should really be celebrated for is offline split screen yes. co op. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that because that for me is really exciting because I'm still a person who loves to 
not have to bring another TV into the room to be able to play co-op. Yep. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, the, we are, are, you know, Battlefront is predominantly a multiplayer game, but with the, the Star Wars Battlefront missions, our ambition is to give players a great onboarding experience in playing what we call the trial missions, mm. uh, which are teaching you to, you know, master different aspects of the game. But then we have what we call the survival missions. And the survival missions, all of the missions you can play either by yourself or, you know, through online co-op or split-screen co-op on consoles. Mm -hmm. uh, but the sort of, you know, the, the survival mission, as an example, what we showed at the Sony press conference yesterday and, and which is playable at the Sony booth here at D3, mm -hmm. is uh, this is where you basically, either by yourself or with a friend, take on um, waves of Imperial soldiers mm -hmm. Uh, that are also supported by ATSTs and, and TIE fighters, and, and uh, so we wanted, we really, really wanted you to be able to just jump in and play. Say you're sitting, you know, on a Saturday night with your friends around the house, and you kind of just want to have that experience. Yeah. You know, that split screen experience that was super important to us. It's something that's kind of very missing from modern gaming, I find, especially in first person shooters. I mean, it's, you know, you want to be able to sit with your friend. Let's talk a little bit as well, because we can split between first and third person, which mm -hmm. is obviously a big part of the original yep. Battlefront. And that's an example, I think, of sort of how we, you know, nod towards the, you know, the, the original trilogy, and the same with our game mode design. I mean, we've taken no game mode wholesale, mm -hmm. but of course we've been influenced by the original games. I mean, yes. how could we not? And that's, I mean, I think that, you know, that this is one of the features of uh, the original uh, yeah. the original games that players loved, and we were really happy to, to make that call to, to be able to play in third person as well. And I think, you know, people talk about instant action was a beloved mode. Yes. And while we don't have instant action in the exact same way, the, the intent with the survival mission, as an example, is to give you that same experience of being able to play against AI, you know, jump in and play against AI in, an, in a really deep and satisfying way. Yes. So um, let's talk a little bit as well about the fact that you guys are using photogrammetry. Yes. Which so, games obviously been made in Frostbite three, so it looks it looks great. But photogrammetry for me is also incredibly interesting. How have you managed to utilize that to make the game? We have. I think we've gone to, uh, you know, we, we've we've been more extreme in using photogrammetry than I think any other game. I mean, we've have, uh, you know, we have an absolutely amazing art team. Yeah. That uh, they're super, super hardcore Star Wars fans, and, yeah. and you know, for them, it's been a dream project yes. to work on. So what we've done is that we've gone to the original locations where the movies were shot mm -hmm. to capture trees and rocks and yeah. uh, snow and you know all of the different natural elements to bring them back into the game. But we've also gone to the uh, the archives, the Lucasfilm archives at Skywalker Ranch. That was a terribly, terribly hard trip that I needed to make. You know, I had to take one yeah. for the team and go yeah. there. And, oh and no! It, yes, just have to go to the Skywalker yes. Ranch. Yes, it was. Uh, no, I mean it's uh, it's one of the incredible, incredible benefits of working on a project yeah. like this is is to get to do things like that. It's it's mm -hmm. absolutely amazing and. Uh, and the photogrammetry is is basically what we you know it's a technology where you take. Uh, whether it's a natural object or a man-made object, such as, you know, imagine, if you will, a lightsaber or Darth Vader's helmet, uh, and you take a bunch of pictures from slightly different angles all around, and then you stitch these images together using software so that you end up with a 3D model that you can then refine, which then, in, in essence, means that you're bringing the real objects into the game world. It's kind of fascinating as well, I mean, because Star Wars, it, you, you need that authenticity because there are so many passionate fans from the 70s when the f movies first came out and you guys sound like you're doing it right, like you're going the right way about it and we're super excited to play it. Please tell the lovely audience when it's out, when we get our hands on it and which platforms. It's out November 17th on Xbox One, PS4 and PC. Lena, thank you so much for joining me. Friends, I'm afraid that is the end of day one here at E3 2015. We have had some amazing games on the stage today. Join me, Danny O'Dwyer, Chris Waters tomorrow because I'm not going to spoil it all here, but we've got some amazing stuff coming up. Uh, so make sure you tune back in tomorrow. GameSpot.com. We'll see you then.